Margolis and the FDA, I'd like to welcome you all to today's public meeting on characterizing FDA's approach to benefit risk assessment throughout the medical product life cycle. This is being convened under a cooperative agreement with the FDA. The workshop will focus on the collection, communication, and integration of benefit risk information throughout the drug development process. Today's discussion is intended to provide an opportunity for FDA to gather stakeholder input on its approach to benefit risk assessment, as well as a chance for the agency to share information about its upcoming draft guidance on this important topic. Throughout the day, we're going to have a series of presentations, reaction panels, and open discussion sessions covering key benefit risk assessment considerations and approaches to the effective presentation and communication of benefit risk information and the utility of benefit risk assessment in the post-market setting. We are very pleased that you all are able to join us today, and we're anticipating an interesting and productive discussion. And we have a lot of people here in the room. Thank you for coming. A lot of people joining us online. Uh, thank you for participating with us as well. I'd like to start things off with just a few housekeeping notes. Then I'm going to turn uh, the uh, opening over to Teresa Mullen, who's the Associate Director for Strategic Initiatives at the Center for Drug Evaluation uh, and Research. She's going to provide some opening remarks and context for the meeting. Today's meeting is going to be mainly discussion-based. Uh, we hope you feel comfortable speaking freely and candidly about the issues in front of us. We hope you've had a chance to review some of the background materials that were prepared beforehand to help orient you to uh, the meeting. I know many of you have been thinking and working on these important issues related to benefit risk for a long time. And again, we're very pleased to have you all with us today. Uh, this is going to be broadcast live, uh, so we're going to have our live recording of the meeting through WebEx. Uh, we've got an estimated 400 or so people joining this meeting virtually. Thanks to all of you for being here, too. The recording is going to be posted on the Duke Margolis event website and YouTube channel uh, after the conclusion of the event uh, as well. At a number of points throughout the day, we're going to invite our panel participants uh, up to the front to engage in discussion about the different aspects of benefit risk framework that we're covering today. Uh, so we hope to have a, a good back and forth discussion with them uh, to help stimulate uh, uh, further thinking and, and further uh, steps on these issues. And in addition, as I said, we want to invite members of the audience to engage in discussion at the end of each of our sessions during the question and answer periods. So if you're here in person in the room, we have standing microphones around the room that you'll be able to use. Because we are recording the meeting, we want to make sure that people here are speaking into the microphone that lets everyone online participate and gives us a good uh, record for those who want to uh, learn more about this activity uh, later. If you're joining us, joining us via the webcast uh, and would like to ask a question during the Q&A sessions, please email your question to fda.benefitrisk at duke.edu. So that's fda.benefitrisks. Uh, benefit risk, singular, fda.benefitrisk at duke.edu, and we'll pass it along to the session moderator. We'll also be inviting members of the audience to provide comments during the open public comment session at the end of the day today. This is a good opportunity to make sure nothing gets missed uh, as FDA is considering these issues and moving forward on its guidance and, and next steps. So if you want to participate in this session, the sign up is on a first come, first serve basis. If you have a comment that you'd like to provide, please sign up on the form that's placed on the res registration table outside uh, of the meeting room today. And I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that meeting participants and other interested parties, including all of you who are joining us online, may also submit comments through the public docket to this meeting. Uh, that's all the way up until June 17th, so June 17th. Uh, and if you want to know more about how to submit exactly on the public docket, how that process works, please visit our event website. Uh, just a couple of other notes. Uh, we're going to be tweeting about today's convening using the hashtag FDA Benefit Risk through our account at Duke Margolis. Uh, we invite you to follow and join in the conversation. That's hashtag FDA Benefit Risk. We have several breaks scheduled throughout the day. We're going to break for lunch. 
from 12 to 1 p.m. and lunch is on your own at the, the restaurants in the area uh, and here in the facility. And then finally, uh, we're convening this uh, meeting at uh, Duke, the Duke Margolis Center in cooperation with the FDA. This is not a federal advisory committee meeting. While we're very interested in hearing everyone's input on this topic, we won't be making any uh, um, votes or reaching any consensus, uh, any of those uh, uh, advisory committee activities. This is an information gathering activity, and it will be a success if there is a broad and frank exchange of ideas and lots of open discussion. So I want to thank you all again for being here. I'd like to now turn to uh, Teresa Mullen, who's going to provide the opening context to set, the, uh, to set up today's discussion. Teresa, thank you very much for uh, participating today. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and my only question is, is are the people in the back of the room going to advance the slides? You are advancing them? Okay, just to give you a meaningful look, okay. All right, great, if you can go to the next slide. My job's just to give you a bit of context on this uh, meeting and the program progression for benefit risk. Many of you may be following benefit risk over the years. You may be fans of what FDA is doing here and you wanna know, but, but just to give everybody a kind of level set background. So we piloted, we began piloting this sort of uh, structured approach to benefit risk assessment and a framework in uh, around 2009. And then in the um, PDUFA 5 era, that's just user fee authorization, from 2012 to 2017, FDA committed to advance that and do a more systematic implementation of the benefit risk framework in the context of pre-market review. Um, and so what we're going to be doing today is following up on a commitment to, um, uh, in this area of benefit risk that was made in the PDUFA 6, that's the um, uh, authorization that we're in now from 2018 to 2022 further enhance our use of the benefit risk framework in our decision making. And in particular, we committed to a particular uh, focus of this guideline, which is implementing and applying benefit risk throughout the drug for benefit risk, risk, and a cycle of the drug, um, discussing appropriate interactions with sponsors uh, and FDA during development to uh, cover an, uh, any other, other, a number of relevant issues, but including understanding the therapeutic context for regulatory decision making, and also appropriate approaches, approaches for communicating to the public FDA's thinking on benefit risk assessment throughout the life cycle. And as you can see, and how we'll talk about that later, this is also has implications for how companies may want to communicate and submit information to FDA. At the same time that we're carrying out these commitments in the user fee program, was so implementation make about approval or complete response about whether there's post-marketing requirements, uh, risk management necessary, et cetera. Any choice that's making um, comes with expectations of what will happen based on the choice we make. So we think about the outcome, the harm, care about those outcomes that we expect. Values and trade-offs um, are the key concepts there. Combining those things is really the benefit risk, but you can't do it in isolation. It must be in the context of the decision making. And in FDA's context, we have a regulatory mission and mandate. Uh, we have risk management goals and public health goals. And then specifically with a particular application, there's context about that product, about the patient population, the condition that they have. Uh, there's constraints, there are precedents that have been set, policies, et cetera. That's all the context. Now we never know what's gonna happen with certainty and much of the time we don't even know really our values with certainty when making the decision and so there's uncertainty about that and uncertainty is, is the key, um, is, is a key concept that is part of our benefit risk assessments. So the job of a benefit risk assessment um, is really to help tie these and clarify these for the decision maker, these elements, tie them together, integrate them and then communicate. So our vehicle for the, the benefit risk assessments is our benefit risk framework. Um, this is the most recent um, picture of what the framework uh, looks like. Um, and I'm not gonna go into much detail about the framework it, itself um, because it's done in, uh, elsewhere and, and others today will be getting into more specifics. 
Um, but it is a structured approach for benefit risk assessment and communication that has been implemented as, as part of PDUFA 5. It reflects the reality that the, the judgments um, at the end of the day are fundamentally a qualitative exercise. But the framework itself is flexible to incorporate any of the supporting quantitative analyses or more structured or more analytical analyses that we will be discussing um, um, today that, that can be done. It's, it's a very flexible approach. The framework has um, different components. It articulates the key dimensions that go into the benefit risk framework, the analysis of condition, current treatment options set up the therapeutic context. The benefit and risk and risk management sections are those product specific evaluations. And for each of those dimensions, there's two types of input. One is the evidence and uncertainty, so what we know and what we don't know. And the second is the conclusions and reasons. What judgments do we make at the end of the day about the strength of the evidence, about the benefits, about the risks? And then it ends with the conclusions regarding the benefit risk assessment, bringing all those factors together. Um, Jim Smith will, will talk more about those considerations uh, in, in his opening remarks. So the desired outcomes of the framework are to have a clear and concise snapshot of the decision making, sharpen the focus on the most relevant issues and articulate the, the judgments and the deliberations. Be consistent and accessible uh, to improve transparency, to provide a standard structure and, and have an accessible record of that decision making and importantly to align with the review processes to fit naturally within the review processes and to apply broadly to the range and life cycle of the regulatory decision. So as a program, we implemented this in PDUFA 5 in the time period of 20, fiscal year 2013 through 2017, um, through, through 2018, because we're now we're in 19. We, um, we published our implementation plan 2013, which I mentioned. CBER integrated the framework into their decision, into their review templates in 2013. CDER started um, a, a, a more formal process and implemented it in uh, 2015 um, with um, new molecular entities and original biologic license applications. And then CDER broadened that to the wider set of NDAs by 2017. We also um, completed a third party evaluation in 2017 and conducted a public meeting. Okay. So frameworks are available in posted reviews. At this point, you may see multiple frameworks in any, for one, any one um, application and approval decision. The, um, the, the frameworks are only available for um, products that are um, approved and, and posted on, on, the web, on our website at FDA. Um, at drugs at FDA. Um, so, at, so if you see more than one, um, that's because we started by implementing them where different levels of review um, would complete their own frameworks. The framework in the signatory authority um, is considered the final framework. Carrie Joe will be talking about um, how we are moving forward in, in implementation of the framework and review um, documentation. Okay. So as part of that external, that evaluation, um, we got feedback um, from over 300 stakeholders and we reviewed our contractors, Eastern Research Group, reviewed the documentation for 43 applications uh, in the cohort of 2015-16. Um, of um, and we received feedback that the framework is, is moving in the right direction. It, is, uh, it has value in organizing the thinking and documenting that, um, and it can be a value to external think stakeholders to um, have a, a clearer and more accessible snapshot of that decision-making process that can help inform their various decisions. We also received many suggestions about improving the presentation of the content um, and consistency, expanding the use of the benefit risk um, framework, enhancing the cooperation of patient perspectives, clinical considerations, quantitative assessments, um, and to make it easier for stakeholders to find and access. We will be revisiting all of those concepts today. I want to point out now the um, International uh, Council on Harmonization has worked also to help structure um, sponsor submissions of benefit uh, risk assessment, um, published updated guidelines, M4ER2 in 2016. 
Um, and then in July of 17, FDA um, revised our guidance to industry to reflect these, um, these guidelines. I think others might be bringing up the ICH guidelines in more detail today. I'll just point out that the guidelines from ICH align with FDA's benefit risk framework. So we did commit to continuing the effort to enhance and expand benefit risk framework um, and, and advance benefit risk assessment in PDUFA 6. We published in 2018, we published our updated implementation plan uh, that um, talks about implementing the framework um, post uh, pre-market um, and says that we um, are exploring how we can do this in post-marketing. Uh, Judy Zander will speak more to that this afternoon. Uh, we are today conducting our, uh, the public meeting um, with the help of Duke Margolis. 2020, we'll publish our draft guidance. And in 2021, we'll conduct a second evaluation of the framework as a good check to see how we are progressing. We also, in our implementation plan in 2018, identified additional opportunities to enhance benefit risk assessment. One, making the benefit risk frameworks more easily accessible on FDA's um, website. And um, I, th I think we'll see that um, happening as we evolve um, over time with, with documentation. Using the benefit risk frameworks to support discussions at advisory committee meetings. Uh, we'll probably touch upon that today, and explore the use of more structured quantitative benefit risk assessment approaches within the qualitative framework in cases where they provide unique value. Okay, so as I said, the, the benefit risk framework was designed to be broadly applicable uh, universally across um, the, the regulatory decisions made for marketing authorizations. And in most cases, the benefit risk framework is adequate for uh, to address the benefit risk assessments. Um, and so um, the benefit risk framework in most cases is, is likely sufficient for that. But we recognize that additional analytical approaches may provide value in certain cases. Um, so as I see it, those cases are probably the decisions challenged by novel uncertainties about benefits and risks. Uh, or about the trade-offs. And in cases where there's a lack of clear precedent of how to approach the benefit risk assessments. So if we're in new territory or moving or some um, new information or new thinking um, that might shape benefit risk assessment. This could be the pre-market review of a rare disease indication, a therapy that introduces a real novel safety or product quality issue over others um, that are typically treated, uh, used to treat the therapeutic uh, area or post-market decisions that could lead to unexpected impacts on the healthcare system in this increasingly complex healthcare system that we have. Okay. Um, I think it's important to note that there's really a suite of potential supporting approaches to benefit risk. When we say what can help benefit risk assessment, what can we use within the benefit risk framework, it's really a suite that can range from structured processes and templates that can help decision that, that, that sometimes can be the biggest value in helping decision, decision makers think through the issues. Um, it, can, it can be um, more advanced techniques to understand the benefits and the risks and uncertainties or to elicit the values that we have or it can be real advanced techniques to integrate those in a very structured manner and conduct sensitivity analyses and, and look at things um, from all angles. But with any of them, the question is, what are the decision-making needs for the application? And is the approach feasible within the situation? And I think those are the, the questions that we need to think about as we go through our discussion today. And so I'll end before turning it to Carrie Jo to just think about that concept of fit for purpose and to bring out two concepts that FDA has to think about. One is our regulatory context, uh, our mission uh, to protect and promote public health, the laws that we have to follow, and the fact that the decisions that we make set precedent, but also the process that FDA goes through in its review. There are hundreds of regulatory decisions every year, um, and most are time sensitive. The decision making has large multidisciplinary teams of experts and, and groups that um, provide input, and the reviews are conducted within a highly structured set of policies, procedures, and templates. 
And so with that, I'll end here and turn it over to Carrie Jo, who will elaborate. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Carrie Jolie. I'm a medical officer within the immediate office of the Office of New Drugs. And I'm here to expand upon Dr. Egger's very wonderful introduction of the framework and the programmatic um, aspects of benefit risk and give you a little bit more of a perspective on benefit risk and the regulatory pathway, paying particular attention to the big picture of benefit risk in the life cycle of drug development, and also how benefit risk is woven into the fabric of FDA's modernization efforts in the new drug regulatory program. Oh, I'm like double clicking slides. So just uh, as a disclosure, this presentation reflects my views and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. So just for some regulatory context, uh, to be approved for marketing, a drug must be safe and effective for its intended use. So effective is codified in statute. It means that it demonstrates substantial evidence that the drug will have the effect it purports or is represented to have under the proposed labeled conditions of use. A drug's effect forms the basis of its translation to its meaningful clinical benefit. Safe can be interpreted as the determination that the drug's benefits outweigh its risks for the drug's intended use. And safety is considered in relation to the condition treated, the efficacy purported, and the ability to mitigate risk. You saw this slide presented by Dr. Eggers sort of in the context of setting the programmatic, um, its programmatic history and the benefit risk framework. I would offer in addition and to underscore that we have always done benefit risk assessments at the FDA. They are at the foundation of the decisions that we make throughout the drug product development, marketing authorization, labeling, and post-marketing phases of a life cycle. Long before we had the framework, our decisions have reflected our assessments of a drug's benefits and risks in the context of the condition treated and the therapeutic options available in our determinations of whether drugs are safe and effective for their intended use. The frameworks that Dr. Eggers described is the vehicle that we can use to help conduct and communicate our assessment in a more structured and transparent way so while benefit risk assessments are not new, our push to centralize and systematically present our benefit risk assessment is. To this end, we are continuing now to move towards better communication and transparency regarding our decision making. As you may have heard, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research has a number of um, objectives that we are taking to modernize our new drug regulatory program. This modernization allows us to continue our priorities of utilizing cutting edge science and up to date process management so that we can continue to excel at performing our most important job, which is responsibility for protecting the public health by ensuring that the safety and efficacy of drug products. In an evolving landscape of scientific, medical, and regulatory advances, we too are evolving in order to best address this responsibility. The objectives of this modernization are listed on the slide before you. And they are scientific leadership, integrated assessment, benefit risk monitoring, managing talent, operational excellence, and knowledge management. The objectives most relevant to today's discussion, however, are those of the integrated assessment and benefit risk monitoring. Our objective in benefit risk monitoring, which is to establish a unified post-market safety surveillance framework, involves concepts that will be discussed more fully in session three today on using a benefit risk assessment to inform FDA and sponsor decision making in the post-market setting. So I would like to focus for a moment on the integrated assessment objective, in which we aim, essentially, um, to critically, collaboratively, and consistently assess whether information and submissions meet statutory and regulatory requirements and how this objective interfaces with the benefit risk assessment. As part of this assessment um, objective, we are going to take a new approach to document our assessments, developing a more integrated and cross-disciplinary document to foster collaboration and redundant information. And our assessments will continue to be rigorous, risk-based, and clinically relevant, focus on key issues and incorporate the patient perspective. When we're talking about um, one of our initiatives for the integrated assessment objective, we have developed or are developing a new integrated review for marketing applications. 
This integrated review is centered on three core principles. It's issue-based. These key issues will benefit from a more coordinated and interdisciplinary engagement. And that this approach is going to enhance our communication on key issues related to benefit risk, both internally and externally. So put together, this leads to designing an efficient issue-based interdisciplinary review process and template that results in an integrated FDA assessment of marketing applications highlighted by key issues that led to the marketing application decision. Key issues, oh, there we go, are generally comprised of issues that inform or characterize our assessment of benefit and risk. So how does the new integrated review for marketing um, for marketing applications as enhance our ability to assess and communicate on issues related to benefit and risk. Well, it's our responsibility not only to assess but to communicate the rationale behind our assessments and therefore we've identified several goals in this new um, integrated review for marketing applications that we believe enhance our review. It creates a template and a process that are issue-based. They foster interdisciplinary collaboration, reduce redundancy and low-value work, and enable better knowledge management. This facilitates interdisciplinary assessment and communication on issues of benefit risk. It develops a tracking tool to be utilized from pre-NDA throughout the end of the review cycle, allowing for systematic tracking of review issues for the entire review team. Well, this enables interdisciplinary transparency and collaboration on issues relevant to the assessment of benefit and risk. It adds new roles, the clinical data scientists to support safety analysis and medical editors to provide editing and formatting services. This allows more time for reviewers and review teams to focus on the critical thought and analyses that inform benefit and risk issues and assessments. And it incorporates purposeful scoping meetings with early involvement of agency leadership to discuss benefit and risk issues and joint assessment meetings to focus on specific review issues. This focuses the discussion on the key issues related to benefit and risk early and often throughout the review. So to this end, we believe that the enhancements we are making to the integrated review for marketing applications will bolster our assessment and communication of benefit risk. Similar initiatives are underway in other phases uh, of review throughout the life cycle of drug development. So I'd just like to end uh, taking a step back and considering the day. Uh, from the marketing application. You'll hear today about identification and characterization of issues of benefit and risk that occur throughout a drug's life cycle and impact our regulatory decision making. As Dr. Mullen noted earlier, patient input can help inform drug or product development very early on, even in the phases of discovery with the identification of unmet medical needs, unmet patient needs, and defining target patient populations that inform your therapeutic context. During further development in the clinical trials, there are opportunities for stakeholders to collaborate with the FDA on what values or weights are assigned to benefits and risks. These determinations can inform trial design. What these determinations could include will be discussed more in session one, activities that occur in pre-market development that best inform the FDA's benefit risk assessment. More on what this communication might look like and the information that can be exchanged between stakeholders and the FDA will be discussed further in session two, and effectively communicating benefit risk assessment information. As we move into the post-marketing phase, it's worth noting that uncertainty might exist in benefit as well as in risks, and leads to plans for mitigation, monitoring, or further characterization of these uncertainties or risks. And this will be discussed further today in session three. The key point to take away from today is that stakeholders can be thinking about benefit and risk at each stage in drug development and should seize the opportunity to discuss these considerations with the FDA to inform their programs. Thank you. All right, uh, Teresa, um, uh, Sarah, Carrie, Joe, thank you for very much for that uh, uh, overview of where we are and uh, where FDA is, uh, where it's headed, and what some of the key issues are where uh, input is really needed. I also want to um, give a quick apology to those of us who are joining online. We have been having uh, some technical difficulties uh, with the stability of the uh, of the web feed. Uh, the venue is working on that to, to correct it. I appreciate your staying with us. The recording is not affected at all, and hopefully we'll get these uh, technical issues fully resolved shortly.
Uh, in the meantime, this is the uh, first of those opportunities for some uh, questions and, and input in the process. So if any of you all have any questions about the overview uh, for the day, what, um, uh, what FDA has presented so far, I'd encourage you to, uh, to come up to the microphone to uh, ask those questions and we'll start this, uh, hopefully start this, uh, this dialogue off right away. Uh, yeah, and Teresa, come on back up. Um, while uh, while uh, waiting for uh, anyone who wants to come up to make a question, uh, um, let, me, let me start out with one. Um, as uh, as you just heard, uh, uh, benefit risk assessment, a framework for doing it, is definitely not new uh, at FDA. It's uh, already been become an important part of the regulatory process. And I wonder if uh, uh, Teresa, Sarah, maybe you all have any comments or uh, maybe a little bit more of a sense of uh, how it's worked out and maybe where further input would be uh, would be most helpful. I guess it's on. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, Mark, you're right. <laughs> the, uh, the structure of the framework hasn't changed a great deal. I think we found it to be pretty robust uh, w with the way it, uh, we have it today. Uh, what we see is an opportunity to continue to um, elaborate and enhance its use. And as, as Sarah, I think, alluded to with the ability to move into um, more uh, quantitative approaches where the data support that and the decision making uh, really uh, call, you know, um, justifies that or where that would be needed. Uh, we've learned a lot since the start of the um, benefit risk effort. It preceded uh, the patient focused drug development effort and actually that was an enhancement of benefit risk that we started in, under PDUFA 5. So we've really come to a, a great deal of learning ourselves about um, the opportunity missed perhaps in some cases in the past of not engaging the patient at really what you might call a critical to quality points in the process. Um, that uh, where uh, the, as, and again, as, as we were saying in our, our discussions earlier um, about what endpoints uh, do we even know what endpoints? Do we have endpoints and so on? So there's a great deal of opportunity for increased quality in terms of the program and the evidence and maybe the product and how the product is actually uh, configured and developed by the company. I'll add one from a communication point of view, which is something we, um, we struggle with a lot. Uh, the applications, the reviews are complex and have enormous amounts of data and and even as someone who works with the review teams I, I don't understand it all I can't the complexities are so much what would be helpful um, to get input through the docket or elsewhere is what level of detail you would like to see in frameworks that you need to help um, understand uh, the decision making and the judgments knowing that the framework is meant for a broad number of audiences and there are other places for technical details um, and that that attention given to technical details can kind of still leave a little bit of the trees rather than the forest picture. So uh, input from uh, on that would be very helpful. Um, what type of information, supporting information is most important to you? Yeah. I appreciate the emphasis on uh, patient engagement that comes through in the background document and the, the, the linkage to the work on patient-focused drug development. And um, uh, yeah, these are, uh, um, the, 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 the um, process is getting more complex, a, a lot of things that, uh, that could be incorporated in it. And you all mentioned in the, uh, in the overview the expectations around uh, new types of products, uh, new types of, uh, of data coming in, especially maybe more patient-generated uh, uh, data, and uh, as well as the perspectives, uh, and um, uh, new analytic methods. Um, uh, 21st Century Cures also included uh, a big push for FDA around real-world evidence and, and um, uh, that, that whole uh, life cycle approach that, that you all emphasize as well. Um, any comments here? I know there was the, the, the general goal um, you emphasize is uh, fit for purpose, uh, uh, the data, the methods, and so forth uh, for, for the benefit risk assessment, but it does seem like things are getting even more complex or the, the kinds of uh, uh, inputs the benefit risk assessments are, are becoming broader and richer, which could be a good thing, but uh, it does make these um, uh, processes potentially more, more complicated. Um, yeah, I guess I would, is this on? 
Yes, it is, just. I would just offer a, a comment on that, that uh, you know, a tremendous amount of thought goes into all of our assessments and regulatory decisions. So as things become more complicated and complex, being able to really purposefully um, be able to communicate the, the how multiple disciplines came together and thought about these very complex issues and what their final rationale was and the assessments that led to that rationale only becomes more important for us to be able to communicate. Yeah, I think that your emphasis on the, the integration of the benefit risk assessment is a big theme going forward mm -hmm. and how to get input on that too is a, is a reflection of that point. Um, please uh, let us know who you are when you uh, ask your question. <laughs> from Janssen R&D, just as an aside, we spend about as much time figuring out how to communicate a benefit risk ass assessment as we do actually conducting it. Because mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. get people to spend, uh, we'll spend two hours understanding what you did. Um, I want to understand more about the integrated uh, template that you were describing, Kerry. Um, is that something that's internal to the FDA, or is that a, a tool to uh, enhance communication and understanding between a sponsor and the FDA during the entire course of development? Uh, it's currently internal processes. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a internal processes that we are working on phased implementation currently to test fit for purpose. So when we want to begin to express ideas, as we as sponsor wants to say, you know, we're thinking about using these endpoints for benefit risk, we're mm -hmm. thinking about this auxiliary mm -hmm. analysis, maybe something more quantitative or how to fold in preference mm -hmm. information. We would describe that to you, and then if you think that's a good idea, you would put that into the integrated template as something for the No, team. no, the, the integrated template is for marketing application review, so that's after you've already come in with the application. And so what you're discussing is more, I think, what the focus of session two is going to be at. So what opportunities do you have throughout drug development prior to the marketing application to? That's session one. Session one. Oh, okay, session one. Session so, which one of the sessions <laughs> to to uh, to interface with the FDA exactly on what those elements of benefit and risk are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you all want to add anything more about the the integrated uh, benefit risk assessment? Uh, um, it, it does sound like a, 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 an important um, a new step that's trying to account for uh, these combination of uh, additional interest in patient-focused drug development and, and additional sources of data uh, input, et cetera, that you were, that you were highlighting. Do you want me to say? Yeah. Go ahead. I, I think I would say it's, it's really just uh, taking to a new level, Mark, something that has already been going on. I mean, I think that there's been interdisciplinary team review for a long time at FDA. Yeah. Um, but as, as, as Sarah and Carrie Joe are pointing out, with the um, complexity of the development programs, the variety of data sources and study types and considerations, um, just trying to keep the process as efficient as possible for the reviewers, uh, it's trying to pull together a, a more of a, um, a better choreography, <laughs> maybe, in terms of how those discussions are happening, how the information is brought together, and then being uh, communicated and written up uh, based on discussions. And I'll, I'll ask Carrie Joe if I've misrepresented anything when I've said that. That's my impression. No, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we take patient input into account at all phases of drug review. I mean, their, their, their context and how, as Teresa has pointed out, what they consider clinically meaningful benefit, which is what we are trying to achieve uh, and what they consider acceptable risk is important to the overall decision. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, yes, please. Hi, good morning. I'm Annie Kennedy. I'm with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. And first of all, I just want to say thank you. I think today is a phenomenal achievement for everyone here and all of the stakeholders represented. We're one of the organizations that helped work on some of the legislation that helped get us here. And I just want to say that one of the things that really struck me as I was watching is the focus on pulling all of this through the drug development life cycle. Mm -hmm. I know that we're really focusing on CEDAR, but we've also been doing a lot of work with CBER on some of the benefit risk decision making. And to the point that um, Dr. Eggers just made, we really do have to focus on how we get some of these tools into the information that informs provider decision making. Mm -hmm. as as the complexities of these therapies become more complicated, there are a lot of nuanced decisions. We've done a lot of um, qualitative research and we've worked with a lot of clinicians who are very skittish that as the 
as the benefits may get higher, so do the risks in some of these therapeutic interventions. And they don't have the tools and the resources to make these decisions. And so a lot of the same work that we're doing to inform the determinations that can be made by regulators are a lot of the same tools that can be put into the resources that accompany the labeling. And so we really would like to work with all of you to figure out how we do that, how we push those resources out beyond the regulatory decision to inform that ecosystem beyond that regulatory decision. And we have to support that ecosystem. So thank you very much for the opening up with that emphasis because we're all committed to working with you on that. Thank you. Uh, any further comments on that? I saw some head nodding. So. Can I, I'll clarify one thing. I just want to make it clear that this is um, as much a CBER meeting as it is a CDER meeting. CBER is here. I see Hong right there. So, um, so uh, yeah, if it's not clear, this is CBER and CDER coming together. Okay. Um, so, uh, FDA CBER, uh, Hong Yan. So I, I would like to make a comment uh, on the communication. So based on our cyber uh, experience, I feel like uh, benefit risk assessment are not just important for communication of the decision and the rationale to the stakeholder, uh, but also very, very important for our internal mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, like we discussed uh, in FDA, our review is basically uh, integrate um, a multidiscipline team. So each individual uh, review uh, uh, aspect of the review. So I think uh, based on our experience, actually have a benefit risk framework uh, will help uh, the team to understand each of their review, how they uh, uh, fit into the context of the overall benefit risk assessment. Yeah. So, so I just want to make a comment on yeah. this. Thank, thank you. It's a really good point uh, about, it uh, gets back to integration uh, mm -hmm. uh, again, too. And, and uh, I, we do want to emphasize this is a CDER, CBER, uh, uh, very much a, a joint effort. Um, uh, Teresa, Sarah, Carrie Joe, any final comments before we, uh, before we break? Not for me. I don't want to okay. stand in the way of session one. Okay, right. So uh, we are we are planning to to get to session one. Um, there is a, a, oh, a very very quick. Um, yes, yes. Uh, my name is Stephen Sun. I'm from Sinius Health. I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. Eggers this question about the uh, benefit risk framework. Previously, um, risk and risk management were distinct, separate rows. Can you just explain the subtleties as to why uh, yeah. now they're fused together? Yes. In practice, it is very difficult to distinguish the risk management from the risk. And we were finding that although the risk management is something that takes into account thinking about benefits and, and risks, the, um, the, the clarity of being able to describe the risks and the potential to address those risks all in one section um, outweighed the the nuances that were there. We, we needed something that we could clearly communicate um, how risk management could help address the risks. The thoughts about whether risk management is justified, let's say for example, a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, on the need for that, whether the REMS are needed um, if, if it's necessary to ensure that the benefits will outweigh the risks, that is discussed in the conclusions on benefit to risk, that's where you would make those conclusions about whether a risk a particular risk management strategy was necessary as a decision that that we that we make. Great. Does that clarify? Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we'll have, uh, I think, a lot more opportunities for discussion on, on points like this as we go forward. Uh, right now, we are scheduled to take a, a short break till 10.15. I know it seems like we just got going, but uh, when you come back from the break uh, for our first uh, big session to, to dive into these issues on activities that occur in pre-market development, uh, um, best inform FDA's benefit risk assessment. That's going to be a longer session. We want uh, everybody to bring their full game. So uh, we'll be starting, <laughs> starting up again at uh, 1015. Uh, right now, uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking uh, Teresa, Sarah, and Carrie Jo for their opening presentations. <laughs> for this session on uh, activities that occur in pre-market development, to best inform FDA's benefit risk assessment. I want to thank you all for the 
uh, participation during our introductory session earlier where you heard the, um, uh, the overview. Uh, in this session, we're going to hear first from Jim Smith, who's a uh, medical officer and immediate office policy staff with the Office of New Drugs. Uh, at FDA. Jim is going to provide an overview and then several key examples of how FDA implements benefit risk assessments during the medical product review process. Following the presentation, we're going to open things up for a panel discussion. Uh, I'm going to introduce the full panel after uh, Jim's remarks, though, uh, uh, in just a little bit. So, Jim, uh, please come on up and uh, here's the Got it. Thank you very much. Let's see. <clears throat> so thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak. Um, and as uh, Mark said, I'll, I'll be um, discussing relatively briefly, so this will have to be uh, fairly high level, um, key considerations into FDA's benefit risk assessment of a, of a pre-marketing uh, application. Um, uh, you have already seen from Sarah in the documents and probably watching FDA's reviews um, that what I have listed on the left of this slide here, analysis of condition, current treatment options, benefit, and risk and risk management, um, are the elements, if you will, of FDA's benefit risk framework. Um, and the reason I've drawn it a little bit differently here is just to emphasize that, at least for me conceptually, um, these are not isolated rows in a table but rather think of them as um, a series of uh, inputs, um, each of which could have you know, many considerations within them. But it really all gets integrated together into some algorithm, if you will. I'm using that term loosely, not so much in the quantitative sense. Um, but it's really the interaction of these terms um, that is what comes out of our benefit risk assessment and, and leads us to draw a, frankly, usually a dichotomous benefit risk conclusion, like approve or uh, not approve. Um, and just to give an example of, of why I say it's sort of the interaction, I mean, this might be obvious to many folks in the room, um, but consider a hypothetical where you have a drug that has a rather modest benefit. Perhaps some might even question the clinical importance of the endpoint. Um, and maybe layered on top of that is the uncertainty that the clinical trial population really adequately represents the population that would be exposed to the drug if the drug were approved. That situation might be perfectly fine. Um, uh, and in fact, in the rare unmet need space where you're dealing with a severe disease and there's no other alternative therapies, even that modest benefit could sort of get amplified, if you will, in our calculus of benefit and risk. Whereas in the scenario where you have a common disease, maybe it's non-serious, maybe there's a multitude of treatment options already out there, the same benefit, like the impact of that on the benefit risk assessment could be attenuated uh, compared to the rare disease space because of the other factors. So, you know, in, in that scenario, the analysis of condition, the current treatment options um, are really having an interaction um, with how the benefit uh, is viewed, uh, if you will. So it's, it's really an amalgamation of, of all of these concepts into the benefit risk uh, framework. Um, so the benefit risk assessment requires forming judgment. Um, this is not entirely data-driven uh, right now. Um, as has been described, it's largely a qualitative framework um, that's informed by data, but at the end of the day, you're forming a judgment. Um, and so this judgment is informed by integrating many of these different inputs, if you will, um, and those inputs are supported by whatever evidence and analyses are available. Um, always there is some degree of uncertainty about these inputs. In fact, I mean, if we were to uh, require certainty as if one could ever achieve that on both the benefit side and the risk side, that would be a disservice, in my opinion, to the public health um, because we would be delaying so long hoping for the pinnacle of, you know, the ultimate benefit risk calculus um, that many people could be uh, uh, harmed in the process. 
Um, so, but ultimately, this degree of uncertainty leads the benefit risk assessment to be, frankly, probabilistic in nature. We're dealing with two probabilities, um, and that is the probability of, of benefit um, and the probability of harm. And I'm using that even though probability for the quantitative folks in the audience could probably work on trying to calculate that. That's not my intent. Um, but that's kind of the general, even in a qualitative sense, um, that's what, that's what uh, we, ne we need to consider. Um, and so our judgment, therefore, must take these uncertainties into account. And any time judgment is involved, different experts um, may sometimes reach different conclusions because their judgment is different. Um, and that makes some of what you've heard in the, the opening remarks by um, Sarah and Carrie Jo our communication of the thinking um, incredibly important. Um, both to the stakeholders, the public, the patients, uh, industry, um, but also, as was mentioned previously um, by our CBRA colleague, internal to FDA. Uh, review divisions want to know why other review divisions made decisions the way they did, because that might impact how they then make decisions, because we all ought to be approaching things at least from a similar uh, way of thinking. Um, so I've been tasked with trying to relatively quickly um, uh, move through each of these uh, elements, if you will. Um, so uh, table one in the FDA's uh, discussion document is where much of this comes from, although uh, in the limited time that I have, and I do not want to stand in the way of this exemplary panel that we have in front of you, um, uh, this is meant to be uh, rather high level and not comprehensive. Um, so to start with the analysis of condition, um, uh, this really sets up the context of use for the proposed indication. Um, uh, and so as such, it, there's really little focus on the drug per se. It's more the disease or condition that is being treated, although um, one would want to emphasize the aspects of the condition that one would hope that the drug would be uh, targeting and helping with, perhaps. Um, but this is how is the patient population defined, and are there known subsets, uh, for example, within that patient population who have particular um, unmet needs? Um, and as uh, as many have already alluded to and we're going to hear more from, uh, patients can really help us with this. Um, the clinical aspects of the condition uh, are those that you would think about. Um, uh, is this a rare versus common condition, for example, the prevalence? Um, and certainly the tolerance for, for uncertainty varies uh, substantially across that spectrum. Um, what's the severity of this disease? What's the natural history? Are we dealing with a rapidly progressive uh, condition? Or is this a slowly progressive condition where there could be competing risks such that the uh, natural competing risks to the patient where um, one might be more concerned about uh, the drug risks actually um, uh, being more of a, a, an issue um, than what the patient would experience in their lifetime, potentially. Um, uh, what's the heterogeneity of the disease? And I think that especially in, in there are certain therapeutic areas, as you all know, where we are getting smarter and smarter about better defining why some diseases are heterogeneous and poten potentially even targeting drugs um, to those areas of, of heterogeneity. Um, but this also becomes important uh, in, in trial design, for example, as I'll, as I'll mention in a moment. What's the impact to quality of life of the disease? Um, Patient-focused disease burden. You know, patients, as Teresa mentioned and, and others will, patients live with these diseases every day. So who better to ask about, about what matters? Um, and I'd like to, on each of these, just pause for a moment also and, and, and talk about uh, just some examples of, of how um, this particular benefit risk element, if it's thought about early in development, um, could influence the development program. Um, uh, an analysis con condition could have certainly influence on trial design. If you're in a rare disease space where the natural history of the disease is very well known, um, single arm trials with external controls uh, might become much more feasible than in other areas where perhaps the natural history is not at all well understood. Um, uh, patient selection, who to target? Um, uh, are we targeting patients who are intolerant to current therapies? I mean, would we be able to demonstrate that, that a patient who is intolerant to existing therapy would then be uh, uh, tolerable of the new therapy? Because that would certainly be um, a benefit that we would care about. Um, 
uh, I couldn't think of a better place to put this, but dose selection is so important um, in our ultimate benefit risk calculus. I mean, getting how, how, how better to nail the sweet spot of, of benefit risk than to get the dose right. Um, and so think about the condition and what aspects of that condition, whether it could be a lab abnormality, a lab abnormality, a symptom, uh, something that could be used in early phase development, um, even if it's not going to be an acceptable endpoint for a registrational trial, perhaps, it could be used in early phase development um, as a pharmacodynamic measure, perhaps, to get the dose right. Um, and so just knowledge of the disease could help with that. It doesn't really take anything more. What is the disease and what does your drug do? Uh, it will certainly involve uh, or affect duration of trials. If you're dealing with a disease, you've got to know when you would expect an outcome or, or um, um, uh, whatnot, and obviously endpoints. Um, I mean, there's a lot here that analysis of condition should, in and of itself, before anything is known about the drug, should impact drug development. What are the endpoints that matter to patients? Um, uh, ask this early. What are the variability in those endpoints? What's known about those endpoints in the natural history of the disease? Um, and obviously, throughout development, um, your tolerance of risk um, will, will vary uh, depending on uh, the underlying uh, condition. Um, the current treatment options is the other bucket that falls into what's the therapeutic context. Um, what are the goals of the current standard of care, and what does efficacy and safety look like uh, for the available therapies, um, including perhaps for subsets of patients in some of these diseases? Um, without knowing kind of the background of what's out there, it's hard to place um, your new drug uh, into context. Um, and uh, consider tolerability of existing therapies. Is it possible that patients who um, uh, don't tolerate uh, the existing therapies might better tolerate uh, your drug? And can you prove that? Um, so does, basically the question is, does this new therapy fill a gap? Um, or does it provide an alternative uh, to what's out there? Um, and what are the patient perspectives on their unmet needs? Um, these factors can also influence trial design. Are you going to be conducting an add-on trial, or are you going to conduct a trial where you would compare your drug to the alternatives that are out there? Um, should you be considering an active control? Um, we don't require uh, you to um, uh, beat or be superior than uh, available therapies that are out there, uh, but if that's what you think your drug will do, uh, consider that, because that's going to help make help clinicians make benefit risk decisions um, because it's, it's frankly a little bit difficult to talk about what the benefit is unless you're talking about what the comparator is, the benefit compared to what. Um, and obviously, once again, patient selection uh, and endpoints. Uh, benefit, um, uh, the strengths and limitations of clinical trials and the implications for assessing uh, efficacy. Um, uh, this is really kind of the, the thrust of, of the benefit assessment um, in a marketing application is what does the evidence look like. Um, uh, different designs will bring different amounts of uncertainty. Um, you know, in general, uh, a blinded randomized control trial will bring with it more certainty um, than an external control. Um, but I say here on the slide that these are not determinative. Uh, it's possible that you could have a randomized control trial that leaves you with a tremendous amount of uncertainty about a drug's effect, and you could have an externally controlled trial um, uh, that is... Uh, uh, that makes, for example, a uh, tumor regress that would never have otherwise regressed, um, an externally controlled trial could be very convincing. Um, the clinical relevance of the study endpoints uh, should be thought of very early. And this is even before I'm, uh, this, this is, um, uh, I'm saying the clinical relevance of the study endpoints. This isn't even thinking about the results yet. This is just what the endpoint is. Um, and this includes surrogate endpoints. If, if you're considering a surrogate endpoint, think about, how much do we know about the relationship between the surrogate and the ultimate clinical outcome of interest? Because then to get to the next bullet of the clinical significance of the demonstrated result, um, this is not only looking at the nature of benefit with respect to the, how large the effect size is, um, how long the effect might last, and what the specific outcome is, um, but if, for example, a trial is using a surrogate, it'd be sure nice to have at least some idea of the relationship between the surrogate quantitatively, if you will, and the, and the clinical outcome, because that will help weigh uh, benefits and risks. 
Um, the ability for patients and providers to distinguish individual benefits is something that I don't think um, is probably uh, considered enough. Um, we often, um, uh, we need to be careful here because sometimes folks can think that their drug is doing something uh, that it is uh, perhaps not. Um, uh, but if a patient can truly tell that the drug is having an effect for them, then it's much easier to actually bring that benefit risk calculus down to the individual patient level as opposed to the population level, which is a, a interesting to thing to think about uh, a bit more. And this gets to the distribution of effects that we might observe within a population of patients given a drug. Um, the ability to predict which patients may benefit um, is also uh, something that would be very interesting to us as we consider benefit risk. Um, the benefit in the post-marketing setting is likely to be different than in the clinical trials. And so this requires speculation, um, uh, but it's important to think about because ultimately we're not approving drugs to be used in clinical trials, we're um, approving them to be used in practice. Um, and so uh, during development, uh, as I've sort of indicated, uh, many of these things come into play. Risk has a lot of the same considerations. Um, the strengths and limitations of the safety evaluation uh, have uh, implications for how we assess um, drug risks. Um, how many patients were exposed, um, the duration of exposure. How much of that exposure was actually just uncontrolled open label versus actually controlled uh, data? Um, depending on the adverse event that you're interested in, that can be an incredibly important question. Um, and, and I'd suggest in the design phase, um, uh, why not consider introducing an active control beyond your primary endpoint? If you're doing a placebo-controlled trial and you can only do that ethically for a short period of time, then introduce an active control and get, instead of an open-label extension, uh, and get some comparative safety data. That could be useful for you and for clinicians. Um, uncertainty here, uh, uh, oh, I, I skipped one, that the clinical significance, including the patient perspective if available, uh, is obviously very important. What are the harms we're talking about, and how might we be able to predict um, and detect and uh, mitigate them? Uncertainty is expected. Um, trials are not powered, generally, for safety. Um, and so the absence of a safety signal does not mean the drug is safe, as I think you all know, but sometimes uh, bears reminders, uh, both internally um, and externally. And um, uh, we often have underrepresented um, at-risk populations in clinical trials, so it requires some speculation about what might happen uh, once the drug is approved. Um, and once again, just like on the benefit side with regard to surrogates, often there are surrogates in the safety space. And uh, what is known about quantitative relationships between, let's say, an increase in blood pressure and cardiovascular outcomes from a safety perspective? And how do we kind of factor all of that in? Um, when a drug is approved, uh, the post-market setting is very different than clinical trials. And so uh, the benefit-risk framework, you know, thinking about just what was observed in the trial is really not probably what was going to, going to be observed in practice. And it's very difficult to predict and requires some speculation uh, because post-marketing, we will have things like labeling and uh, perhaps a REMS or perhaps other strategies to let providers know about the risks. Um, but on the flip side, uh, safety monitoring in the post-market market setting will likely not be as robust as it was in a trial. Um, so it, it really requires some extension um, and some speculation about what might, might happen. Almost wrapping up here, the putting it together um, it comes into the benefit risk conclusion. Um, and this is that really you're weighing the benefit risk um, and that must consider both the product specific data in the therapeutic context and tolerance for un uncertainty um, and the trade-offs about a product's benefit and risk are going to vary with the clinical situation and the patient experience can really and their perspective can really inform this consideration. Ultimately, I said it's a judgment that is made regarding whether that probability and the magnitude of benefit seems to exceed the probability and magnitude of harm. Um, and what further evidence might be necessary uh, is, in, is really important to consider in, in making this ultimate weighing at the end. Um, and uh, sometimes, like in the setting of accelerated approval, we have very clear pathways by which we get additional data. Um, and in the safety perspective, we might have post-marketing requirements. Um, 
uh, and as I'll just float that supplementary quantitative approaches uh, may certainly be informative to the overall um, qualitative benefit risk assessment. And so in summary, um, these, the analysis of condition, the current treatment options, the expected benefits, the expected risks, these are inputs into our benefit risk assessment during the review of a marketing application. And although we describe and discuss them individually, the ultimate conclusion is really the interaction of these things. Um, and if you consider this benefit risk framework early in development, and I'd be happy to discuss further how we can do that with industry sponsors um, during development, um, it can really help with pretty much from day one of a phase one trial um, in some aspect um, and critically at, at end of phase two. So um, with that, I'll stop and uh, appreciate your attention and look forward to the discussion. Uh, Jim, thanks very much for that uh, comprehensive overview to, to kick us off. So uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists. They're going to start with um, some opening comments about uh, key considerations that they want to make sure we bring up around uh, benefit risk assessment in the pre-market setting, how to go forward effectively, and of course any other issues that you all want to uh, want, want to highlight. And then we're going to have some follow-up discussion and uh, involve uh, all of you who, who want to make comments as well. So be thinking about your uh, question, and, and uh, um, we will have some time uh, with, the, with the microphones, too. Uh, but for right now, I'd like to introduce uh, first uh, Connie Berlin, Global Head of Quantitative Safety and Epidemiology at Novartis, Bill Wang, the Executive Director for Clinical Safety Statistics at Merck, John Crowley, Chairman and CEO of Amicus Therapeutics, uh, Bray Patrick Lake, the Director of Stakeholder Engagement and Research Together, pro and, and the Stakeholder Engagement and Research Together Program Lead for the Duke Clinical Research Institute, and Brett Halbert, uh, Senior Economist and Vice President of Health Preference Assessment <laughs> at RTI Health Solutions. Uh, so, Connie, maybe we can start with you. Oh, you can stay where you are if you want, unless you uh, would you rather stand. Just okay. Like to move the slide. Okay, please. Then, then come on. <clears throat> Okay, good. Thanks very much. So good morning, everybody. First, thanks very much to FDA for inviting me. And it's my pleasure to uh, provide you an industry perspective on how companies and sponsors uh, might be able to support further the benefit risk assessments uh, for the regulatory decision making. Um, just so does not work yet. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Um, no, sorry, I had something. Uh, there's some animation in, which, uh, so now, okay. Good, uh, just to say that the views and opinions which I would like to express here are my own and not necessarily those of Novartis and also my second role, which is the industry lead of an IMI Prefair project and which I would like to briefly touch on also during that presentation. So, okay. Um, actually, um, Novartis started the implementation of the structured benefit risk approach in 2012, and what we have defined as objectives at that time became now really our achievements. So in our benefit risk uh, sections, which we submit with the clinical overviews today, we show what the key benefits and key risks are and also express why these are key. Uh, we say what comparators were chosen, uh, we show the magnitude of the benefit and risk effects, and in most of the cases we present these in a graphical or tabular summary together with a concise text. So we aimed to write these benefit risk sections in a way that it allows a dialogue with all the stakeholders, and I believe this is where we are today. Next. Um, so the foundation is set and uh, we started to think about other areas uh, where we as a sponsor can uh, even more provide support to the benefit risk assessments. And I picked here two areas, uh, understanding the patient perspective and the benefit risk assessment in the context of the treatment landscape. This is what we have heard as very important for FDA uh, from Teresa Molin earlier this morning already. And I would like to outline what I believe sponsors can do in supporting uh, the generation of evidence here. So let's start with understanding the patient perspective. And we have heard from several speakers before already that this is important. We see this in the key considerations um, of the FDA's benefit risk work. So I don't want to uh, uh, emphasize again what we are looking for with the patient perspective, but rather like to share with you some work from 
my colleague Nigel Cook. Um, so what we, I think the ultimate goal is that we provide the patient perspective in a scientific rigor way so that industry regulators and also the HDA bodies are confident enough to base their decisions on this information. So um, we have seen, and, and I think we all know that the gathering the patient perspective is another very complex topic. And what we have learned from the structured benefit risk approach, approach is that these structures really help us simplifying uh, a complex topic and also giving us somehow a roadmap how to continue and, and how to go through such a topic. So what I especially like with this approach here is that uh, it gives us a few elements to focus on. The first thing which we recommend is to start early uh, with the proof of concept in phase one to gather the patient perspectives. And then what are elements to do this? Um, the first thing is understanding what is out already. So what is published, what do we know about uh, the disease and what we know about the patient perspective already. Uh, with our growing digital world, we have also access to other public information. So social media listening became actually also one of the methods to understand what people talk about in social media forums and uh, to use that information to understand again what patient needs are uh, and what the disease is about. And then this information can feed the next step with a more in-depth qualitative research with, for instance, online bulletin boards or with uh, in-depth interviews patients to further understand what really matters to patients. So if we have done this, we can inform, uh, we can use that information to inform our PRO strategies or endpoint selections or do more quantitative research with, for instance, patient preference studies to quantify actually what matters to the patients and also the trade-offs of the benefit risks. And this is what we all know uh, and direct input into our benefit risk assessment. What we find very important is that all these steps are done together with the patient groups that we very quickly publish the information and manuscripts are also at conferences and that we have a constant dialogue between all the stakeholders. And what we especially recommend is uh, use the opportunity of the early scientific advice with the regulators or the HDA bodies. So FDA also asked what guidance or other resources should be consulted. And here I would like to introduce you and mention the IMI Prefer project, which is a public-private partnership, which will develop evidence and expert-based ba expert and, uh, expert and evidence-based recommendations uh, on how and when patient preference can be assessed and used to inform medical product decision making. That is a project which started in 2016 and will finish in 2021. And what we actually really aim to deliver are uh, standards and fit for purpose criteria for patient preference studies, how to design, conduct, and report results from these studies, including how we, um, how we, Oh my God, I get a bit confused by the timing. Um, uh, how we use and select the most appropriate preference methods. And also we would like to give a little bit of an outline how these preferences can be used for decision making. So let me just touch shortly, briefly on my second topic. I'll go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, and we heard this also before, that the benefit risk assessment in the context of the treatment landscape is important. Um, FDA's key considerations uh, show us clearly um, where the treatment options come in. So first, we would like to understand really how the current treatment options cover the patient needs. And with the whole benefit is risk assessment, that should lead us to the question how the product, if approved, may enhance the treatment landscape. So again, what can the, can the sponsors do here? Next slide. Okay. Um, investigating the benefit risk, uh, the, the treatment landscape is something uh, all the sponsors do as part of their development portfolio decision making. So we look into this anyway very early, so uh, we can also make use of that. And certainly the ultimate goal at the end is that we do not only present our benefit and risk effects of the new product together with all the treatment options we have uh, investigated in our de own development program, but that we 
integrate also the treatment effects from the available, the other available treatment options. So based on the current treatment options, we can define the benefit risk context for the new product quite early. We can anticipate what are probably the key benefits and key risks. We can retrieve the magnitude of the benefit risk and um, benefit and risk uh, treatment effects from publicly available information, uh, and we certainly should need to understand also the strengths and limitations of the, the other development programs to put everything together again in a very scientific and rigorous way. So if we if we know uh, and use that knowledge from the existing treatment landscape then uh, that helps us to design maybe even our own development program by, for instance, considering the current treatment options as comparators in our own development program. And then in the next step, if we have all this data together, uh, we can uh, respond, we can not only answer the question now how the benefits and risks of the new product will compare to what we have investigated in our own development program, but also how it compares to the other treatment options which are available. As somehow mentioned before already, that should be done in a scientific rigor way, and I don't want to go into the details here. Uh, what, I, uh, what I want to encourage you is to uh, use the uh, opportunity of starting the benefit risk activities really early, but certainly not to just put data side by side. So there, there is certainly something which we have to deal with cautious. But um, imagine to having all these data and presenting these data to FDA in a tabular or graphic format will allow them to answer their main question, so how the product, if approved, may enhance the treatment landscape. And on the other hand side, I think it gives us also the opportunity to, um, to prepare the next steps of decision making, which is reimbursement decisions, and it's also the conversations between the doctor and the patient. And I believe this is a good opportunity to give also something back to the patients because the information will be very informative, and we ask patients more and more to support also us uh, during the drug, drug development. Thank you. Okay, and next is uh, Bill Wong. Do you want to stay there? Or here? I'll stay here. Okay. I, don't, I don't have a slide. Okay. Uh, but first, let, let me thank the organizer for inviting me to uh, offer some comments. And uh, as uh, Mark introduced, I'm uh, head of uh, the clinical safety statistics. Uh, within Mark, I'm also actively participating in some of the benefit risk working group and where we try to implement this uh, at Merck. But in my moonlight job, I'm also chairing or co-chairing uh, ASA safety working group uh, in that we actually have 30 some cross industry and regulator statisticians. We also have uh, uh, almost 15 physicians. We work together looking at how we should, you know, do safety assessment, but also we are getting into how we link safety into the benefits risk discussion. So my comment, Today, a lot of are uh, inspired by some of the work uh, we are doing at Merck, but also some of the work through the ASA uh, DI and Safety Working Group. But the opinion are my own, so it represents my own opinion. Uh, so I do like to uh, really giving a comment on the great presentation done by four, four great speakers uh, by, from our FDA colleagues. Uh, first, I really want to applaud the discussion document and also Dr. Molin's uh, presentation to lay out this, uh, this kind of uh, life cycle thinking of benefit risk assessment. In some way, I feel the ICHM4E tell us what needs to be done. This is telling us how to do it. The how to do it, I think uh, Dr. Molin mentioned really the three key message in her presentation. So one is about do this throughout life cycle. And if you look at the page six, figure two, it actually lay out, this should be thought about at the discovery stage, to you know, clinical, to post-marketing, and this is the setup of, of, of workshop today. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Smith also lay out beautifully the patient thinking should be considered throughout this whole process, this including very early on, when you try to identify 
the disease, the severity, and also the options you are bring to the market. So these are critical, important thinkings in terms of how do we get there. And uh, another thing is, and Dr. Eager has lay, lay out pretty clearly this idea of using benefit risk framework as a snapshot at a moment of time during this life cycle of drug development. And uh, actually in our working group, we actually are talking about how do we do that. And one idea we are brainstorming in our working group, uh, the ASN DIN working group, is this concept of benefit risk assessment planning document, a document that is interpretive, that is kind of proactive, that across stages you modify what you know at that moment of time, what is the gap regarding the benefit risk, what you, you should do next uh, at that moment in time, how should you plan the next stage. And that should be in partnership, because uh, this is a safety working group, about how you should proactively handle the safety assessment. So we also are developing a concept called ASAP, the Aggregated Safety Assessment Planning Document. And we envision these two documents will be in partnership so that you can use this document that to kind of document what you know and to think about what you want to do next. And this can be used not only within the sponsor across discipline, but can also be used to discuss across uh, you know, different stakeholders, internal, externals. And so, so I really want to uh, applaud that, uh, that the, the planned benefit, I, I know Dr. Eger used this word, planned benefit risk. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really echo on that, the word planning. Uh, I think that's important uh, in this whole process. And also Dr. Eger mentioned about the quantitative method within the qualitative framework. That I actually liked very much. I don't want to look at the qualitative versus quantitative in a sort of binary way, but rather think about quantitative as part of the overall qualitative process. And there's a level of quantification in that qualitative process. There are some of the quantification can be very kind of general, but as you move from the, throughout the drug development process, the level of quantification can increase. And so it's good to think in that continuum way of level of quantifications. So I really want to echo on that plan, that whole process. And then uh, Dr. Lee uh, mentioned about this integrated assessment. I think that's another important point that as now we are getting more into different way of doing drug development, the randomized trial versus real world trial, the master protocols, the patient input, all this provide extra opportunity, but also extra challenges in this whole effort. It does require a holistic, uh, integrated thinking on this. So I really like the way you lay that out in your slide, but I'm further encouraged by you thinking about that integrated way and the benefit risk somewhat together, because I truly believe benefit risk thinking is an important anchor or it's an important way to kind of anchor your whole integrated thinking, because at the end of the day, it's a benefit risk judgment. So, so I, I, I really like to integrate thinking, but also link that to benefit risk. But of course, that requires a lot of new innovation coming. So we have to work together to think about how to develop new framework, new, new method, new methodologies to integrate them together. So I'm very encouraged. Today. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, uh, and John, please. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, I thought I'd just begin. There are a couple of points I'd like to make this morning. Uh, just begin by, you know, why I am on this panel. I was asked to be here as uh, the CEO and founder of a small biotech company. We're about 600 people at Amicus, and we work in the field of rare diseases, uh, primarily in the lysosomal storage disorders. So to think about the benefit risk assessment from the perspective of a smaller company, uh, an entrepreneurial company, um, but also as, uh, from a patient perspective. I used to say that I, I have two hats when, when I come to speak at forums like that. One is the, the hat of a CEO, an entrepreneur of a biotech company. The other is as the father of two children with a rare 
neuromuscular disease, Pompeii disease. Um, I've come to learn that these really aren't two hats. There's only one hat, and one oftentimes informs the other. So what I'd like to talk about briefly this morning is how we try uh, in our lives, and particularly in drug development at Amicus, to incorporate the patient perspective with the mind tour to benefit risk assessment throughout the drug development process, even beginning when we think about whether to get into any particular therapeutic field or disease area. Um, so, and, and I will tell you just at the outset, uh, I am really, really pleased with what I've seen. This has, for our family now, been a more than 21-year journey into the field of, of rare diseases. Our, uh, my Megan is now 22, my Patrick is 21, uh, still living and thriving despite the challenges of being on a ventilator and, and being in a wheelchair and, and living with a, a rare neuromuscular condition. But it, it gives me great hope to see all the stakeholders in a room thinking about and talking about these, um, these topics and thinking about it all from the benefit of how can we advance medicine and science and do it in a way that we can prove that medicines are safe and effective. I think if, if you step back and think about the traditional role of patients in the drug development process, it typically was that they come in at the very end stages. They would be there at the advisory committee or after a decision maybe was made by regulators that patients um, disagreed with as a community, they would become very vocal or as, as those decisions were, were well underway in, in the evaluation process from a regulatory perspective. I think if you go back 30 years and look at what was happening in the world of HIV and AIDS, and we all know the history of where it was in the late 1980s, and you see the, the vocal activism of the HIV community, and they were quite active, and you know that first molecule that, that the agency considered was AZT, a horribly toxic molecule, that was not particularly effective, um, but weighed in a risk-benefit assessment from people living with HIV, they had to really understand, um, they, the broad community, what the options were. And I think, in his, looking back now, historically, we see that that was the right decision to advance that medicine that led to a cascade, again, uh, a medicine that led to a cascade of new medicines being developed that ultimately led to combinations of medicines that we can now thankfully effectively treat HIV as a long-term chronic managed condition. Um, that evolution of the benefit risk assessment hit a wall in the early 2000s with Vioxx, and the pendulum swung back toward an incredible focus on risk, understanding risk and safety. And what I've seen in the last um, handful of years is really after PDUFA 5, particularly after the 21st century cures, is a focus now back on um, not a lowering of a regulatory standard. And I can tell you from a developer standpoint and from a patient perspective, you, we do not want the lowering of a regulatory standard. What we need, though, is customization. And to think about the benefit risk assessment for each molecule in each disease individually. Uh, I'll talk just briefly about, you know, what do we do in, in our company to try to operationalize building in a benefit risk assessment mindset in everything we do and to bring in that patient perspective. We, uh, even in, in founding our company, we chose the name Amicus, the Latin name friend, because we wanted from the outside, while we were go always going to be driven by state-of-the-art science and technology and medicine and data, we wanted to infuse in the company a culture where we would be the most patient-focused company in all of, of drug development. So we chose the Latin name Amicus for friend. Uh, we have a chief patient advocate, a C-suite level officer, Jane Gershkowitz, who reports directly to me. And we now have 15 people in our patient advocacy group, uh, and they serve as the conscience of the company. And, but what I ask all of our 600 employees to do is to think about in every decision they make, um, if you had this disease, whatever it may be, or you were the mother or father of a child with this disease, what decision would you make? And what it forces everybody in our company to do, and with all the stakeholders we engage with, is to think about every decision, whether you start a study, whether you stop a program, whether you acquire a program, 
what endpoints you look at, how long is the study, what risks are we willing to tolerate in the clinic. If you bring that mindset of a patient, you will make better decisions. And it does not mean that you're going to, if people think sometimes patients, you know, are desperate or uninformed in some cases and susceptible to what they read on the internet or influence from sponsors or developers. <clears throat> I see that much, much less so now. And what I actually see is patients being a vital source of making our programs better and really being the arbiters together with us of deciding, um, these, making these very tough choices. We think about it when we do this in drug development, we think about the unmet need. Patients will help us define the unmet need. And it's not just simply, you know, it, how bad is the disease and is there a medicine? I think it's a very naive view. I think more and more as we develop first generation medicines, we have to think about second generation approaches and what risks are we willing to tolerate? What are the benefits? What, what is clinically meaningful for somebody living with this disease to look at subpopulations? Um, men, women, children, whatever it may be, different uh, genotypes and disorders. So defining the unmet need, um, really digging down into what do patients struggle with? And then really what it comes down to is, is operationalizing this flexibility, operationalizing a benefit risk mindset in the drug development process through largely the modernization of clinical studies. So how do we think about novel use of biostatistics? What's the proper use of natural history studies? What endpoints are important in a study? How many studies could or should we do? Um, how many patients can we enroll in our studies? I'll, uh, I'll share with you this, this very short vignette. When we were designing a study for a, a new enzyme replacement therapy for, for Pompeii disease and other medicine, uh, we went into the clinic in, in April of 2016, treated the first patient. But um, uh, more than a year before that, we were developing clinical protocols and ideas. Our team developed it internally, and, and they were very good and quite robust, looking at a lot of different endpoints. But before we even took it to a medical advisory board that we have, we took it to a patient advisory board. So we have patient advisory boards for every single disease we work in even preclinical programs. And with those, what we did, we took it to a patient advisory board, and there were 15 members of our board. And since she had just turned 18, my daughter Megan was, was on that board. She had asked, not me, she asked our chief patient advocate, can she participate? And she had been on a, a, a medicine and enzyme replacement therapy since 2003 that it had saved her life. And we talked about six-minute walk and forced vital capacity and, and many, many mu deep muscle biopsies to look at glycogen clearance. And patients had really strong views. They said, okay, we get six-minute walk test, but really understanding the strength of our gait. You know, what does it translate to? Can we go out in the rain without the fear of falling? And I'll never forget the, the microphone came around to my daughter. Again, was just 18, was a senior in high school. And, uh, and she said very quietly, um, she said, there are two things that would be really meaningful for me as somebody living with Pompeii disease. She said, um, first, if I can just breathe off my ventilator for one minute. Because we were just thinking about how can we wean people from ventilators forever. But she knows that's the risk that she lives with that could end her life. And the second thing she said really struck us. She said, and if a medicine could help me to speak more strongly and a little more clearly, so that when I go to college, I can make more friends. And that, you know, as a drug developer, those are the things that really strike you. Um, so that's why we build it in. We build in the patient perspective. We build in this benefit risk assessment in every decision we make. It's not just at the end of the day a binary outcome for regulators. Do the benefits of a drug's data outweigh its risks? Um, and ultimately, it will make for much better and faster programs. Uh, just a footnote to that, I do have to leave early today, Mark, uh, yeah. to fly to South Bend, Indiana. Yeah. Uh, my daughter is a senior at Notre Dame and graduates this weekend. So we're very proud. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> and then, uh, and also, John, let me know, going on to uh, graduate school at, uh, at UNC. She is. She's going to, uh, Megan wants to be a social worker. Yeah. So she is moving to chat from the, the coldness of South Bend <laughs> to the warmth of 
Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Yeah. So at a Duke forum, this is pretty brave for us That's to be right. up here. <laughs> That's right. Megan, uh, Megan told me, Mark, she said, uh, coming from Notre Dame, she will always bleed blue and gold. Uh, but going to Chapel Hill, the blue just got a little bit lighter. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, all right, thank you very much, John uh, Bray. Hi, uh, Bray Patrick Lake. So my comments will be framed, I think, in uh, just a handful of words, engage early, often, and always. So we've heard today we have made really tremendous progress, and I, I do think um, being on the front lines of this with FDA, I've really been excited to see how this has grown. But um, I work at the Duke Clinical Research Institute, and we are um, the world's la largest uh, academic research organization, and I lead a group that facilitates patient engagement with our sponsors and investigators to co-design our trials and research programs, and I will still say it is the exception and not the norm. We do not see early engagement frequently enough. What we see is trials um, that are almost fully designed, and now they're thinking about how do we recruit these studies. We also see um, endpoints where sponsors are um, under the impression that these are hard clinical endpoints. They've been in the field forever, and there's nothing we can do about it because FDA only wants these, and that's absolutely not true. Um, even the work in the clinical outcomes assessment group, I mean, we're seeing this broadly across FDA of working with stakeholders to really better understand and measure what's most important to patients. I'll give you a, a quick example, um, heart failure. We would say that space has multiple therapeutics. Um, people have been living with this disease uh, many years. There are um, millions of patients actually living with heart failure. And um, we did a project recently where when you actually start with a blank slate and let patients say what they think is most important when we were trying to measure their function, which we think of mobility in the six-minute walk test, they said, well, my function is most directly impacted by sleep. Guess what we're not measuring at all? Sleep. Um, so we really do need to back up. I think some of the frameworks that have been presented um, give us some good groundwork. Connie, the stuff you shared from Novartis and... Um, and prefer, I really am a fan of. But when we get to that proof of concept, and even when you start thinking about the social listening um, and your investigations that you want to begin with, we need to have patient advisors in the room. You need to start with, I mean, how do you even know, you know what meta tags you're, you're seeking? You might be searching entirely the wrong thing and cutting off things that are absolutely of importance if you don't start with that early engagement. Um, so trial designs, again, I think with um, patient perceptions around benefits and risks, this is incredibly important, even when we're thinking about, you know, will patients participate in this study? Um, a lot of times, as I've expressed, we just don't see that opportunity, and, and what I, for patients to actually be involved at the design phase. And where I think I'm still struggling as a patient is that we have to still be invited to the dance. Um, we do have some of the more well-formed, well-capitalized groups that are able to do their own externally-led patient-focused drug development um, meetings, but these take time, they take resources, they take capacity, and we really have to get to the more systematic integration of patient perspective, and I think at, even at FDA, as this is um, really being infused across all the different divisions, we're going to have to have the FDA staff proactively asking, you know, did you engage and are you bringing patients to this meeting? Because a lot of times the pre-IND work and the pre-submission work has been done and sponsors didn't invite patients to the, to the party, and so we've really lost those opportunities. So um, I, hopefully we'll have a little time for panel discussion, yeah. but just really back this up in your companies. You've got to go back and really talk to... Um, your, your companies and even the structure of how we engage early. And then the last thing I will say is your patient groups that are existing are your guides and they are your interpreters. And so we should be using them and bringing their voice and expertise in at every turn if we really want to understand the benefits and risks um, that are most important to patients and the specific patient subgroups. Thank you. Uh, and next is Brett. Come up for slides. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, before I, I begin, I wanted Bray said uh, something about sleep and heart failure, and we just had one of those aha moments not that long ago in Parkinson's disease, um, where we were doing a project with CDRH, and we actually talked to patients. And it turns out that Parkinson's pain turned out to be a really huge, important endpoint for patients that is never measured. Um, just another example of why, in fact, it's so important to do that. And I was reminded of that when Bray um, 
uh, was making her remarks. Um, so I want to focus a little bit on patient preferences and where they may fit in. Um, and in fact, the discussion guide for today's meeting lays this out very nicely. So my job putting these slides together was actually really easy. Um, so there is a working definition of patient preferences in the CDRH guidance uh, on patient preference information that tends to be pretty robust, as I have seen, and can be applied uh, kind of throughout. Um, but when we talk about patient preference information, you know, I, I like to think of it in, in three types of information. What matters? That would be, hey, sleep matters to those patients with heart failure. Uh, how much does it matter? And then the trade-offs. And some of the taxonomy that we've seen emerging is that the first two we often refer to as priorities, leaving the second where we talk about trade-offs to be preferences. Uh, and and that, that kind of works for me. I like that. But, the, um, but each of these three types of information can show up in any of the characteristics or in any of the sections of the, the benefit-risk framework. Um, so about a year and a half ago, I think it was the last time I was in this building, um, there was a, an FDA workshop on patient preferences, and it actually took up this whole space, was pretty packed that day. Um, and Annie Saha from CDRH presented this table. Um, and in fact, there are multiple potential uses that have already been identified for uses of patient preference information throughout product development and throughout the medical uh, product life cycle. And that's something that um, uh, IMI Prefer is working on as well, what these things are and when they can be used and what they can inform. Um, so what I wanted to do was just sort of lay out where these things fit in. And as I mentioned, it's all in the discussion guide. This was actually a very easy task for me to actually uh, put this together. Um, so patient input on disease burden and I'll give a few uh, descriptions of the type of questions that patient preference can be used to inform that. Um, and uh, current treatment options, what is the unmet medical need? The patient perspective on benefit, again, what matters? What can you impact? But also, how much is it, what's a clinically meaningful magnitude of impact? And then the patient perspective on risk, which we often talk about in terms of risk tolerance. Um, but also uh, risk comfort is something that we've seen lately, which is, yes, this risk exists, there are some uncertainties about it, but with proper mitigation strategies in place, am I willing to accept that risk if I've sort of got some support around it? And then benefit risk trade-offs, there are a number of examples from CDRH in particular where um, the benefits and the risks the clinical data regarding the benefits and the risks are combined with preference data regarding the trade-offs to help inform or at least bring the patient's view on the benefit-risk balance to the discussion. And then um, there is work being done, and this is the harder one in patient preferences, how does uncertainty affect preferences and what are preferences for different levels of uncertainty? Um, so what I wanted to do here was just to pose some uh, straw man questions as to what types of questions could be answered with patient preference data that could provide evidence as inputs to the benefit risk framework. And I think it's important at this point to make it clear that what I'm really suggesting is not that this is at this point in time a quantitative benefit risk assessment where we're getting weights on each of these elements to come up with a conclusion at the end. That may happen, it may not. But what I'm suggesting here is as we're talking about all of these inputs, there are ways to bring the patient voice in quantitatively. Preferences are one. There are other types of patient experience data that can come in, but I will focus on preference. And in all of these, I've highlighted or bolded on the right-hand side uh, these concepts of willingness, which is really related to trade-offs, and importance, which are two of the types of information that you can get from patient preference studies. Um, and the hardest part, I guess, in my career, I've kind of worked backwards. I started with what are the benefit-risk trade-offs overall, and what does that tell us about a product in particular, and then kind of worked back to, okay, let's look at individual benefits and individual risks, and then as things have progressed, we've started to look at, oh, we can learn from patients. Um, 
what is the importance of reducing specific impacts? You know, is, is this something that is out there that isn't being addressed? What is the current burden that isn't being addressed? And it's related to the unmet need. Um, not only is it what is the disease burden that's not being addressed, are there any options to actually address it? And what we found recently is for some people, yes, and maybe for some people, no. So can we identify what's not being addressed and for whom it's not being addressed? Um, for me, this is sort of the obvious place for uh, patient preferences is, you know, what is the clinical meaningfulness of a benefit? Does it matter? How much? What am I willing to give up to get it? And then the same thing on risk when we talk about not only um, the willingness to accept risk, but what is the level of tolerance given a certain benefit that we see? And it was mentioned earlier that risk management programs need to be developed in, in, um, by taking the benefits into account because the risks, in one sense, are the cost for getting the benefit and what is that worth to patients. And then finally, um, the benefit risk trade-offs and the importance of the unresolved uncertainties, what levels of uncertainty are people willing to accept? What is the benefit risk trade off or benefit risk balance? So these are areas where patient preferences can help us figure that out. Um, so I think as the guidance uh, or as the discussion document laid, lays out, there are lots of opportunities to get patient preferences systematically into a benefit risk framework. There are many examples of all of these types of studies in the literature now, which maybe five years ago we couldn't say was true. Um, the key will be determined is to determine what information is most useful in the decision. That in my mind is still the biggest unknown. And I don't know that anybody knows it, but what is the information that actually helps? Because we could throw lots of information at it and as a preference researcher, I can develop any study you want um, because I see this, you know, I'm like a kid with a hammer, but the reality is what is What's the need? What is the information that brings the patient perspective in that actually helps in framing the issue and making the decision? Um, and then another bigger question, which is being partially addressed in some of the um, patient experience data guidance documents, is what are the standards that we'll use to evaluate the quality of this evidence? And that is something that, that FDA, I know, is putting a lot of work into with the, the, the guidance documents that are being developed under 21st century cures. So with that, I will yield my zero time left. All right, thanks to all of you for an, uh, an excellent uh, opening to this uh, panel. Um, let me first ask Jim, any, uh, um, any things that you heard that you'd particularly like to react to or, or, or highlight? Um, well, I, th I think that the... Um, you know, I completely agree that, that I think that the common thread that's running through many of the comments is, is the early engagement. Yeah. Um, and, and whether that is coming from uh, incorporating the patient perspective early on, but even, even more broadly than that is thinking about benefit and risk early in development. And so um, uh, I think that, you know, perhaps it'll, it'll come up in some of the further discussion, but I think that there are clearly touch points um, where uh, FDA can engage about benefit and risk discussions far earlier than when an NDA is being reviewed and an action is being yeah. taken. Um, so hopefully that'll come Yeah, up. actually that's uh, right where I'd like to, to pick up in kicking off this discussion. It sounds like where we're headed is, is um, really these two things going on at the same time. On the one hand is the, the drug or product development process, and the other hand is the benefit risk assessment uh, uh, development, uh, going back to Bray's point, uh, um, since uh, the benefit risk is a, is a good way to get patients engaged early and often before uh, the, the, the clinical studies are, are finalized. Um, I would like to ask you all if you have any more, if we can kind of build a little more clarity around practical steps for, for Bray's point about engage uh, early, often, uh, always. So what is the best thing to do when in these um, um, what sound like will be uh, parallel, um, hopefully, uh, um, uh, processes that, that um, inform each other. So in the course of 
the drug development, you're going to make decisions about dose exploration, trial design, endpoint selection, very important um, uh, for, for patient input, uh, input on, uh, on, on many of those. And at the same time, uh, the, the benefit risk assessment should be taking shape. So um, maybe some, uh, I don't know if any of you want to start, Bray, maybe I'll look to you first, but would appreciate any other comments about how to, how to what are the practical steps to make those work well together with the goal of, uh, of a patient focus? I think even when you're thinking about the target population, like that needs to be, you have, need to have patient engagement around that, even confirmatory and, and thinking about, is this the population? What would the inclusion exclusion criteria look like? would this subgroup of patients or this group of patients be willing to accept the perceived benefits and potential risks and uncertainties? And um, again, I just see that we chronically miss that early opportunity. Yeah. Uh, other comments? Yeah. Yeah, maybe one comment from my side. I think what we have observed is that in the past, the benefit risk assessment and thinking about the benefit risk assessment came quite late because that yeah. was part of the clinical overview and the submission preparation. And I think what we, uh, what we hear now is the early engagement requires that we have this picture of benefit risk assessment really early in mind, and that drives actually the activities we do. Um, and that would then allow to, um, to consider the patient perspective early. I mean, if you all understand that these preference studies can help us also to identify really patient relevant endpoints and consider these then later maybe as a key benefit or a key risk in our, in our benefit risk assessment, uh, then I, I think that helps really teams driving into uh, this earlier thinking. Yeah. First, Mark, I like the way you ask the question. The, the whole drug development process and the benefit risk. If we all open our discussion document, the figure two is very telling to me. Is that figure really lay out very clearly that overall process, but then you map the benefit framework on that process. Yeah. It's very enlightening. Just thinking about, try to develop that framework early on. What are the condition? What are the options? You know at the very early on, even in the discovery stage, you know the mechanism for action. So in the way, it can tell you the potential efficacy. But then you start, even in the preclinical stage, the toxicity evaluations. So in some way, you are already shaping that benefit-risk framework. But then take that as a continuum, move that on. What are the gaps you try to fill? So I think that's a really good way. I really like that figure. It's a good way to think about not only the overall process, but map the benefit risk framework on top of that process. Yeah. John? Maybe, Mark, just some practical lessons that we've had in, in engaging patients in the drug development perspective. So I'd mentioned these patient advisory boards that we set up. Um, uh, two things that they are not. One. Uh, we don't go to the patient organizations and say, hey, we're going to make a medicine. We're thinking about a clinical study. Can you pull together some patients for us to talk to? Um, we find that, you know, although you know, we work very closely with all the patient organizations, sometimes there are many organizations, even for a rare disease. Sometimes they have a history um, that, that may not be conducive to newer thinking about newer medicines. Um, the other thing that it's not, it's not ad hoc. What you can't do is to selectively choose a, a handful or two of patients, bring them in for a day or two, describe the study, what you're thinking about, endpoints, duration, and take that in a vacuum. So what we did consciously from day one is to build a patient advisory board that would be a living and continuing entity. So they'd, they'd, they'd continue to accumulate, as we accumulated, institutional knowledge about the drug, their own disease, technologies. So we put them under confidential disclosure. We don't pay them, we, we pay their travel. They come to us twice a year, and we have a one or two day session in every one of our diseases and share with them whatever the topic may be. Uh, and you know, I could tell you when I first brought that up, our board was very reluctant as we were a smaller private company. They said, oh God, it's at the meeting, it's gonna be on Facebook, they're gonna tweet it out. And I have to tell you, in, in the years we've done this, for more than a dozen diseases, we've never once had a breach of confidentiality. They hold that, they hold that trust sacred. Uh, and again, it's made our programs much better, but it's been a, a continued group of people. Now, people come and, and go and, and get added to it, um, but that continuity, I think, is so important. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, um, Brett? Um, just from the patient preference perspective, um, 
you know, it used, things are moving in the right direction, I think. It, it used to be, you know, we only did these kind of studies um, pre-launch, just barely pre-launch. And then they started happening early and we're beginning to see patient preference studies in phase three studies. And we're beginning to see patient preference studies looking at the therapeutic context now, which we didn't see a whole lot of before. So in that sense, systematically getting patient information is happening earlier and earlier. <laughs> Another phenomenon that's occurring that I think is um, helpful is there are a number of things that are being done by consortia pre-competitively now, particularly with regard to therapeutic context and endpoint development. Uh, and, you know, um, just two examples come to mind immediately. One is um, MDIC, the Medical Device Innovation Consortium, uh, which is a public-private partnership with FDA, is doing some essentially pre-competitive work, bringing their members together with FDA to do patient preference studies. And Us Against Alzheimer's has uh, an initiative called AD PACE, which is doing similar things to identify endpoints um, and, and understand the patient perspective on what actually matters in treating the disease. So um, everything's moving in the right direction. Sometimes it feels like it's moving pretty slowly, but at least the trend is earlier and more often, which is, I think, what Bray wanted wants to see. Yeah, yeah and I, I do want to um, recognize, so the Clinical Outcomes Assessment Group has a funding um, uh, announcement mm -hmm. out right now that is this pre-competitive model and the questions that are very specific about stakeholder engagement and you know multi-stakeholder perspective mm -hmm. as far as even understanding what's most important to patients which is again it, it's just really encouraging that we're heading in that direction mm -hmm. and do you feel like those efforts are at least head in the direction of aligning with the benefit risk assessment mm -hmm. framework and input so it seems, sounds like this is all it's on coming a together good trajectory um, mm -hmm. just need to keep uh, refining bills the, 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 the the figure that Bill likes uh, uh, with all of this, uh, yeah, all of these examples of best practices yeah. and, and timing along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I do want to open this up to to uh, comments uh, or questions from those of you who are here. So, uh, anyone here, uh, please um, uh, head to the microphone. And for those of you who are online, remember there's a, uh, a mechanism for uh, submitting uh, questions to uh, FDA.benefitrisk at uh, at Duke. Uh, at Duke.edu. Um, Bob. In finding out what patients value and care about for choosing endpoints and figuring out what to study, I'm curious about what you do with the diverse, the inevitable diversity of opinions. Some people will find this kind of benefit persuasive and worth taking the drug. Others will say, "No, nah, that doesn't matter that much to me." Some people will say, "I can't stand the idea that I'm going to be sleepy all day." Other people will say, "I don't really care about that." In making the ultimate judgment about the benefits and the risks of a drug, those things seem very important. Mm -hmm. I just wondered how you think people should deal with that. So from my perspective, I, I, I agree that it's very important. Um, and I think we come in, most researchers now come in and assume that that diversity exists uh, in preferences. So the first thing is to determine, does it exist and how big is it, and then what does it look like? Is it just all over the map or is it a continuum or is it sort of bimodal where you have people in one camp versus people in another camp? Um, is it specific to a specific risk or a specific type of benefit? Um, that we can do. The hard part is figuring out who's in which group. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where more effort needs to be spent to be able to identify maybe people with prior experience are either more or less averse to a particular risk. Um, it might be based on some other characteristic that we can observe and we can say, ah, oh, yeah, you know, older patients feel differently about it than younger patients about the same thing. Then be able to present that information and say, not only here are the preferences of this population, but here are the subpopulations and the heterogeneity across them. Then the question becomes, you know, how is that useful then? Because it's, it's a matter of, we, we know it exists, can we measure it, can we measure it, and then can we identify to whom it belongs? Well, what about the ultimate decision about whether the drug's benefits outweigh the risks? Suppose they do in 
10% of the population, but the other 90% doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Does that change our decision? I, I have a classic example. Uh, let me throw it out at you. And, and uh, this isn't so much related to preference as to the fact that the effects of drugs differ from one population mm -hmm. to another. There were a lot of discussions of a drug called phlebanserin, which, mm -hmm. which was intended to uh, uh, mitigate sexual dysfunction in, in, uh, in women. Uh, the, when you looked at the average effect of the drug compared to placebo, there was a half an event per month. And many of the people, including internally, said, come on, that's ridiculous. It also made you fall over and stuff like that. There, was, there were downsides. Um, but when you looked at the distribution of results, 10% of the population had one event per week on drug, and nobody on placebo had that, essentially nobody. Mm -hmm. So the advisory committee ultimately thought it should be approved. And those kinds of differences, differences in response, differences in attitude toward it, some people would say, well, even half an event per month is good enough for me. Other people would say, come on, that's ridiculous. How do you factor all that in? Can I say something? So I, I think um, statistical methods are evolving and heterogeneity treatment effect, and I'll throw out the work of David Kent and Issa Dabra, where you know, we want to identify who the responders and super responders are, and we want to be able to identify who's going to receive harm, and then we want to label appropriately. And so maybe this goes to more rational dispersion and how we have to think about which population is this truly indicated for. But we've seen kind of a slow uptake in those methods, in my opinion, um, and I don't know if it has to do with, you know, the segmentation and market segmentation, where it makes it less attractive to actually develop something that may not be an all-comers type of drug. But we're moving into the whole phase of precision health and medicine, and this is what we're, you know, what we're going to have to deal with that reality. Well, sometimes you can tell, and sometimes you just have to right. try it. Have to try it. Yeah. One um, of the tools we, we actually use, we build a, a, effectively a heat map for every medicine we're developing. So lots of data, lots of endpoints, you know, some are primary, secondary, tertiary, whatever they may be, but we lay it out in a heat map. And what we find, if you kind of color it, you know, red and green, it becomes really evident pretty quickly, you know, is the totality of the evidence, is it telling you that this is of benefit? Um, although it's interesting when you get down to segments of populations where medicines may be for particular genotypes. Um, then that becomes a, a decision for us. And for us, it's, it's you know, if it's benefit, e benefiting even a very small segment of the population, and we can define it and label it appropriately so it doesn't get to people for whom it's not a benefit, then for us as, as innovators, it makes sense to take that forward. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to um, maybe just a follow up on this to go back to a question that Jim, or a point that Jim made. I think I may be paraphrasing here, but. Um, or I am paraphrasing, but I think hopefully I'm getting it right. Uh, you talked about patient versus population level benefit risk and that maybe mm -hmm. we're headed in the direction mm -hmm. of more individual patient groups. And uh, maybe you could expand on that in, in light of this discussion. Uh, also, would like to hear if, if anyone else on the panel has to, to pick up on these last points. We are getting the area of precision medicine, so it is getting uh, easier to identify lots of different subgroups of patients you can predict are going to have different responses and based on their preferences going in, you know, know that they might like a drug or have a, or, or not like a drug based on, uh, on, on benefit risk. But there's also the other group that, that, that Bob described, which is, you know, you, you, you maybe you can't identify the, the responders or the super responders based on prior data. So uh, this does seem like it's adding to the yeah. complexity of benefit risk and any tips mm -hmm. about how to practically uh, incorporate that mm -hmm. and going from where we are to where we'd like to be. Jim, do you want to start? Well, yeah, just to expand a little bit on, on that comment that I made, um, you know, I think that there are, there are some situations, uh, well, often um, uh, one will look at, like, you know, Dr. Temple was referring to, the, uh, you know, the average effect of a drug on the benefit side um, among the population, and, and, you know, we're looking at estimates of the incidence of various adverse events on the risk side. Um, at a at a population level, and and that's that's fairly typical, um, and uh, you know there are some areas where I I would think that that it's really not possible to do anything other than that. Um, Bob or Ellis might correct me if I'm totally wrong because I'm outside my therapeutic area here, but um, you know an antiplatelet drug uh, reducing the risk of cardiovascular events, uh, to my knowledge, you know folks are not 
following anything at the individual patient level. And so if a patient starts taking an antiplatelet drug and they have an MI or they don't have an MI, they have no idea what their course would have been had they not taken the drug, right? Like we just know that at the population level, we're probably on average reducing you know, MIs by X amount and this is your trade-offs with bleeds or whatever at the population level. Um, but I think that there are situations, um, and the reason I said we need to be careful, uh, I'll explain in one second, but there are situations where I think a patient can truly tell that they are having an effect of a drug. And, and, um, and in those cases, uh, they, they know their experience on drug, um, and they, uh, they might not know exactly what risks they will face, but they can at least describe the population risks, and they can make an individual decision, either the, the provider or the patient, um, about that particular patient is, okay, you know what this drug is doing for you. Is it worth it to you to stay on? And that, to me, is a different scenario. The reason I say that we need to be comfortable is we have plenty of examples of drugs where if you only looked at the treatment arm like we had no control group, it could look like these drugs are working, right? Um, an antidepressant might be a classic example where we often have a, a, quite a dramatic effect even in the placebo arm. And so sometimes a patient might not know what their experience would have been had they not taken this drug. And we have lots of examples of that. If every patient truly could tell whether they were a responder or not, would we ever really need controlled trials, right? So, um, uh, so anyway, um, I, I guess I just wanted to, to bring that concept in a little bit, that I think that we, we can't be so simplistic in thinking that, you know, we always approach benefit risk from one standpoint, a patient level or population level. It's more nuanced than that, but I think we need to kind of think about the framework for, for both. Um, and perhaps more sophisticated methods, uh, you know, will get smarter about whether or not patients are truly responding to their, their drug or not, and that will help us in this regard. Yeah, Bill. Uh, just a quick uh, response to Bob, your question. I think we need to separate the design stage versus the analysis stage. I think at the in design stage, if based on the, you know, the structured input, like what John mentioned, we got different opinion, diverse opinion. That probably tell us a lot about patient segmentations in terms of how you design the trial, how you design your target populations. Now in the analysis stage, I think it, it's, I feel a lot of time we talk about patient analysis at group level, but I think it's the area of analyze the patient preference data at the patient level, we need more methodology. Mm -hmm. That's the area I think need a lot more methodologies. That's right now, there's there, there something out there. I think in the afternoon we may get to that. But that's the area I think a lot of work needs to be done. Good. Thank you. Bennett Levitan from Janssen R&D. So Jim, your, your point at the end was very close to what I wanted to, uh, some of the thoughts I had on your, your point, Bob. Um, if I am, know that patients can self-identify their preferences, say with a shared decision-making tool and point, point of care, it changes the way I would do a population-level decision. It's almost as if I knew, that if I knew a demographic variable or diagnostic variable that would partition the patients amongst those who responded to the drug or not, I can improve based on that. But if I don't know how to predict them, well, then it's in the hands of God when the patient takes the drug and it may or may not work. But with preferences, I have this advantage. Since it's a self-revealed concept, I could use a tool and have them give me their preferences or have them give them with a physician. If I know as a regulator that that activity can occur, as long as I'm not harming the population in general by putting this treatment on, treatment out, then becomes a shared decision-making or self-revealed preference concept at the hand of the patient. Now, this is not very different from what happens now. Patients and physicians are always talking, do you want this treatment? These are the side effects. But we can push it a bit further with individual preference assessment techniques at the patient level. And the question I would ask as a regulator is, can I trust that method? Can I trust that shared decision-making tool to really assess what's in the patient's head so that by giving this drug, putting this drug on the market, I'm allowing the patient an opportunity to do what, what they really value. So that's one way, or one piece of the answer. Any uh, comments on that? 
Are we headed towards uh, shared decision making being part of the labels if we're really following through on this uh, benefit at risk assessment uh, framework? In, in a way, I don't know if that's where we're headed, but I think it's, in a, reason, it's a reasonable approach because um, when, when Bray was speaking, it occurred to me, you know, as we get closer to the individual, from, go from the population down to the individual, we really do start getting close to that shared decision making where it's a one on one for that patient as an individual and typically it's the healthcare provider right. of some sort that is actually engaging in that so you know if the evidence is at the group level and we know what certain partitions look like whether it's on the clinical data or in preference data ultimately that dialogue needs to happen and if there is significant heterogeneity i don't know whether that's something that goes in the label or not but that's how you direct it to where it should go so as as we're getting we're getting down more and more to the individual it gets down more to shared decision making in fact right and with predictive analytics and this is i recognize medical devices is off but the ai um ai enabled clinical decision support should be based on data sets that are reflective of the U.S. population. And again, for the patient, based on my personal characteristics, what can I expect my outcomes to be? Is that, that informs every decision we're making uh, with our physicians. And so I think that's where we're headed, whether we're ready for that or not. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Teresa. So I, I liked, uh, Brett started out with giving that uh, kind of distinguishing attributes, importance, trade-offs. And, and I, I think that, to, to me, the language is very important uh, when, when we talk about trying to engage the patients. I, we thoroughly agree with what Bray was saying about encourage, involving the patients early, early and often. And, and, and to us, that means don't come in with a closed mind and with your attributes and importance already decided so you can move right into trade-offs. So the word preference, to me, we use that very selectively at FDA. We're trying to make distinction between preference studies where we're really talking about trade-offs, you know, kind of studies where you're getting into trade-offs, and yeah. other kinds, the many other places and approaches and opportunities to make sure you're listening to patients and, and not uh, kind of missing that very critical first step, which is what we learned in those patient-focused meetings, that, hey, just open-ended questions about what matters, elicit things. You learn a lot there that you may not have known, as you were saying. So I think uh, we're going to try to be careful to not have everybody think this just isn't a shoot that takes you right to, benef to, pre mm. to preference studies uh, as in mm -hmm. trade-off studies because there are many other things and also there's uh, the Brett's fantastic we, we don't have enough Brett's in the country anyway to to be doing these studies very well so you also want to take advantage of many other methods that are also more accessible for a lot of yeah. groups and so on and add tremendous value to the product development Can I before you leave the microphone, Teresa, so there's a really innovative guidance for migraine um, where basically the endpoints, so I think headache succession is one of them because that's you know what we're all st uh, striving for, but then the patient could actually select the other endpoint or outcome that was most important to them, whether it be nausea, photophobia, or whatever. Do you, are you familiar? I don't want to put you on the spot, but, but uh, designs like that really allow, so here's what we have to measure, because these are our hard clinical endpoints. Obvious, and yeah, Alice. But, <laughs> but, well, select also what's important to you. Yeah, I mean, so I, I guess I just want to say, we don't want to drive everything, even though this is, you know, you think benefit risk meeting, let's go, kind of suggest go right to trade-offs, at least yeah. for me. But so, but, but that's not, we, we don't mean to do that at all here. We're trying mm -hmm. to do the opposite. We're trying to really start with some of the, great very fundamental things that that, that jim was covering mm -hmm. that that uh where you don't need a preference trade-off study i mean that these are very basic questions so no. i just want to say that that's important for us yep. yeah on, on that point I mean, any uh, we've got a got a little bit of time left but any further comments from the panel mm -hmm. on in terms of getting patient input on more basic issues like this disease burden uh, uh, you're talking about endpoints too um, any other suggestions on how to do that and, and when in this process? Just that it's important? I, I, I guess one thing, this isn't necessarily um, just patient input, although it would certainly contribute, but to get to the, the broader questions, like, um, you know, during development, one often has, like Bill was saying, fairly early on, an idea of what sort of toxicities one might be dealing with, mm -hmm. right? 
And, and uh, if there is a drug that has uh, a substantial toxicity, um, best just to think about, hey, this is something that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, we're going to have a toxicity on the risk side of the equation. Um, and so how can we best describe this drug's benefit? with the greatest amount of certainty with the most clinically impactful endpoint. So instead of trying to run from the toxicity, just embrace it, acknowledge that it exists, and, and, and work on the program in a way to choose endpoints that are going to matter, that patients are going to care about, um, so that at the end of the day when the benefit risk assessment is made, uh, you've already considered that balance in, in the design of the program. Mm -hmm. I think two tools, Mark, that we find increasingly um, useful. Uh, one are the PROs and, and tremendous advancements within the agency at working with us as innovators trying to think about, you know, how, when, and where do we rely on PROs. I was talking at the break with, with Annie, Annie Kennedy, and she talked about in the, in the Duchenne world how um, now payers, because of course ultimately we have to get these medicines to patients and, and to have them reimbursed. Uh, increasingly, payers are, are not interested necessarily in biomarkers, but PROs, what's the outcome? What's clinically meaningful? Yeah. How does it change the day-to-day -day life of somebody living with this disease? Uh, the second is uh, videotaping. We find in clinical studies videotaping uh, a lot of these diseases. You know, six-minute walk test, for instance, while the data isn't critically important, to actually see, does somebody look different? You know, when I talk to my physician friends and colleagues, you know, oftentimes they'll say as they think about whether to prescribe a medicine that's been approved. They're always doing it every day in the risk-benefit assessment, and oftentimes that's evaluating, physically looking at a patient. Are they benefiting from a medicine they prescribe? So it's, it's one element. Thank you. Please. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Ellis Unger. I'm uh, director of the uh, Office of Drug Evaluation One in uh, Office of New Drugs in CEDAR. Um, so two things, a quick uh, response to uh, Bray's uh, comment about the uh, migraine guidance. So um, that's essentially a chief complaint kind of a, an endpoint where the, the, uh, the patient tells, tells you this is what's important to me. We're very interested in that uh, type of, of endpoint for trials, although we, although we talk about it a lot, we, we don't see it very much where patients can come in and say these are my worst symptoms of my heart failure, if you could fix this one or these two symptoms, that would be most important to me. And then their endpoint is kind of customized. Yeah, it would improve study power. It incre increases the signal to noise. And we're very interested in that, but we don't see it. But if a company comes in with that, we'd be, we'd be excited. Um, what I actually came to the microphone to, to say is I, 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 there's a lot of expertise in the audience here, a lot of statisticians, people who do decision analysis for a living, and I'm not in that league. Um, but I do read, write, and edit as many of these benefit-risk frameworks as probably anybody because of my position. Um, so I'm quite familiar with them, and I've <clears throat> been involved in it for a while. I would just like to maybe simplify uh, something. And this follows on to what uh, Dr. Smith said about uh, can a patient recognize, you know, whether they're truly recognized, whether they're. I don't. I I would depart from Jim a little bit on the truly recognize. I divide the world of benefit and risk into symptoms and harms. Okay, so, so there are some drugs that are that are designed to improve symptoms. They don't affect what actually happens to what you know outcome we call it, and there are some risks that are that are basically symptoms, and there are others that are harms. Um, if, the, if the benefit is symptoms and the risk is symptoms, we don't frankly care very much. I mean, a patient with prostatism can tell you whether his stream, his urinary stream is better and whether it's worth it in terms of the trade-off of his dizziness. And so when, you're, when it's symptoms, symptoms versus symptoms, I just don't care very much. You put it in the label, you approve the drug, and patients can make individual decisions about whether they like what they're getting or not. If their sleep is better on a sleeping pill and they don't have drowsiness um, or, you know, the next day, then they like the pill and they take the pill. When there's a harm involved, now we're into a different area. So if that patient with problems with his prostate who's taking the drug uh, that makes him dizzy, if 1% if of the time he falls and has a fracture, 
that's different, right? That's not just a symptom. So I would just, I just w would like to keep the, the world divided into kind of symptoms and harms, both on the benefit side and the risk side, because it, it, can, it can simplify matters quite a bit. Okay, great. Thank you. And if there are any comments on that, um, we've got a, a few minutes left. I did want to get to one question from our uh, online um, group, uh, which is, I think, uh, I appreciate any views on the panel, and then, and then Bob will get to, to you. Um, how do we get payers involved early on in the benefit risk assessments? Uh, can that help make uh, uh, payment decisions more efficient, uh, too? Looks like I struck a nerve over there. <laughs> I, well, I'll start with my depressing perspective that um, even when we invite payers to some of these uh, statistical methods uh, meetings, I, I keep hearing it's all about the law of averages, and, and we just we have to get people more engaged into this um, the benefit risk framework. So I'll just, I don't have any words of wisdom there. Mm -hmm. we, we do bring them in early, Mark. I mentioned your patient yeah. advisory boards. We have another PAB. We have payer advisory boards where before we go in the clinic, we try to think about, you know, a target product profile for a medicine and uh, really get their input to design endpoints. Yeah, so. yeah. We have talked about it, and I, I think there are some synergies there. We've. I, Ray mentioned the focus on averages, and, and there are some alternative approaches to payment that, that are, are less about averages and more about you know, encouraging, targeting the drug to the patients who will benefit. And I know um, uh, some of the work that, that some of you are involved in and, and uh, at Amicus around uh, uh, different kind of payment models that reflect uh, outcomes and impact on, on patients. So, uh, so maybe more to come there too. Yeah, Connie, did you have a? Yeah, I can also just share that we had just, uh, we had uh, just an early scientific advisory meeting with NICE UK for one of our CP COPD preference studies. So that result mm -hmm. has also been published. So I guess, uh, yeah, we experience more and more. And mm -hmm. positive yeah, more, of that, more of that coming too. Bob? I <clears throat> just wanted to make one last pitch for something that's always obsessed me. We tend to, uh, you know, studies are done based on mean results. And that's what we do. We show you, you win if, you, if the mean result changes. Um, that's not as informative as you'd like it to be. What's more informative is the distribution of results. Um, I, I like this cumulative distribution chart, but I'm, I've been assured by everybody that no one can understand those. So the alternative is to show bar graphs that show 20% improvement, 30%, 40%, all of which is, is in our guidance on Section 14 uh, for the labeling, but is rarely used. And I, I think it helps you understand what the real benefits and risks are and what the distribution of them is. So I just want to make a pitch for mm -hmm. doing that more. Yeah, okay. I see a good deal of head nodding. I think that fits with a theme that we've heard a few times, including in this question, uh, same issue about payers, uh, getting away from the, just the average, yeah. Hi, I'm <coughs> Susan Duke, uh, statistician and senior. And um, following on from what Bob just said and from what we've heard throughout this session, we've heard a lot about patient engagement, and I think that's really important but there's other kinds of engagement too. So I have a question for the panel about engagement between the different disciplines. So for instance, engagement between the clinician and the statistician, the pharmacologist, the epidemiologist at the sponsor company, and the same at the agency. How much are we engaging with each other on that specific drug product? Um, to understand how to do this. So, you know, we're talking about this in broad terms, but as Bob just mentioned, if you're thinking about a specific situation for a specific drug, how are you measuring that? And when are you deciding to measure that? If you're deciding to measure that at the time you've already collected all of your data and you're sending it into the agency, we don't do that with the primary efficacy um, endpoint. Isn't the benefit risk really the most important decision we make? So when are we making the decision about what data to collect and how we're going to analyze that? I, I just want to say we actually put patients in the room with all of those people. We don't want, we want everybody together. Yeah. Yeah, Bill? I, I want to uh, 
response to that. Uh, I actually feel to really even just to getting the patient preference right require a multidisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. If you think about patient preference, typically three ways of getting to that. One's a typical anecdotal evidence and getting that through a regular channel. But then there's also a very structured way using the, you know, the, the very formal patient preference method where, for example, our epidemiologist colleague and our economic colleague are so good at it, right? So that, if, you know, require good collaboration between clinician and statistician collaborate with that to learn how do you turn that into your overall drug development program. And this even getting down to the patient uh, reported outcome that clearly require a good understanding how to design the sensitivities, specificities, and how to design that into your late uh, phase, phase three program if that's what you targeted yeah. in your label. Yeah. So it does require the multidisciplinary approach to get the patient preference right. Yeah. Now, I thought this is what Carrie Jo was talking about earlier when she em em emphasized integrated benefit risk yeah. assessment is where uh, this whole effort is, is trying to head. But that's, a, again, it's a lot to put together. And if, uh, if you all have any other practical thoughts about how to bring these perspectives together, I mean, I guess if everybody's working off the same framework and, and eventually the same document, uh, that sort of forces some, uh, uh, some integration. But uh, any other suggestions about how to make this happen? Well, just one comment in terms of integrating the patient view with all the other disciplines that are important for drug development. We, starting a couple of years ago, decided that every FDA, particularly the clinical meetings that we have, any meeting, type A, B, C, pre-NDA, whatever it may be, uh, we bring a patient or a couple of patients, uh, and they provide a perspective, and they have one very important seat, but one seat at the table among many of the people involved on both sides of the table. Uh, and we found that to be actually quite helpful. I think it's a very important question you have raised, Susan. And uh, I think in our case, we are at the level of education and capacity building. I think what uh, Brett said before, it's very important to understand when it really helps, uh, when the patient preference uh, studies help, for what purpose. And at the moment, it's, it's really driven by, by the people who are very passionate and, and want to uh, really gain some expertise in that area. And now we are at the stage where we try to engage on several levels. I mean, on the one level is the clinical trial, uh, the, the, the clinical project teams to gain the understanding of uh, how these, uh, the patient perspective or preference studies can really help them in their product development. But there is also engagement uh, in different parts of the organization. So, for instance, um, one of our main experts at Novartis has driven um, the patient preference studies out of the global <coughs> patient access group, which sits in commercial and not in development. So now we really would like to bring that understanding in both parts because, as we said before, we want to use the patient perspective for decision making, not only by regulators, but also by the HDA bodies and reimbursement agencies. And then the, the third level, which comes to my mind, is uh, engaging with, really, with experts um, because we think uh, we would like to establish really scientific rigor ways uh, so that at the end FDA or regulators in general have enough confidence in the information we have gathered and uh, for their decision making, with, which means we have to have these fit for purpose studies, we have to have a certain quality standard, which also means that our statisticians in development uh, get that knowledge and at least uh, are able to talk with the bread, um, with external experts and understand what methods we use and um, so that we make sure we, we really apply the right standards. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I want to try to get in two more questions. Susan, maybe a uh, hopefully quick one and then one more from our um, uh, web participants too, so please. Thank, thank you, Mark. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify the kind of engagement I was asking the panel about was not patient engagement, but the yeah. engagement between the disciplines and also between the sponsor and the regulatory agency. So in the planning stage, what kinds of things do you think could be done to make it better so that, for instance, the sponsor is getting the information they need from the regulator about what is important to the regulator in terms of 
the regulator making the benefit risk decision, the most important part of our approval decision. Yeah. And then within the sponsor companies, as well as within the agency, what kinds of um, both process and conversations need to happen so that the people who have the different disciplinary knowledge are working together to affect that. Uh, great comment. And if uh, qu quickly on this, as I, and it's, it's a, a great framing for further input to uh, FDA in the, uh, as this process goes forward. But uh, Bill, maybe quickly, and then one more thing I want to get to. Yeah. But thank you, Suzanne. This is very thought pro provoking. I still love my figure, too. <laughs> that figure, too, if you think about that and lay the BRF, benefit risk framework, on top, on top of that, that does allow you to have a really good structured, clarified discussion. What are the disease? What are the options? What we know at this point on the benefit, how to quantify. All the discipline get to the same table and try to be on the same page. What are the risks? What are the potential risk mitigation? This tool can be very useful for interdiscipline discussion, not only within sponsor, within agency, but across the regulator and the, the sponsors. So the, the one question, one more question uh, from uh, our, our web participants uh, relates to um, imperfections uh, in uh, both, uh, obviously there's imperfections in scientific data that comes in, but um, we are not perfect in getting patient input for these processes either. Uh, there are efforts to uh, try to bring that in with more uh, rigor and um, uh, uh, based on experience and, and hopefully developing expertise. Um, any comments about tolerance for um, imperfection in, in the patient input data, uh, just as there's some tolerance for imperfection in other types of uh, uh, data that goes into the, the, the development process? So I, I think the one of the mantra is, is transparency. Um, there's imperfections and limitations in everything, and they should be right out there. Um, and that, that goes for any type of patient input data. And any, you know, it's not just assumptions. It's how, you know, how confident am I in this? Or, geez, you know, we had to pull this in quickly. Just, you know, okay fine, just be upfront about it. It's, I think that level of transparency, um, you know, this is, I'm not thinking of this in terms of statistical modeling and looking at sensitivity analysis. It goes down to how confident are we in the data and, you know, don't sugarcoat it, just yeah. transparency. All right, yeah. great. Great. A uh, nice point to end on. I'd like to thank our panel for uh, an excellent discussion about uh, all of these pre-market uh, issues. Thank you. All right, so uh, we are taking a break till 1 o'clock for lunch. Uh, please enjoy the, the lunch and uh, pretty good weather uh, outside today, too. Uh, when we come back, uh, we'll turn to um, communication of risk benefit and uh, risk benefit assessments and to uh, post-market issues as well. Okay, once again, uh, welcome back uh, to our afternoon sessions. In this next session, we're going to focus in part on the effective presentation and communication of benefit risk information between sponsors and the FDA, including communication of this information at advisory committee meetings. We'll also discuss the utility of the benefit risk framework as a communication tool for the agency. And we talked about that this morning, a communication tool for the agency with, uh, with outside groups and also to some extent uh, maybe a communication tool uh, uh, within the agency uh, with this uh, um, emphasis on integration uh, that we talked about uh, earlier. Um, we're going to hear more on these topics first from Rick uh, Forshe, he's the Associate Director for Research for the Office of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at FDA and Ellis Unger, who's the director of the Office of Drug Evaluation One in the Office of New Drugs at FDA. Uh, after uh, these opening presentations, we're going to move on to reactant remarks and some moderated discussion and to uh, comments and questions from uh, all of you who are, who are with us today, uh, uh, kind of like we did this morning. But uh, right now, we're going to start off with, uh, with Rich and Ellis. So Rich. Okay, that's all right. 
<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you all had a nice lunch. Uh, I, again, I'm Rich Forshee, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the perspectives from the Center for Biologics Evaluation and uh, Research. Um, I'll just go ahead and uh, talk off the cuff. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that I wanted to discuss um, was how some of the therapeutic context is a little bit different in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research compared to the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And there's a couple of examples that I want to mention. The first has to do with issues involving um, blood safety and having a secure supply of blood for the people who need it. Um, one of the examples that we dealt with about uh, 18 months ago or so um, was the outbreak of uh, Zika in Puerto Rico. Uh, was the outbreak of Zika in Puerto Rico. This raised a particular issue for blood safety because many of the people who have a Zika infection uh, are asymptomatic. They feel fine. They don't even know that they're sick. And so that means they can show up to donate blood and none of the screening questions are going to prevent them from donating. Where this becomes a real problem is the recipients of blood uh, may already be sick, and we were also especially concerned that uh, some of the people who received the blood might be pregnant women, and Zika was known to have a risk of microcephaly uh, for uh, women, uh, for the children of women who became infected with Zika. So that was an area of concern that we had, and we did a risk assessment to help evaluate how screening of the blood <coughs> supply uh, would protect, uh, would reduce that risk. Another area that we have to deal with on the blood supply is the criteria for people to donate blood. There's been a particularly controversial question about uh, deferral requirements for men who have had sex with men. Uh, since the 1970s, we've had an we had an indefinite deferral in place uh, because of the higher risk of HIV among men who have had sex with men. Uh, recently, that was changed to a one-year deferral for men who have had sex with men, which allowed many people uh, to, uh, who had previously been deferred to come back into, uh, the, uh, uh, come back into the blood donor uh, supply. So the last thing that I'm, uh, let me just mention one other context uh, issue, and that has to do um, with uh, the risk that we allow for seasonal flu vaccines. Uh, seasonal flu vaccines are administered to hundreds of millions of people, people who are healthy, and they are administered to, present, uh, to reduce the risk of uh, flu later in the year. Therefore, we have a very low tolerance for any risk, even a risk uh, that might be one in 100,000 or one in a million is something we'd want to carefully consider in that area. On to the topic of communication, I'm now going to give an example of how we used a quantitative benefit risk assessment to communicate to our advisory committee about a difficult uh, review question that we had about using, uh, using a home use HIV test kit. The issue was that we knew that untrained users were going to have a lower sensitivity and specificity using the test. And the question was, how much lower can that be than when professionals are using it to still have a net public health uh, balance? So uh, we were using the model to look at uh, the uh, OraQuick Home Use HIV Test Kit. We think that the model helped us integrate a lot of different sources of data in order to understand what the ultimate public health benefits and risks would be. One of the points that we made specifically going into the meeting was that uh, we were looking at very different kinds of benefits and risks, and we weren't comfortable putting numeric values uh, on the relative importance of those risks. So we presented it to the committee, and it was up to the committee to use their expertise and judgment to uh, figure out what the relative balance was going to be. So these are a few of the um, visual tools that we use to help communicate about this uh, issue. This is just a simple value tree that is designed to help people clearly see what we're considering and, as importantly, what we're not considering in the, uh, in the analysis. So we grouped uh, our uh, key outcomes into benefits. Probably the most important benefit was transfusions averted. If people find out earlier about that they're HIV positive, uh, they can get uh, into uh, uh, treatment programs, and their uh, risk of trans uh, transmitting the infection to any others is dramatically reduced. 
There's also an advantage to someone learning their status, whether that's true positive or true negative. Among the risks, uh, getting the wrong result is uh, something that we don't want to see. Uh, in particular, getting a false negative uh, could be uh, a serious concern. There was also an issue that uh, because these weren't trained users, there were going to be some failed tests. The test would get knocked over. For some other reason, the test might fail. This is not a huge risk, but again, it's something that we did want to consider. And finally, we wanted to consider uh, how people switching from professional testing to home use testing might affect, the, uh, might affect the overall public health balance. So those were the issues that we looked at. Another thing that was very useful about the whole exercise, and to, um, uh, to Mark's point earlier, this was also incredibly useful internally. We were able to build um, an influence diagram or flow chart showing how the different pieces of information uh, fit together. And this is just a piece from that overall flow chart uh, showing how we would begin with an estimate of how many HIV positive people who haven't been tested in the past year, which is the target for this particular test, an estimate of how many people fell into that category. We would then uh, estimate the percent of people who would use the test. Uh, then we would estimate how many of those tests would fail, and finally look at the sensitivity of the test to predict the uh, true positives and false negatives that would result from this branch of the tree. It was also very useful for showing the likely distribution of results that, uh, that we would see. And there are actually four different curves that are included on this graph. This graph was a sensitivity analysis to explore how switching from the professional test to the home use test would affect the uh, number of uh, net HIV transmissions that were averted. And the important thing to take away from this is that uh, no matter how many people were switching in our model, even if everyone switched to the home use HIV test kit, there would still be a net uh, public health value in terms of the number of HIV transmissions that would be averted. Finally, using this quantitative model allowed us to do an importance analysis where we were trying to assess which of the uncertain inputs was having the biggest effect on our estimates of the net transmissions averted. So without getting into all of the technical details, with the importance analysis, you uh, keep all of the other uh, parameters in the model at your baseline distribution, and then you systematically look at each input one at a time and say what would happen if this was consistently at the lowest end of our estimate versus consistently at the highest end of our estimate. And this allows you to see how, uh, if you were wrong in your assumptions about one of these variables, how much of an impact would it have. And this clearly showed in our analysis that the percent of the uh, men having sex with men who would use the test, which was something we didn't know at the time of the submission, that was going to have the biggest effect on the net number of transmissions averted. But again, even at the low end of the estimate, we were still predicting that a large number of uh, HIV transmissions would be averted by having this, uh, this test on the market. While we're on this slide, I want to mention um, one other point that my colleague Hong Yang brought up over, over lunch, and that is that for a lot of the decisions that we need to make, some of the public health implications don't rely just on the data from the phase three clinical trials, but they rely on data about the public health context in which the product is going to be used. And so in this case, we were able to incorporate some of those issues, such as how many people might be using the test and uh, what's the chance of, uh, of averting an HIV transmission by having someone learn their status early into our overall analysis of the public health, uh, public health benefits. Uh, there were a lot of people involved in this uh, project. As I mentioned, Hong was part of it. Ariana Simonetti, uh, who I believe is also attending today, was also a key part of the project that, uh, that I just described. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to Ellis for the second half of this uh, segment. Thanks, thanks very much, Rich, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to come here and speak. So with lunch, 
there were carbohydrates, and some of you may have loaded up on those carbs. And um, conveniently, and you know that the risk of that is they're so prorific and they can put you to sleep. So there are conveniently about 100 people in the room here. So at the end of my talk, I'm going to compute the number needed to feed in order to put one person to sleep. <clears throat> there are a few people out there I see already are high risk. OK. Uh, here we go. Um, I have to say, um, it was many years ago, I don't know, eight years ago when we first at FDA were commanded to, about eight years, to, to develop these benefit risk uh, frameworks. And I was asked, and along with a number of other people, to, to help develop them. And I thought, well, this is central to what we do. Uh, we can have this knocked out in about four months and be no sweat, no problem. And boy, was I wrong, because now all these years later, we still really, well, there are, there are opportunities for improvement, let's, let's put it like that. And I intend to, to talk about uh, a few of those. One of the things I, I would point out, though, before I start, is I, I, this morning I mentioned the, the fact that one can divide the world of benefits and risks into symptoms and, and harms. Um, the, the benefit portion of the benefit risk framework serves two general purposes. One, I think, is, is there substantial evidence of effectiveness? which is kind of the regulatory part of it. And the other part of it is what is the benefit? Um, and they're very different. And we see from companies and from our own staff emphasis on kind of one of those or the other. But in fact, they're both really important um, to, the, to the statement of benefit. So I just wanted to leave with that. The, the areas where I plan to talk are <clears throat> about absolute versus relative effects and also uh, talking about scales, putting them into perspective, uh, responder analyses, uh, histograms, and forest plots. <laughs> OK. Um, for benefits, it's critically important to put them into perspective. And what I find many times where companies don't succeed and where our own staff don't succeed is, is doing this. What, what is the actual benefit? Uh, how would you explain the benefit to a patient or a, a, a provider? Uh, healthcare provider with when they were deciding whether or not to use a drug. Really critical. And then for the risks, they also need to be clear and quantitatively expressed if possible. Uh, what are the probabilities of the risks? What is the severity of the risk? Can they be mitigated? Can they be monitored? Um, and as I mentioned this morning, you need to distinguish actual harms from nuisance side effects. Nuisance side effects are reversible they're much less important than actual harm, which is less reversible. <clears throat> um, so first I'm going to talk about the concept of absolute versus relative risk. And to most of you, most of you in the audience, I hope, understand this, but, but many perhaps do not. Um, and it's a very important concept to graph. So I'm demonstrating it here with a particular example from a, a fictitious trial where the efficacy of the drug is to prevent some kind of adverse consequence. And the patients are randomized to drug or placebo, and the primary endpoint is a time-to-event uh, analysis. And the results are expressed as an odds ratio. They could be expressed as a relative risk, a relative risk ratio, but the, the critical point is that this is a ratio, okay? Uh, and it's 0.5 here, okay? It's right in the middle, uh, and the p-value is 0.004. Um, so the relative treatment effect is 50 percent, and that sometimes would be uh, advertised as, well, this is a great treatment, it's got a relative risk reduction of 50 percent. Um, but the absolute treatment effect is not 50 percent, right? The absolute treatment effect is, is 13 percent, because if you look, the percentage of patients with the event in the placebo arm is about 26 percent. It drops down to 13 percent in the drug group. So the absolute benefit is, is not 50 percent. Um, and the number needed to treat would be the reciprocal of the 13 percent, which is about six through 28 weeks. The p-value doesn't really convey much of anything about the benefit. That could be the certainty, the persuasiveness, call it what you want, but it's not the benefit. Yet we see many benefit risk frameworks where this is put up there, the relative risk was 0.5 and the p-value was 0.004. That's the benefit. Well, it doesn't tell you a thing. It doesn't communicate anything. <clears throat> So here's how I want to illustrate the, the importance of the 
the risk, overall risk in the population. So here's a new study, okay? And the relative treatment effect is also 50%, all right? But the absolute treatment effect is now only 4%, because instead of 26% of people on placebo having the drug, uh, now that number is closer to 8 or 9%, okay? And so your actual absolute treatment effect is only 4%, and the number needed to treat is now 25, if you, if you like to see it expressed like that. Um, so it's critical to understand the underlying risk in the po patient population. You've got to know the absolute benefit in order to weigh that against whatever the risk is. You can't just say, well, your, your relative risk is reduced by 50%. It doesn't help you balance that against whatever the risks are. Um, I'm going to move now to continuous scales. I can't tell you how many times I see results expressed on a continuous scale where no one un they don't explain what the scale is or what the range of the scale is. Um, if you don't ex explain what the scale is and what the range is, you can't interpret it. If I told you there's global warming on Mars and that the temperature, average temperature on Mars is up, uh, you know, 0.73 degrees on the Martian temperature scale, you, you can't interpret that. And we see a lot of that. So here you've got a, uh, a table with a treatment effect that's uh, 1.9, but you don't know what it means. And so many times we see this, this type of display in, in these benefit-risk frameworks. So you need to know the range of the scale in order to interpret it, and you need to know how meaningful that mean difference is. Here it's 1.9 points. That could be a lot or it could be a little. You've got to go to the patient and, and find out. <clears throat> You can turn a continuous variable into a responder analysis. I think most of you know this. Um, but that's only if you can define a meaningful response. So if you can do that with a specific threshold, then you can calculate the percentages of patients who have a response, and you can do a test of proportions. Um, but it's imperative to be able to define a response and describe its clinical meaning and its clinical meaningfulness. You've got to be able to do that in order to interpret it. In this case, a response was defined as 10 points, and you could calculate that the number of responders was 50% and 30% of the drug and placebo groups, uh, and the absolute treatment effect then is 20%. So 20% more patients on the drug had a response defined as some definition that is, that is clinically meaningful. So when you dichotomize the scale, you're able to now uh, do a test of proportions. You're allowed to, you can calculate a number needed to treat, but you do lose some data. <clears throat> this would be uh, Dr. Temple's favorite slide um, because he, he preaches all the time that the mean effect is only part of the story, that you really have to understand the distribution of effects uh, in, order, in order to fully understand the treatment effect. And so um, this is, a, this is a, a histogram, and we've been using these more and more actually in the drug labels in section 14 where we show the distribution of effects uh, as percentages of patients with various respond responses. Um, this is actually in the tetrabenazine uh, label for uh, Korea. Um, and, and you can see the uh, relative proportions of patients with various uh, improvements and, uh, and worsening. Um, forest plots can also be very useful um, to show benefits and risks but you have to be able to put them on a common scale in order to do it. Um, otherwise, you're comparing apples to oranges. Um, you can, if you can compare them, then you can put them side by side. Um, and you can <clears throat> use them to display the benefit risk for the overall population. You can also do it for subgroups. So again, uh, comparing apples to apples is where, is where you want to be. Um, if you can express the uh, benefit as a percent of patients with the benefit of at least X, and then you can try to express the risk similarly, then, then you can try to compare apples to apples. It's not always easy. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a, uh, well, it's quantitative uh, benefit risk. It's a table that I'll show you. This, is, this was the approval of Orapaxar, which is an antiplatelet drug, which was approved about five years ago. It's preventive therapy. It's designed to prevent uh, th thrombotic cardiovascular events in patients with a history of heart attack. Uh, and peripheral arterial disease, and the main risk of the drug is bleeding, some of which is, is bad. And this table puts the benefits and risks side by side by subgroup. I don't have a pointer here, but I can tell you if you look at the box in the upper left, there were 20,000 patients in the study, so it's a large number of patients, and so the subgroups are all 
well, many of them are sizable. Um, and you can look through here and you can see how the risk vary, risk of bleeding uh, goes up as age increases. It's higher in females. Uh, it goes up as uh, your renal function uh, deteriorates. But the relative uh, uh, bleeding risk is about the same across the board. Anyway, these tables can be, can be useful. And uh, in summary, I'll just say that benefit risk is central to what we do, requires a thoughtful approach. Um, when you do these, you have to think in terms of, of communicating the benefits and the risks to uh, patients or practitioners. Uh, you want to try to compare apples to apples when you're uh, comparing benefits and risks. And there are a number of things that can be helpful in communicating these histograms, tables, forest plots uh, could all be helpful. Thank you very much. <clears throat>Thank you. So thanks to, to um, Rick and Ellis for their presentations. Uh, now I'd like to introduce the, uh, the rest of the panel, and uh, they're going to provide some initial comments on, um, on communicating benefit risk assessment information, especially how uh, tying it back to how the benefit risk assessment process can help make that happen more, more effectively. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Adora Ndue, who's the executive director and head of global regulatory policy research and engagement and international regulatory affairs at Biomarin. Uh, Becky Noel, who's the global leader for, risk, for benefit risk at uh, Eli Lilly. Elaine Morato, who's professor in health systems management and policy and associate dean for public health practice at the Colorado School of Public Health, uh, University of Colorado, Denver. Teresa Strong, the director of research programs at the Foundation for Prater Willie Research and John Wong, who is chief of the Division of Clinical Decision Making at Tufts Medical Center. So, Adora, I'll start with you. Great. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say, you know, within my, my role at Biomarin, um, one of the things that, that we do is, is really spend a lot of time with FDA's um, summary basis for approval and um, even more time with the benefit risk assessment across a number of different products just to have a good understanding of what the agency considered in making that assessment. So I'm really pleased to be here today and to see the communication aspect as one of the topics that is going to be discussed, and I hope to touch on that today, um, as well as uh, touch on the point about how sponsors can present this information more effectively. So, um, you know, as I think about um, the benefit risk assessments, you know, really identifying the pre-market um, uh, marketing application as well as the post-market period is, is really critical in understanding what is important at each of those stages. And, you know, where I'd like to start is on the effective communication. Um, and for that point, I, I really think about this as um, a two-pronged approach, one focused on content and then the other focused on timing. And so as we think about the content to include, you know, my perspective is that the agency currently has a pretty robust framework that, that serves as a, as a good guide for sponsors to assess our programs at each stage across our life cycle. Um, and, and I think that that is a tool that we can use um, during our drug development process and, um, and so, so with as, far, as far as the content, we have a pretty good structure. We have the ICH guidance, which also provides some really helpful information about specifically what to include. And I'm happy to see in the discussion guide for this meeting even more touch points and more suggestions from the agency about what types of information may be helpful and where they typically see gaps um, um, throughout their assessment. So, you know, I think content-wise, that's helpful for us um, in, in development. I think the other aspect of, of communicating uh, benefit risk assessments to, to the agency is really looking at timing. And I know the question for this session was focused on marketing application, but I'd like to actually take it a step back to see how can we effectively communicate throughout the life cycle. And we heard in the earlier session the importance of of engaging in dialogue early. We heard the agency encourage these types of um, discussions. So really trying to think about the timing for these discussions, the timing to have that dialogue. And when we look at the um, development timeline, 
you know, and trying to pinpoint the ideal timing would be helpful to get some recommendations in the guidance that the agency is planning for 2020. So do we, do we envision it to be the end of phase one meeting or the end of phase two meeting or the pre-BLA, pre-NDA meeting? Or is it the milestone meetings that happen in between? Because you know, typically what you see is you know, after an application has been submitted, you know, the agency takes the time to really assess the benefit risk profile of a product and make a decision about whether the benefits outweigh the risk. In taking a step back to see how can we engage in a dialogue earlier so that sponsors can understand where there are gaps in the agency's understanding of the product and the agency's understanding of the thinking so that we can actually fill those gaps through development. And so that's where I see the advantage of you know, really pinpointing some earlier interactions where sponsors can submit this assessment or at least our perspective of what the assessment is and engage in a dialogue, understanding that FDA will not make a decision really on the benefit risk assessment until approval, but with through that dialogue, we understand what whether there's additional, additional data that needs to be generated, additional information that needs to be submitted to help with the understanding of the product. And so really at the time of the marketing application, there's a pretty good understanding of what the burden of the condition is, what the patient perspective is, um, and, and where gaps may still exist before going into, say, an advisory committee meeting. So, so those are the two aspects that I see as helpful um, with regards to effective communication of benefit risk assessment. Now, on the other point that I wanted to touch on, which is the use of this as a communication tool. As, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, part of my group, what we do is, is really spend a lot of time with FDA's benefit risk assessment to try to understand you know, the agency's thinking on a particular condition, on particular endpoints or study design. And so it's a really important tool, I think, for not just drug development, but also for um, the patient community. And so when we look at what type of information is communicated in this tool, you know, across the board, I think trying to help with a, making the tool more robust. So when we look at reviewer to reviewer differences or division to division differences or center to center differences, how are we using this tool as an effective tool to communicate the agency's thinking? So, you know, I, I know part of this um, overall framework is to provide internal education. So, you know, I, I would encourage the use of this tool both internally and externally from a communication perspective. Um, leveraging the learnings from product to product across the agency, using the learnings within um, the divisions and the centers and the offices as um, to build the understanding of different conditions. And then externally, um, for us, you know, I think the more robust and the more complete the assessments can be, the more helpful it is to us. Um, speaking of the, the patient experience data, I know that there's been a new section, a new form that's been added, not really incorporated into the overall benefit risk assessments, but it follows the benefit risk assessments. And so, you know, one of the, the questions I have is how are we leveraging, how's the agency leveraging that section of the patient experience data form within their assessments? Um, how are they leveraging the, um, um, the data that is submitted? And, you know, patient experience data will vary. You know, it could be, you know, from the PROs to surveys or even patient engagement meetings. And so from the outside, if these forms aren't really completed to the extent possible, the learning opportunity is missed. Um, if we're looking at the information and it's not clear why a PRO tool, the, the results from, from a quality of life assessment aren't included in the label if the information is not um, um, uh, included in a complete fashion. So as far as communication, I think you know, a, a significant part of it will be paying attention to the information that is actually included in these benefit risk assessments, not just the actual framework, but the form that follows the framework. I think it's 1-4 in um, CEDAR and 1-2 in CBER, because that, that's a really of critical importance to us um, in industry and, and informs our development approaches. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Next, I go ahead, Rebecca. Do you want to come up here? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Or you have the slides so we can pull it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, if you want to do it from there, that's fine too. Um, are they available on the monitor? This monitor. Oh yeah, the monitor is not uh, working. You probably need to come up here. Come on up. Okay. Is it working? Yeah, you can't see the slides. Yeah. Back here. yeah, no. You don't have to raise your hand. Sorry, our monitor isn't working, so we're trying to each individually figure out what we'd like to do. No, they still haven't come up, have they? This one? To the right. To the right. The right button. That one. This one, Ellis? Ah, there we go. So, um, Elaine may need to step down to get her slides because we still can't see them facing um, out. So, but we can see them this way. So, um, good afternoon. So, as Ellis said, many of you are probably, you know, having a postprandial dip. I'm sure that uh, the intricacies of this may make you dip even further. But, uh, so in the, uh, in the, in the uh, interest of having that not happen, um, I'll try to um, address the boringness perhaps by uh, offsetting it with some speed. So as Rich and Ellis um, have both um, mentioned, this is not the first place or time that benefit risk has been discussed. We've been discussing benefit risk actively um, under the rubric of PDUFA 5 and PDUFA 6. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to work with both um, Ellis um, and Rich um, on something that was known as the ICH update from I think 2014 till about 2016. So while the focus of this session is on communication and on communication in the, the, the Perry submission um, space, I want you to use um, what I'm going to talk about and think about it more broadly. So this is just a, uh, everything that I, I say is actually relevant to whatever, you, wherever you find yourself um, in the development cycle as you're thinking about your benefit risk assessment. It just so happens that for the purposes of this particular talk, we're focusing, focusing um, on the submission and uh, in the parlance of uh, industry, um, in the clinical overview. So I've sort of laid it out, others have laid out the, the wonderful and tremendous progress that's been made in the space of benefit risk over the past decade. Particularly um, um, in the context of this um, session around how what we put forward in our clinical overviews um, and in our submissions. So we've made great progress but how do we continue to capitalize on all the wonderful progress that has been made? So as we look beyond what's come uh, uh, before us, it, it seems to me that much of what we continue to talk about, particularly from a, communica a, a communication perspective, is what's good thinking? What does good thinking look like? What constitutes good thinking? And more importantly, how can we go about providing this kind of higher quality decision making that we're all interested in? So there are three broad themes that I think we can look at and speak to as we think about how, to, how do we go further? How do we promote high quality decision making? Um, how do we promote critical uh, 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 analysis? Well, it's not enough to stop with what's been achieved to date. Yes, you know, I think, um, as was mentioned in the previous ses session, um, the, 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 the FDA discussion document it provides a wonderful overview of, uh, of how we can go further. But there still is more that can be um, elaborated on to facilitate that. The second thing that I think I heard Teresa mention um, is around capacity building. So there are only so many Brett Haubers in the world, or Reed Johnsons, or John Bridges. That there, that we, we, we have a small number of individuals who are well-trained um, and know what good looks like um, um, and put forward um, how we um, uh, do best practice. But we need more of these types of individuals. So we need to um, develop capacity around benefit risk application experiences and tools. 
We need to have a better understanding, a broader understanding of what quality decision making looks like. And then lastly, under this third um, 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 uh, uh, headline, we need more collaboration and connection. So we, I think we're still in a space where we've identified what goes in to a benefit risk assessment. And we're beginning with this discussion of document to identify the how. Um, but we still don't know what best practice looks like. So um, many of you are involved in a variety of professional organizations. So some of you are involved in CIOMS activities. Some of you are involved in IMI activities. It just so happens that we were at an IMI meeting at the beginning of this week. And in, in the dinner that followed, we were sitting around dinner. And we were just sort of, you know, it's, a, it's the boringest group. You guys wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't believe it. Because we go to dinner. We're in a wonderful pub having wonderful food. There's beer. There's wine. And what do we talk about? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Benefit risk. Benefit risk and preferences. So particularly if Bennett sits at your table. So just, you know, just, you know, find a different table. But, you know, so there we were, talking shop about benefit risk um, and about preferences. And, uh, and it led us to this um, discussion on software. And we were like, well, what software do you use? Well, this is what we use. Well, how do you code that? Oh, your links are broken. So what happens to your Excel file? It, you know, it, but what, but what the, the higher level theme of that discussion was that the way that we do it might be a little bit different from the way Johnson & Johnson does it, maybe a little bit different from the way Novartis does it, which may even be a little bit more different from the way Sanofi does it. So, so there's, a, there, there's an issue here around standards. We need standards. We need to understand what best practice is and what best practice looks like. So I'm going to skip this uh, in, in large measure. But what I want to lay um, the groundwork for is how we as industry and regulators and patient groups can continue to partner together to move the, um, uh, uh, all of the work that's been done um, forward. This one is the real sort of meat uh, and potatoes of my slide. There again, there are three broad themes around how we can continue to partner and work together to advance the, uh, the, 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 the FDA framework and benefit risk assessment. One is progressing, continuing to progress the, the FDA framework. The second is using the patient perspective uh, uh, methods that have been, um, that we've gained experience with to date, with potentially using that information in labeling as a tool for communicating with patients. And then this third area that we need to continue to develop is around qualitative and quantitative benefit risk assessment. Again, let's think about doing a methods catalog with, with, with data standards and best practices. And then last but not least, I'll leave you with um, this slide. So late 60s, early 70s, lots of work went into putting a man on the moon. It was called, you know, the moonshot. And when you step back and you think about how we work together, and again, this is under that third um, rubric of, of collaboration and connection. Each of these silos are important inputs into quality decision making and into good benefit risk assessment. So we need to continue to develop the science of patient input. We need to continue to develop the science of benefit risk assessment. And in order to do that in a way that benefits all stakeholders, we need to look across these silos of real world evidence and big data, patient focused drug development, methods and tools, training and education, and then policy and regulatory science. Because if we focus on one to the exclusion of the others, we won't make the kind of quality progress that we want to continue to make. So thank you.
Okay. Just keep going forward. Okay. Okay. I'm going to move mine up a little bit more. <laughs> um, I'm going to focus on the question that is talking about effective communication at an advisory committee, an AC. And how might we use these frameworks and data presentations to um, work our way through those kinds of decisions? So a little bit of background. I've served on the Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee for four years at the time in which REMS were rolling out. So there was a lot of decisional thinking um, going on. And then I um, subsequently served um, and was chair of the Pulmonary Allergy Drug Advisory. So I added it up at one point when you have to put your academic uh, promotion stuff through. And at that time, I had over 50 advisory committees I had been part of in expert panels across a wide variety of different review divisions. And so you get a, a taste of it. So I wanted to share a little bit of my shared experience and maybe a little bit of a wish list um, because I think it represents a certain critical moment in time where you're really, you have a short period of time in which you're communicating a lot and having to make a decision in a very public form. Um, and it's, it's in a spotlight. Um, it, there's business consequences. There have been some meetings where the stock is doing this during the course of deliberation. And, and patients care about the outcomes. There are folks there that really um, are, are rooting for new medicines for their therapy. So I'm going to um, have my slides just going to build around this. And I'm going to walk you through, in case not everyone has it on the top of their mind, what's a typical AC agenda. And then I'll work from here where you can use the framework. So this structure, roughly eight hours, is you get a short framing by the FDA on why are we here. Um, if it's a good meeting, you get an es essence of what's the critical question. You don't always get that. You, you kind of assume it along the way. Um, a company presentation is thinking often around why is our drug should be approved. And it's comprehensive. It's following generally this format of unmet need. There is the mechanism efficacy. Here's the safety. There maybe there's some special issues. And then we all bring back together at a clinical perspective. The asterisks I have there are usually the companies are bringing in someone with clinical expertise from various specialty sites. And they talk about the disease and its care from their clinical perspective, not patient at that point in terms of voice. You and then will go to the FDA's counter presentation. It tends to be more issue focused. Um, and you might get a statistical clinical reviewer, a PKPD, depending on the issue. And oftentimes in the ones I'm in, there's risk management discussions going on. Depending on the topic and whether or not FDA has that expertise, they might bring in someone from the outside that will supplement the thinking and so forth. You break for lunch. So you've just had a lot of integrative summative knowledge. After lunch, you now get the public forum, which I think is a very important part of the process. It does give pa public, people, patients, affected stakeholders, uh, stakeholders a chance to talk. But it's often anecdotes of one and their own personal lived experience. And you don't always get a representative sample. So it's very common. You're going to have that responder that represents maybe the top 10%. And for them, that drug may be very life-changing. Um, depending on the issue, you might have the bottom 10% that got affected by a very serious adverse event. And when you have those two compelling stories, it is very difficult after lunch to go back and say, okay, let's deliberate based on the collective data. Um, but then you're forced to talk through discussions that usually, can you discuss around the efficacy data? What do you think? Can you discuss around the safety data? What do you think? Sometimes you might talk about various risk management. And then you go into a, a vote. Right? And it forces you to have to say up, no, and abs or abstain. People rarely do the abstaining. And it's forcing my whole decision into a yes or no. And when you actually go through and listen to everyone's rationale, um, the, oftentimes they're more similar than dissimilar than a yes or no vote is. Okay? So where would a frame, how do we think about the framework? So the communication input into this meeting are briefing documents that are prepared by both the company and the FDA. And then the slides are appearing that day. The output of communication is news feed, um, you'll get FDA minutes just basically talking about the discussion and then eventually you get the transcript. So how can we make that more efficient or more effective with the benefit risk? I think being, using the benefit risk and really being clear on what is the uncertainties that we're focusing this meeting on would be a good step. That can be accomplished, I think, in the briefing document. 
Um, these are often hundreds of pages, and so unless everyone's reading everything which we try to do, how can you really help them focus on where the key uncertainty for decision making? How do you then have FDA structure their slides? So we're using that same framework to guide us through the day so that the questions and discussions are really focused on the uncertainties that are filling in that framework um, and making that sort of really logic step flow all the way through so that the committee members are providing input into this in a way that's also structured. Um, and then the minutes, too. I think the, the visualization in a, a simple chart is a great way to summarize the minutes, not just in a textual way. So these, I think, are framework, but there's also educational needs. So uh, the average advisory committee member is not knowing that this is how the data is being synthesized internally, necessarily, or by the company. How do we educate them so that as they're giving their opinion, it's contributing to the framework and not just you know their clinical voice or their... Um, patient voice in absolute. Same thing for stakeholders, not to say that stakeholders can't say what they want in their time that they have, but helping them understand how their comments fit into a larger framework that's aggregating all the information as well. Um, and then you might assume that there's some spillover and that this transfers and how is this being communicated in the press? So some of the nuance is not just a headline of 15 to 12 advisory committee is enthusiastically endorsing, but we start to get you know, a little bit more into the uncertainties, I think, in the news. And likewise, I, I think it's, you know, my sense of it is that companies are hiring a common set of communication vendors that they're working with. How do you help them see the value of changing how this whole process is structured so you're actually using the framework in the discussion? Um, because I think until you, you, you force it through all of these different contributors and how they're communicating, it, you won't really get the full potential. So I know my time is up, but I just want to hit on uh, something near and dear, and that's the risk management. I think Bennett was talking about it, how that fits. And I just want us to, um, to encourage it's more than just the analysis of condition and current treatment options. It's risks, that's data system. You know, we heard early that companies are thinking about how the product comes well. Where do we anticipate care gaps? given what we know in the situation. What's the evidence, not just in the clinical development program, but from post-marketing, from scientific literature? This is often not evidence brought into the discussion. Risk management strategy selection, what's the social science mechanism that you're trying to do? That's not talked. There is evidence around strategies that are effective or not in healthcare quality change. And lastly, you know, evidence as it relates to implementation readiness. Again, another place for patient input, but also broader stakeholder. So these would be my wish list of additional evidence that gets brought into the um, framework itself. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep going. Uh, uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me here today to talk very briefly about our experience as a, in, uh, in the patient advocacy uh, world in uh, trying to generate some information that will impact the benefit uh, risk framework for our rare disease, which is Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, so just a word about PWS, it is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder that occurs in about 1 in 15,000 births, um, and uh, it has a number of uh, clinical features and complications, including endocrine problems, uh, poor bone health and scoliosis, and uh, uh, problems with uh, hypothalamic function that impacts uh, many aspects of uh, growth and, and behavior. Uh, Individuals with PWS have mild to moderate intellectual disability, and they have a pretty distinct uh, and challenging behavioral phenotype, and are, they're at high risk for mental illness. But if you've heard about PWS, you've probably heard of it because of the hallmark symptom, which is that babies are born uh, hypotonic and really not very interested in food, so it's very hard to feed them early on. But then sometime during childhood, they develop this dysregulated appetite where they are driven to find food, and if the uh, environment does not not completely locked down, they will become grossly obese. Currently, there's no uh, uh, drugs or uh, 
devices that uh, help that hyperphagia, but we have been uh, fortunate in our um, community that some new drugs are currently in clinical trials. Um, so uh, just over the past few years, several of these drugs have started. We're now in phase two and phase three clinical trials. And as a small rare disease community, as we were facing this, we were obviously very excited, but also considering that we have limited resources and that we definitely want to have a voice in uh, having uh, FDA as well as the uh, industry partners that are in our space really understand PWS. Um, and so we d uh, to and, and we have a limited number of patients as well. So um, to address all of those issues, we thought it might be uh, beneficial to develop a uh, consortium that was specific for PWS. So we developed a, uh, a multi-stakeholder. Uh, consortium that includes uh, patient groups, academic investigators that we really haven't talked about so much, but ha that have expertise in our rare disease, as well as the industry partners that are developing drugs. And the idea was to uh, address the uh, unmet uh, regulatory issues, technical issues about clinical trials um, in the pre-competitive space using rigorous scientific methods. And since this was initiated by the patient groups, we were really in, uh, interested in having the, the patient and caregiver perspectives integrated uh, throughout the process. And so we've done a number of things uh, since the consortium was developed uh, a, a few years ago. We uh, developed a short film for uh, professionals to understand the impact of PWS across the lifespan. We've done uh, large online surveys to understand unmet medical need throughout our community. We've looked at uh, caregiver burden and uh, published on that, uh, which is uh, quite uh, a lot of caregiver burden. And we've also uh, worked with John Bridges and his team to look uh, it with quantitative methods uh, on, at risk tolerance, uh, treatment preferences, and meaningful outcomes. So we think this has worked uh, pretty well, but we also recognize some of the challenges um, that I think are important for today's discussion and important for uh, the, the uh, guidance moving forward. So. Um, you know, I think the channels for patients and patient groups to communicate with FDA can be strengthened. Uh, you know, we have that time in the patient-focused drug development talks, which tends to be very early on, and at the advisory committee meeting. But the times in between, it's usually sponsors and FDA that are having the, those discussions, and uh, the involvement of patients and patients' groups is really, de it's, it's dependent on the sponsor. Um, so having better uh, channels or uh, strengthened channels to be communicating some of the information that we're generating um, along that process would be beneficial. I think one of the reasons that we initiated the consortium was we were worried many of the, uh, the uh, industry partners in our space are rather you know, small biotech companies. And while they might do fantastic work on patient experience, if they were then to leave our space because of any number of reasons why companies have to leave a particular disorder, we didn't want that information lost. So can we incentivize when patient experience data is developed by a sponsor or in collaboration with the sponsor, that being shared uh, with the patient community and across, uh, across the board? Um, and then finally, um, you know, how do, how do we, are, are we generating the right information? Is it reaching the right, our, our uh, disorder is, you know, reviewed across different divisions? Is it reaching the right people? Is it the right information uh, to help in those regulatory decisions? So we look forward to the discussion and, and the guidances to help address us and clarify some of these issues. Thanks. Hi. How are we doing with the number needed to feed? Okay, we're there. Everybody's right. still awake. <laughs> um, my um, perception of U.S. healthcare and the one element missing from U.S. healthcare for my professional life has been the patient's voice. And the FDA's movement towards patient focused drug development initiative coincides with the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, all I would say triggered by the Institute of Medicine's publication of Crossing the Quality Chasm, and one of the six goals being patient-centeredness. And I'd like to echo Mark's theme that um, the FDA's benefit-risk framework potentially cuts across 
all elements, pre-development, development, development um, risk communication, post-marketing. And I believe it does because it contains the key fundamental elements for how we make decisions. Uh, I'm a physician, and I'm gonna bring my physician perspective to how risk communication and the benefit-risk framework may help physicians and consequently patients. So why is it fundamental? Well, if you go back to some key articles on therapeutic decision-making and testing decision-making in the face of uncertainty, the ratio of benefit to the risk of harm plays a fundamental part of determining the risk threshold or probability of disease above which you should treat empirically, below which you should not treat, or above which you should test or uh, not test or treat, where the testing decision involves, um, as Rich um, illustrated, sensitivity, specificity, and uh, if there's some risk of harm from the test also. So in that sense, it's no surprise to me that this framework fits and has not changed much from regulatory decision making to what I as a physician do clinically and to how patients think about making decisions in the face of uncertainty as well as their values and as uh, preferences uh, given the uncertainty involved. Uh, I'll also say that the uh, advisory boards face the same kind of decision making when you when you have to make a yes or no decision, treat or no treat, all those elements come into play. So one of my favorite editorials by Jerry Kassir is called Usurping uh, Patient Prerogatives. And again, for me, it highlights the value of patient perspectives. So many years ago, a patient with mental illness um, had been uh, receiving a medication, and with it, his mental illness was well controlled, his provider, um, saw some publications about a risk for a kidney failure associated with that particular medication and no longer would prescribe that medication for the patient. The patient was miserable. His life um, was turned upside down. He would have been more than happy to accept the risk of kidney failure um, to have that alleviation of his mental illness symptoms. Um, the patient saw, uh, got referred to Dr. Kassir, who did an evidence review, who said no, that risk does not seem to be present, and fortunately he did receive the medication. Now, um, you heard earlier this morning that uh, decision analysts are in the room, and I'm one of those decision analysts. At Tufts Medical Center, we actually do individualized decision analyses where a particular patient is facing a medical dilemma, and the clinician or the patient is not sure what to do. My favorite example of that is a patient many years ago who had kidney failure, was on hemodialysis, and was fortunate enough to get a kidney transplant. After a few years with the kidney transplant on what was then pretty crude immunosuppressant therapy, he didn't develop just one, but he developed two synchronous malignant melanomas. And for those of you who know about melanoma, know that that's not a good cancer to get. And to a person, all of the clinicians taking care of him said, oh no, you've got to stop your immunosuppressant and give up your kidney transplant because um, you know, if you develop uh, advanced melanoma, we don't have a good treatment for that. On the other hand, we have hemodialysis. Well, we weighed and uh, we did an individual decision analysis and lo and behold, the clinicians are right. He would have lived longer if he continued, if he discontinued his immunosuppressant. However, when we identified his quality of life estimates, it was clear to me, or clear to by the analysis, that he was more than happy to already <laughs> give up. Okay, uh, I'm told to stop. <laughs> well, to finish the story. <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna leave you hanging. <laughs> no, uh, he, uh, he, uh, um, the, the uh, quality of life benefit outweighed the longevity benefit. And with that, the patient was uh, uh, the clinicians were willing to let him continue or go along with his preferences to continue the therapy. Can I mention three things? Quickly, Thank yeah. you. Mark. Um, when I think about what we're doing from a clinician perspective and how we could help risk communication as we translate the FDA benefit to risk framework to 
clinicians to help them in their risk communication with patients. Uh, I like to use the um, guideline or think about the guideline format. Uh, and I like to think about the um, uh, level of evidence of supporting a benefit. And I like to think about the benefit to risk of harm ratio. So level of evidence, class or strength of the recommendation. And um, the advisory group does a qualitative assessment, has some quantitative assessment associated with that. That helps a clinician understand how to risk communicate to the patient. Secondly, to, to build on Ellis's comment about um, is this a, when, when I think about drugs or I think about procedures or I think about devices, is it one of those things that helps a patient live longer or is it a patient, as Ellis said, that helps relieve symptoms? And if I were to drill down a little bit further, I think about function. Is this a function that you need for your livelihood? So even minimal angina will keep you from being a lumberjack? Or is this a function that you're willing to give up? And this gets to the importance or priority of the symptom to you given your current status. And that really happens at the clinician to patient level. It's very hard to do that at the population level and generalize that. But I think about those things and I, um, uh, I also think about uh, uh, whether this is a preventive measure so thinking about drugs, am I risking an adverse reaction to the patient and the patient feels perfectly fine? Or is the patient seeking alleviation of symptoms? Uh, and lastly, are we talking about cure or not? Um, when I take that, I use that to translate it into how I can help a patient. So if I can understand what the patient's objective function is, that is what is important to them in terms of their health, um, I can answer their questions about what are my options, what are the um, uh, benefits and risk of harms from those options, and lastly, how can we make a decision um, together uh, that's right for this particular patient. Uh, and oftentimes for me, I won't know what the right decision is for a patient unless I know what their objective function is. The classic example for me is a Newsweek reporter who developed breast cancer. Uh, she had a mastectomy. Uh, she writes about this in an editorial in a major news magazine. And she's there in the room with a plastic surgeon, and they're talking about a very complex breast reconstruction surgery where they take a muscle from the back of the shoulder, flip it around. And except for the fact that her husband stopped and said, wait, isn't there another alternative to that? And the surgeon said, um, yeah, we could do this very simple reconstruction. Um, Surgery time is less, healing time is less, you'll be more active. And it turns out that's what the woman and the husband would have wanted because they had young families, she wanted to be active, it was more important for her to be with her family. The appearance of the breast reconstruction was not a big deal. And if you ask the breast reconstruction surgeon, the plastic surgeon, why he didn't mention that, it was because he assumed that that's what she would have wanted. And I'll just say that enhances the notion of um, this epidemic of patient preference misdiagnosis. So we need to help uh, clinicians diagnose the appropriate preferences. And one of the approaches to that is, as mentioned before, decision aids to quantify uncertainty. Uh, the purpose is to decrease the knowledge gap between what a patient knows and what a clinician knows. And secondly, to help that patient clarify their uh, values or preferences. Um, as an example of that, um, uh, prostate enlargement in men was brought up earlier this morning. And if you're thinking about surgery versus medication, um, we think of uh, a high quality decision clinically as having adequate knowledge. So what are the three knowledge questions that you need to know about? And secondly, what are the important value questions you know about, you need to clarify? So how important is your urinary function to you? and how important is your sexual function to you as a man. And it turns out, if your urinary function is very important to you, you're seven times more likely to have surgery. On the other hand, if you worry about your sexual function, so your sexual function is also very important to you, you're five times less likely to have surgery. And that would be what I call value concordance for a high quality decision. And uh, I just want to throw a bone out to distributional effects that uh, 
Bob Temple mentioned. Uh, before Bob Temple in 1865, uh, there was Claude uh, Bernard who said um, the uh, average treatment effect uh, that is observed is uh, not necessarily what I'm going to get in the patient who's sitting across the desk from me. And in David Kent's example of treatment with a thrombolytic for uh, acute myocardial infarction, uh, RCT demonstrated uh, survival benefits, uh, but 65% of the benefit accrued in just 25% of the patients who were at higher risk for dying from heart attack, and 85% of the benefit accrued in 50% of the patients within the RCT. So even within an RCT, there's this heterogeneity of treatment effect that Bray mentioned earlier in the morning. And we have methods to do that. One last point. Uh, uh, if I uh, think about um, a learning healthcare system, I would advocate that we capture the individual probabilities so that we can develop the predictive models necessary to predict benefits and harm. And I'd also suggest that we capture the quality of life effects of those who achieve the benefits or the harm. And in a learning healthcare environment, we do this uh, pre-development, development, during the trials, and also post-marketing uh, as a segue into the last session. So thank you, Mark. Okay, thanks, thanks John. Um, and I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for a pretty comprehensive look at, and recommendations related to using benefit risk assessment to support uh, t applications at the time of marketing, uh, um, uh, marketing applications rather, uh, to support uh, advisory committees, to support um, uh, pre-market approval processes and other ways, and then finally with John to support uh, patient communication and individual patient decisions. So thank you all very much. And um, we have, uh, we are running a little bit tight on time. We had some pretty comprehensive uh, presentations uh, there. Um, but if anyone does have a question or comment, please go to the microphone. And again, uh, online, we're at fda.benefitrisk at duke.edu. Um, uh, Rich, Ellis, any, um, anything you'd like to react to or, or follow up on from the comments you heard? Yeah, I'd, I would like to make just a couple of quick yeah. comments. Uh, the uh, first is both Becky and Elaine in different ways uh, mentioned the importance of uh, capacity building and doing some education. And I just want to um, follow with that and say that's incredibly important. Um, we need more young people getting trained in these areas, particularly in the quantitative side of things. We've got plenty of opportunities for them in all sorts, uh, all places in the industry. And um, we have worked with quantitative benefit risk assessment with a number of advisory committees. And I just want to emphasize some of the value that we've seen is that after they've been exposed to it a couple of times, they start really wanting to see more of it. Uh, so that's with regard to capacity building. I also thought Adora made a great point about um, the value of benefit risk assessment to identify some of the data gaps and information gaps that we have. And if that can be done early in the process, then the development process can fill in some of those important points. So th that was what I wanted to. Uh, Thank you. Ellis? Yeah. Yeah, pursuant to uh, what Adora said about, you know, kind of planning the benefit risk framework during development, I, I never really thought much about that. But you stimulated some thought. And, you know, it occurs to me if, if one is developing a drug for some, let's say developing a drug for schizophrenia, one could reasonably say, look, we, we know our drug's going to cause some sedation. We know it's going to cause irritability. We're not going to do other things probably. We don't know what they are yet. One could think fairly early in development about, so how are we going to weigh these benefits and risks? Are we just going to put them in a table and say, uh, you know, it's this percent versus that percent? Is there any uh, opportunity to do any, you know, kind of more quantitative comparison with the benefit? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the scale is the PANS uh, scale. Uh, how are we going to use that? How are, we going to, how are we going to express the benefit? So think about the data that you expect to have at, at the end of your development and think about what that benefit risk profile could, could look like, maybe what it might best look like, and just discuss it with the FDA. You know, we can talk about it and put our heads together and uh, maybe move the whole field forward. Mm -hmm. 
um, to follow up on, on uh, to follow up on that comment uh, quickly, or I got someone coming to the microphone. So Dora's comment about early submission of a kind of a draft benefit risk assessment. I mean, that's good for getting the the um, product developer engaged with the agency on these issues, and it fits with our whole integrated comprehensive theme. Um, would appreciate if there are any quick thoughts about how that same approach can extend to patient group, patient perspectives, so the other the other perspectives that we've talked about today um, and, and you know, I'm remembering the comments from uh, um, uh, from from uh, Teresa about wanting to make sure that this is a you know this is a pre-competitive uh, um, set of issues in some sense in terms of the outcomes that matter and as I was just saying the uh, at least some of the issues that are that are likely to drive and arrive in the arise in the course of development so any quick comments on that so, so what I'd like to add to that, I think you raise a very, very valid, valid point. And from our perspective, we prefer to work with patients and patient groups very early in development to try to understand the burden of the illness, the desired treatment outcomes, um, their perspective on what types of treatment outcomes are necessary, and also perception of risk. So that is an iterative process for us throughout development. And so when I think about the benefit risk framework and discussing that earlier, it incorporates those aspects, and that's critical. I mean, just I was really pleased with the discussion guide and highlighted every mention of the need for patient perspective yeah. on the burden, on the risks, on treatment options, because I think it's critical. And so incorporating that in the discussions, um, even if they're happening early, will be very important. And also taking the opportunity, I, there was a mention earlier um, um, by John Crowley from Amicus, to, to invite patients to the meetings, to have patient engagement meetings mm -hmm. um, where collaboratively FDA, industry, patients, mm -hmm. patient groups are at the table discussing you know, those aspects, um, burden, risk, and the treatments that are available. Thank you, Teresa. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I mean, I think sorry. that's great, and I think there have been wonderful examples of how sponsors are doing that. I think the concern from the patient side is that not all sponsors are really good at doing that, and so how do we make sure that you know if a sponsor does do a great job, that that information can then be used by the community down the line for for those issues that you know for other drugs or other. Uh, you know, I realize it starts to get into the competitive space, but there's a lot that's in the pre-competitive space that can be shared, and can the FDA yeah. help um, incentivize that or reward that or something? Yeah, yeah. and Elaine? Yeah, just, I think this underscores the use of the tool as a knowledge management kind yeah. of device as it goes from pre to a decision of advisory, and then you can check the same thing. Is that what showed up afterwards, yeah. right? And are the assumptions that were important to inform patient you know, choice early on. Is that really what you're saying? Great. And we have time, I think, for, for one more. OK. Uh, this is Steven Sun from Cineas Health. Just four thoughts. I'm sure we don't have any time, uh, but just something no, for you to consider okay. uh, here. Um, first one here is that actually when I read, first read the title of this section, I thought this was going to be about um, communication benefit risk to the patient, to the provider, uh, meaning potential impact to the label, maybe things like medication guide, what, what kind of information was going to be communicated in such a way where um, the recipients actually understand how to actually do this benefit risk assessment themselves. Okay. Second one here is about the context of multiple products. So I know you guys all know this is that when you're prescribing a product to a patient, it's not one and that's the only product they're doing a benefit risk assessment. It's amongst a polypharmacy state, multiple products, you know, you might be on six products, three of them are already making you sick. The fourth one is like, hmm, it's just another incremental um, side effect. So um, to think about benefit risk in that context. I think uh, Dr. Wang mentioned about benefits and about standards. And actually, I think um, Becky also mentioned about standards too, about um, there are different ways to look at standards. If there's a way, at least as a starter, just define what are the different ways for defining benefit, then we can even get down to risk. Because at the end of the day, um, even on the risk side, you have MEDRA to define adverse events. Like, what do you have on the benefit side? Quality of life, survival, duration, what is that? And then uh, the last one here is about um, the benefit risk assessment. To me, there's a little bit of kick the can, which is you have the provider do the benefit risk assessment. You have the patient do the benefit risk assessment. I haven't heard um, why 
we haven't talked about net benefit. Like I know it's a kind of a arithmetic, you know, kind of basic arithmetic, but when you look at that framework, it's actually a really simple, clever way to think about it because positive net benefit, you approve the drug, you keep the drug on the market. Negative net benefit, you take the product off or you don't approve the product. But I was just wondering why we haven't kind of talked about net benefit. Um, so that's it. Okay, great. Uh, great you. comments. Thank you very much. And you know, um, uh, Ellis, uh, maybe I know the first question about uh, communication relevant to the label. I mean, that was very relevant to your comments about you know things like absolute versus relative risk and and, and so forth. I think it does fit in with what we're saying. But uh, if, if you've got anything you want to add on any of these and uh, and the rest of the group, and I, we are I'm, uh, yeah we are going to have to take a break now. But uh, we're going to hear from you a little bit later. I hope at the at the at the public comment section. Thank you. Well, just uh, uh, pursuant to the last comment about the net benefit, the the problem with that, and Rich, you're actually. You, you, you do this for a living, um, but the, uh, you have to be able to weight the, uh, the importance of a benefit and the risk to the patient, which is not straightforward. I was just going to say that uh, I wanted to say that no one fell asleep, and so the number yeah. needed, mm. number needed to, f to feed <laughs> is infinity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to take that as a good point to end on. I know the, these were there's a lot covered, packed into this session. Uh, uh, communication is not a simple issue, and as uh, not only is it not simple, it happens at every stage in this uh, in this development and use process, all the way through to the post market uh, part, which we're going to get to in the next session. Um, so uh, I know there probably are some more comments about this. I would like to make sure that everyone who didn't get to have a comment in this session, now that we're out of time, uh, uh, hopefully they can. Stay around for the public comment sections. We'd like to come back from these issues. But in any case, please make sure to, uh, to get your comments or questions uh, into FDA uh, for this process. Uh, we're going to go to a break now until uh, 2.30, so 10 minutes. Um, so uh, please join me in thanking uh, our panel for this uh, excellent discussion. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. We're going to go ahead and move into our uh, session three, which is going to change, change gears a little bit and focus on the utility of the benefit risk uh, information and in informing decision making in the post market setting. Our discussion will cover a um, broad range of topics within that theme, including how patient experience data as well as uh, quantitative and formal approaches can add value to the continued benefit risk assessment in the post market uh, setting. First, we'll hear from Judy Zander, who's the director of the Office of Pharmacovigilance and Epidemiology at FDA. Um, after Judy speaks, I'll then introduce our um, line of uh, reactants for this session before opening it up to uh, Q&A and uh, opening it up to the audience for, their, uh, for your comments as well. Uh, so I'll turn things over to Judy. Things are looking up. Hi. <laughs> Judy Zander from the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology in CEDAR at FDA. Thank you to the, to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. And the opinions are my own, and I have no conflicts of interest. What I'm going to talk about, when might FDA and industry conduct benefit risk assessments? how pre-market benefit risk assessments can inform post-marketing benefit risk assessments, because we've already heard about all the good information that's captured in the pre-market space. But what are the key considerations for post-market benefit risk assessments? And how might FDA and sponsors use the benefit risk assessments in decision making? How they might be communicated in the post-marketing marketing space? We heard a little bit about that in the previous session, and then a case study. Okay, there are some critical concepts of benefit risk assessment um, across, the first is that it's a continuum as we heard, or FDA considers it a continuum across the life cycle of a product. The benefit risk framework is applicable in the post-marketing space, and advancing systematic benefit risk assessment to support post-marketing regulatory decision making requires us to address a number of questions and considerations. When should benefit risk assessment apply in the post-marketing space? How should benefit risk assessment 
build on what we already know from the pre-market space. How do we account for therapeutic context in post-marketing? How can we best incorporate the highly variable sources of information that come in the post-marketing space? And this is one of the key differences, I think, between the pre-market space and the post-market space, which I'll talk about a little bit. And how can we leverage perspectives from patients? Sorry about the build. Um, who have post-marketing experience with the products, benefits, and harms. I liked what, what I heard earlier about using the, the learning healthcare system, considering to use it to incorporate um, patient perspectives. So benefit risk is a continuum. And um, it occurs throughout the life cycle of a product. Relevant evidence from the pre-market space may inform post-marketing considerations. For example, risk mitigation may have been evaluated as part of the NDA. For example, with a liver signal that was picked up pre-marketing, um, a monitoring scheme may have been tested in the clinical development space. Um, that might help inform how the product, uh, a potential harm may or may not occur in the post-market space. Additionally, many of the considerations for the benefit risk assessments pre-marketing, like the analysis of condition, treatment options, uncertainties, patient input into disease burden, risk tolerability, unmet need, and trade-offs may have relevance in the post-market space, although some of them may change as we gain additional information in, in the post-market space, as new therapies come into the post-market space, as new risks are discovered in the post-market space. Benefit risk assessments continue informally and formally throughout use post-marketing. I also like what was mentioned earlier that FDA has always done benefit risk assessment. It's been done perhaps even the same way, but now it's becoming more transparent, it's being more formalized. I think the same is true in the post-market space. I think everything we learn about as we continue to learn about um, information on drug use in the post-market space, all of our decisions really are bound in benefit risk decisions. Um, but now we're starting to think about, in addition to this in informal assessments, how and when um, and what considerations should be built into f formal considerations. So you've seen this slide earlier. Um, it shows the benefit risk framework being used um, as, as a continuum throughout product development. And as I look at it, and I look at the right side of the slide around the post-market space, it, it's, it strikes me and it just reminds me about the differences of what we learn about drugs in the pre-market space versus post-market space. In the pre-market space, as you all know, we have inclusion-exclusion criteria. We have a study protocol dictating how monitoring is done in the pre-market space. And that's everything that we learn about the drug um, up until the decision about hopefully for approval. In the post-market space, we have product labeling to tell us who are the patients who should use the drug. Now, those may be the patients using the drug, or those may not be the patients using the drug. There may be some off-label use. We don't have strict inclusion-exclusion criteria. We have the indication for use. We have contraindications in the label. But then there's also that subject to physician um, discretion um, as he counsels the individual patient. Um, the patients may have many more comorbidities than were studied in the clinical development program. There are many more concomitant medications. We heard earlier about polypharmacy that may be used in the post-market space. Um, so we learn a lot more in the post-market space um, as there's generalizability. We, we learn also about effectiveness, um, some more information hopefully about um, benefit at, in the individual patient use. Um, and this all may impact benefit risk assessment as we gain more information and learn about perhaps new interactions in the post-market space. We learn about new risks, perhaps very rare adverse drug reactions. Oh, just to talk about in the, on the right side also, it just shows um, some of the important new information that may accrue in the post-market space, which is different than the pre-market space. There may be additional um, SNDAs, um, clinical trials, that are being conducted for new indications for a drug that's already on the market, and they may come up with new risks that were not previously known, and that may impact a drug that's already on the market for an approved indication. Um, there are periodic safety reports, PBRAs, 
um, where sponsors voluntarily, if they submit a PBRA as a periodic report, may include a benefit, should include a benefit risk summary, um, as well as, as sponsors identify new risks, they submit new labeling supplements to the FDA, and that's an opportunity for them to really characterize the new risk, and if they choose to do so, they may s summarize if there's any impact on the benefit risk with this new identified risk. So in clinical development, you know, we have our clinical trials, we have, we have the preclinical experience, we have PKPD, and that's the information that goes into the marketing application and the decision about approval. But post-approval, there's information from many diverse sources that comes in, and FDA, as well as sponsors, monitor all of this new information as it comes in. Um, information, again, can come from new clinical trials, observational studies. Uh, we heard, you know, a little bit about RWE, so observational studies that um, are done on electronic health records or on claims data uh, may inform not only efficacy but also safety, and this information um, may inform decisions around uh, new risks and potentially benefit risk. Um, there may be new PKPD studies, there may be new developments, um, new, new outcomes from animal studies, there may be information in the literature regarding either individual case reports or um, meta-analyses that have been conducted, and all of these sources of information can come out, come in any time post-marketing, they need to be evaluated, and they may or may not um, inform the benefit risk. So this is just listing out some of the uh, sources of information and the, in, and the information that I just um, relayed in addition to spontaneous reports. As you know, spontaneous reports is, is an opportunity for patients or healthcare providers to directly report to the FDA. If they see an untoward experience that they suspect may be related to the drug, they can submit it directly to FDA or they may submit it to the sponsor who then has an, a regulatory obligation to submit it to FDA. And we monitor these reports, we do data mining on the reports, and we also do case series analyzing the, series, the, the single reports, and if we think, and if we determine that there's a signal, we may determine if additional analysis may be needed, maybe an additional clinical trial, maybe an additional observational study, um, or maybe the reports in and of themselves are sufficient to warrant regulatory action. So we monitor all these uh, sources of information for um, safety signals. Uh, well, what is a safety signal? So there's many definitions for what a safety signal is. This is the CIEMS 9 definition, information that arises from one or multiple sources which suggests a new potentially causal association or a new aspect of a known association between an intervention and, and a set or individual um, adverse event. And usually the definition includes and warrants further investigation. A signal in and of itself is not an adverse drug reaction. Um, additional evaluation would need to be done. And at FDA, um, we do have a process for evaluating signals. First we identify the signal, then we may need to refine the signal to determine if more formal evaluation is needed, and then a formal evaluation may or may not need to be required in order to assess if regulatory action is needed. But after the, after the evaluation of the signal, um, it may represent a concern, a potential safety concern. And what do we do with a possible concern? A new concern may be a new adverse drug reaction, in other words, an untoward event um, in which we find an association with a drug exposure, and that likely would be entered into the product label. Um, it may be a potential adverse event, um, a potential adverse reaction, which even though it's potential, may still warrant inclusion in the label if it's important enough that advising the prescriber and the patient that the, the, there may be an association with a potential event um, that may be included in the label. There may be um, occurrences of medication error. Um, and this, although during clinical trials there may be incidences of med medication error which are recorded in the clinical development program, as a drug is um, used in the post-market space, there may, may be additional medication errors, and product mix-ups, mixing up the uh, wrong name, fact, it may need action. Um, a REMS, uh, there was some mention earlier about risk evaluation mitigation strategies, which, and I have a slide later about that, which may be needed to maintain a positive benefit risk. 
um, well, what if the REMS is ineffective in achieving its goal? You know, that might be a potential concern. Or lack of effectiveness. Um, the product was approved based on um, establishment of safety and efficacy, but in the real life use, maybe there's a product quality issue that affected effectiveness, or maybe there's a drug interaction affecting effectiveness. Um, and the lack of effectiveness may be critical to a benefit risk assessment. So just to reiterate, for many regulatory decisions, such as routine label updates with uh, new safety information, the regulatory assessments regarding these decisions would not require a formal benefit risk evaluation. However, informally, I, it would be considered every time we make a regulatory action. Um, however, a safety concern, as previously identified, may arise that would require a formal benefit risk assessment to inform the decision making. Examples may be, and th these are not examples when a formal benefit risk would always be required, but there might be consideration that it might be required um, before initiation of a REMS post-marketing. So again, a REMS is um, implemented if it's required, if, if something is required beyond product labeling to maintain a positive benefit risk balance. So a benefit risk assessment may be indicated. Um, inclusion of a box warning um, or marketing withdrawal as a regulatory action. And you've seen the uh, benefit risk framework and the framework again, um, it's being used in the main in the pre-market space and I think part of uh, the feedback from this meeting is that we should consider, you know, if we need additional um, changes or enhancements as we enter the post-market space. So um, what are some of the considerations post-marketing for to be made for a formal benefit risk, one would be what is the seriousness of the harm or the potential harm? And again, the therapeutic context, medical need uh, met or unmet for patients, the uncertainties around the risk, the potential impact on regulatory action on healthcare providers and patient decision making, and this is an important consideration um, regarding would there be a substantial burden on, with regulatory action on patients' access to medication. And um, there are, we need to consider um, to manage the, put the, the benefit risk, could it be managed with labeling alone or is additional risk minimization, for example, REMS required? And I've talked about this informally, um, a REMS is required when tools are required beyond the prescribing information to ensure that the benefits of certain drugs outweigh the risk. And this has enabled us to keep certain drugs on the market that before we had REMS may otherwise not have been able to be brought to market, and these are some of the elements and tools that we have um, to implement with REMS. So possible measures of risk minimization effectiveness, you know, we're thinking about benefit risk, we're thinking also about the effectiveness of minimizing risk. Um, the first is can it be done by the label, and if not, um, REMS assessments, if there is a REMS um, come in, there's a REMS time ta assessment timetable when the information comes in to monitor um, how effective is the REMS in achieving its goals. Um, in addition to a REMS, there may be um, a sponsor PMR, post-marketing requirement, a study, which for example could include um, drug utilization use um, to demonstrate is drug utilization limited to those, for example, who achieve the benefit um, where the risk tolerance is positive versus those for, for perhaps who do not achieve the benefit. So that could be another way of us looking at benefit risk in the post-market space. And such a study could be done in PMR by the industry or could also be done by the FDA. What are the opportunities for communication of benefit risk information? So we heard earlier about um, the, the product prescribing information is a key means of communication and we heard some input earlier about how maybe we should consider um, if this could be more optimal. Um, and I mentioned PBRS, which is really a sponsor's opportunity to, um, to, to state the benefit risk formally within, within the um, periodic benefit risk evaluation report. Dear doctor letters, for important safety risks that sponsors identify, they use dear doctor letters as a communication tool and that could be used to also communicate benefit risk information. Um, and then drug safety, the co communications are the FDA vehicle to uh, communicate to the public important new safety information and we have used the um, drug safety communications to include not only risk but to remind the prescribers and patients of the benefit risk. 
um, safety supplements. Again, that's the sponsor's um, submission to FDA as far as um, a new risk to be incorporate that they're suggesting to be incorporated to the label. That could be an opportunity for sponsors as they're identifying this new adverse drug reaction to also comment on what they think this, whether this does or does not impact the benefit risk of the product. And we heard earlier some really good comments about FDA advisory committee meetings um, as far as how we could um, make it more optimum communication of benefit risk in this public space. So these are opportunities for patient input into benefit risk. Again, FDA public meetings, um, patient-focused drug development, um, patient and disease advocacy groups, patient registries, sponsor outreach, um, which also could include input into risk minimization strategies if they're being contemplated, that the patients are, may be affected by these strategies and their input into whether um, these are realistic, achievable, and what the burden would be could be very meaningful. PRO surveys, and then we have to think about the new technologies. We heard about standards and methods um, that need to be strengthened. I think we should also think about optimizing the use of new technologies to um, optimize patient input. I do have a case study. I think I have one more minute. Yeah, okay. Uh, Natalizumab. Um, now, although this is um, what some might say an, uh, an older example um, from, you know, several years ago, um, we've updated it to take information that was in the public domain and considered about this case study and put it into what the current FDA benefit risk framework to sort of make it sort of come to life how, how it could be used in the post-market space. So, Natalizumab approval, um, this was, um, it binds to an alpha-4 subunit um, of the integrins. It was initially approved to reduce frequency of clinical exacerbation in patients with relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis, and routine monitoring was put in place at the time of approval, which was in 2004. And then within three months of approval, which is a very short time, two cases of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML, were reported in, in MS patients. PML is a rare, serious progressive neurologic disease, usually occurring in immunosuppressed patients, often with irreversible neurologic damage, deterioration, and death. Marketing was suspended at that time, and there was an intensive evaluation of all of the data. So this is the benefit risk framework um, where we've taken the information known at the time um, to put it into context for the decisions that FDA had to make. As far as the analysis of condition, natalizumab was originally approved for relapsing MS, which frequently, frequently progressive to, to severe disability. Um, multiple sclerosis is serious and potentially life-threatening disease. As far as the current options, um, at the time, netalizumab was a novel treatment mechanism for MS. Other effective treatments were available at the time, but a substantial number of patients remained untreated for many reasons, including lack of efficacy or tolerability with the existing treatments. A significant unmet need existed for more efficacious, better tolerated treatments. And as far as the benefit, previously approved drugs required trials showing evidence for two years, but the results of net netalizumab were so promising that accelerated approval was granted based on one year of data. Um, additional efficacy was subsequently submitted, and um, it strengthened FDA's assessment of the drug's benefit. So netalizumab demonstrated substantial benefit with regard to um, reduction in relapse rate for MS patients. So um, as far as risk and risk management, in the review of the natalizumab safety, um, FDA looked at the magnitude of PML patients, and about three in 3,000 or one in 1,000 patients um, of natalizumab compared to placebo um, was substantiated. However, um, and the drug also caused an increased rate of serious specific infections, including PML. And the submitted additional evidence increased FDA's confidence that the PML was caused by natalizumab. The assessment did not in, in resolve, though, underlying uncertainties regarding risk factors for who were the patients really at risk um, and, and the rates of um, PML that might occur. Um, FDA did bring this question to a public meeting, and it was decided that the benefits um, outweighed the risks. And at that 2006 advisory committee meeting, family health care providers 
um, and patients provided um, testimony to the difference that natalizumab had made in their lives, as well as their willingness to tolerate, to continue treatment despite the risk of PML. And the AC voted unanimously um, to reintroduce natalizumab to the market, um, and they also voted to impose restrictions. So FDA concluded that in the face of these potential risks, the benefits of treatment clearly justify the reintroduction to the market with certain requirements, and that physicians and patients themselves should be given the opportunity to decide if this treatment is appropriate in given cases. And we heard earlier about how these decisions um, sometimes are most appropriate to be brought to the physician and to the patient regarding what's important to them, uh, risk tolerability, their values. So um, natalizumab marketing resumed. Um, a, there was uh, limited distribution. Uh, there were uh, pre-infusion evaluations, and there was a registry maintained of all the patients. And that was really important so that we could understand if there were underlying risk factors, that we could un understand incidence of the patients with the different risk factors. And risk factors were um, identified uh, regarding um, anti-JCV virus, time on treatment, use of other immunosuppressants. And then with this information that's included in a table in the prescribing information, um, patients and, and physicians can look in it and sort of decide where their patient fits and based on their risk factors and what the risk of PML for that individual patient may be. Um, and then that was included in the label in 2015. And so, you know, we learned from this example that safety surveillance in the post-market space um, needs to be close, needs to be assessed, needs to be iterative. We continue to learn as the drug is marketed. We, we have actions that we can take to get the additional information that we need to ensure the safe use of the drug and to ensure the appropriate benefit risk decision making. And this is uh, my last slide. Um, new safety concerns in the post-market space may emerge from diverse sources. As the safety concerns are identified, both FDA and sponsors may perform benefit risk assessments related to marketed drugs. Not all safety concerns require a formal benefit risk assessment for regulatory decision making, and there may be unique considerations in the post-marketing setting for benefit risk that need to be considered. And we, I look forward to hearing what are the great, greatest opportunities for sponsors and FDA to use and communicate the benefit risk framework in the post-marketing setting. So. These are my acknowledgments. Thank you very much. Thanks, Judy. That was a great overview of the issues and set forth a lot of questions. I think hopefully our panel and um, many of you in the room can help um, further tease out. So I'll go ahead and introduce our reactant panel. Um, um, each of them have a few minutes uh, uh, to remark on the um, on the presentation that Judy just uh, uh, just provided, as well as to provide and add additional insight of their own. Um, after the reactant speak, like all of the other sessions, we'll be uh, opening things up to the room for discussion. So um, uh, joining uh, Judy on the stage are uh, Laura Bloss, who's uh, Global Regulatory Therapeutic Area Head at Amgen, uh, Juhari Juhari, or JJ, uh, Head of uh, Epidemiology and Benefit Risk at uh, Sanofi, Ver uh, Verani Kugner, uh, Head Global Patient Safety, evaluation at Takeda Pharmaceuticals, and then Bob Ratner, Professor of Medicine, Georgetown University Medical School. Uh, so with that, I'll th turn things over to, to Laura. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to participate today. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on my perspectives regarding sponsor decision making for, uh, for benefit risk assessments in the post-market setting. And, and I'll, I'll start off by talking about some of the complexities we experience as sponsors making benefit risk assessments in the post-market setting. So first, the situation we oftentimes find ourselves in are that benefits are well characterized in the, cl in the controlled clinical trials that are conducted to support product approval. And we're not, we're not often getting significant new benefit information in the post-market setting within the indication where, where we are approved. Um, in, in that same vein, new therapies are getting approved in the disease in the post-market setting. And so the disease is becoming better treated and unmet medical needs are, are being addressed. 
Um, but risks are accumulating. As you introduce the drug to a broader patient population, you're going to see new risks that are associated with your product. So you can be in a situation where you're not getting new benefits, there are new therapies that are being approved, but yet the risks are accumulating. And so that can, um, can create complexities in, in how we assess benefit risk assessment for our therapies in the post-market setting. I'm going to speak about risks for, for just a minute. So common risks are usually well characterized in, in clinical trials. And in the post-market setting, we, we oftentimes you know, have to look at less rigorous sources of evidence to, um, to further characterize the, the risk profile of our, of our products. As Judy mentioned, you know, we do this iteratively. We do this on an ongoing basis at, at, at sponsors. Um, the other complexity we have with respect to risks is that sometimes in the post-market setting, you can see risks that are unexpected based on the product's mechanism of action. And, and that can introduce additional uncertainty um, with respect to the causality assessment of whether this, this, this new safety signal is associated with the, with the drug. Um, I, I think the other, the other issue that often comes up is when you're using, when you're deriving information from perhaps a less rigorous evidence source and you have questions about whether the drug is, or I'm sorry, whether the, the safety signal is associated with the product if it's not um, related to the, to the drug's mechanism of action. You can have different views within the sponsor company regarding whether you should take a regulatory action based on the safety signal you've identified or whether continued monitoring is, is more appropriate. Um, next, I, I, I think one thing we're seeing a, a little bit more of these days is that, is that drugs are being approved on, on smaller data packages. And, and what can happen as a result is that in the post-market setting, your benefit risk can evolve a, a little bit more rapidly than it would um, if, if you had a larger evidence package at the time of approval or a larger data package in terms of exposure at the time of approval. As the drug is introduced into a broader patient population and as ongoing additional clinical trials come to, uh, come to completion. And I think, as was mentioned earlier, we're also seeing more drugs used in combination with other therapies, which can make it challenging in the post-market setting to identify whether a, a new safety signal is, is related to an individual drug. So how do sponsors address these challenges? Well, you know, this may be obvious to say, but, but first, we, we, we try to develop drugs that have a, a clearly favorable benefit risk profile at the, at the time of approval. And, and in, in this situation, or in this case, they don't significantly impact the, the benefit risk assessment. But of course, there are situations where you know, we do see a serious, um, unexpected uh, new safety signal that we have to evaluate. And we would follow the, um, the, the methods that, that Judy outlined. We would look at the, the severity of the risk, its frequency, its reversibility. Um, whether there's uncertainty related to the, um, the association of the, of the safety signal with the product, and whether that risk can be mitigated in, in deciding whether it, um, uh, it has an impact on the product's uh, benefit risk assessment. I should also mention it, it can be difficult at times to, to apply sophisticated quantitative methods to benefit risk assessments in the post-market setting. Because when you, when you see a new safety signal, it can be difficult to determine its frequency and, and also difficult to fully characterize that safety signal. I, I think the other thing that companies do to, to address the, the complexities of benefit risk assessment in the post-market setting is, is they take a very careful um, approach to assessing causality between new safety signals that they see in the post-market setting especially when they're derived from, from less rigorous um, evidence sources. If, if there is an indication that the safety signal is, is related to the product, um, you know, based on things like uh, temporal association, reversibility, um, uh, that type of thing, then, then the, the sponsor does update the core data sheet and then subsequently the regional prescribing information. I think, though, sponsors need to carefully consider that they appropriately communicate the risk. So for instance, you don't want to overemphasize or, or overweight the risk because this may deter the appropriate use of the product. So that's something sponsors need to carefully consider. And one example that comes up quite often is do you list a new safety finding as, as just an adverse drug reaction, or do you write a warning about it and introduce a new warning into, into your label? 
And then finally, the, the, the last way that I, I wanted to, to mention that we, um, we address the complexities of, of uh, decision making regarding benefit risk assessments in the post-market setting is that we, we use a structured framework and process, and that helps us identify and make decisions and communicate updates to the, to the benefit risk assessment. I think going forward, you know, what, what we expect is that, um, you know, the, the, the greater availability of more robust evidence sources in the, in the post-market setting will allow us to, to get more, um, more and better information on real-world benefits and risks. That may potentially help streamline post-marketing studies that we do and our signal evaluation of, of safety findings. And, and I just, you know, reflecting on some of the remarks today and also in, in accordance with, with some of the remarks I've made here, I think one thing that would be helpful in the guidance that the FDA plans to release in 2020 is, is a little bit of, um, you know, how sponsors and how the FDA should think about benefits and risks and their impact on the benefit risk assessment when they come from, um, from evidence sources that, that maybe have a, a, a less strong strength or have lower strength of evidence. So thanks for your attention. I've been warned that I have only five to seven minutes to talk, so let me go. How do I do this? Okay. We started today with statement about benefit, risk, and many things. But let me start with a poetry uh, from uh, one of the most famous poet, Maya Angelou. And she said that if you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going. Now, I'm not saying all of you who are very smart here, we don't know where we're going in terms of benefit evaluation, but my presentation is structured based on the history. So let me give you one minute uh, uh, recap of what's going on in benefit evaluation. 2000, when I joined uh, industry, there's no guidance. Everything is more or less line listing of benefit, and this, everything is qualitative. We published two papers in 2003. We invited by the FDA 2004 to provide lecture on this. At the time, the name is ODS, Office of Drug Safety. And then Brett team work maybe 2006, 2007, on this very field. FDA studied the project 2009. EMA not to be outdone, done the same thing in 2009. We have draft uh, benefit risk framework from the FDA 2012, protect project in Europe on benefit risk studied in Russia in 2012. And then we have prefer, Connie mentioned 2016, and now we're here. So my presentation, what I'm trying to say is, my presentation is designed to see if we could help where we're going by learning from the past. So my presentation is very much uh, following FDA requests with the questions learning from the past. So less of my opinion, but more based on what we have done in the past. The first question is when and how discussions should start engaged between sponsors and the FDA when new information comes in the post-marketing setting. Well, the question, the answer is very simple early and often, right? Now, when in this case, uh, uh, Judy mentioned, we could do it routinely for periodic safety reporting like PBR, we could use formal benefit assessment, or we, when we have a new signal. And the question over here that we need to continue is a dialogue between sponsor and the regulators, what consideration we should take into account, severity, therapeutic contacts, and so on and so forth. But I cannot help inserting two points over here in terms of the discussion is, don't be afraid going into the quantitative aspect of it. And don't be afraid to go to take patient perspective into account because oftentimes it's necessary. It's not all the time we need to do it quantitatively, but oftentimes it's necessary. So that's what I want to explain in the next slide. This is the next question from the FDA. When, when, and how? Formal quantitative benefits evaluation should be done. And my answer will be based on, remember one of the history we have? Protect. IMI Protect did a lot of work, and one of them is creating a, some kind of roadmap 
what to do in benefits evaluation. This is, you could read this, it's published in 2016. The bottom line is we do not have to do quantitative benefits all the time. Before we get there, let's step back. What does it mean, qualitative and quantitative? Let me be very clear. In general, most benefits evaluation is always quantitative. Now, qualitative over here is when you don't quantify the relative importance between the benefit and the risk, right? So, so when everything is clear, then it's become qualitative assessment. In, in other words, the weight is not there. The quantitative evaluation is when you, you need to take into account the relative importance between the benefit and the risk. Now, the, the direct answer to that question when we need to do quantitative benefit risk is when you don't know, when, when one treatment is not clearly better than the other. When one treatment is clearly more effective and safer, then that's it, you know, you, you make a decision. But when it's maybe more effective, but maybe also more dangerous, then when quantitative benefit is comes into, into play. Now, Sarah earlier showed us a suite of potential benefit risk analysis method that is more advanced, right? And that suite could be built based on PROTEC project as well. In PROTEC, we identify 46 benefit risk methods. Not all of them are quant quantitative, of course, but we evaluated 15 of them. And looking back to Sarah's slide, she mentioned estimation technique is there. Simulation technique is there. Elicitation technique is there. And maybe many of you have heard multi-criteria technique, that's including MCDA and so on and so forth. So, so the bottom line is, moving forward, when the FDA tried to build this guidance, we could work together based on what we have done. Not necessarily us, but what PROTEC has, been, has, has done. So now, that's on the when quantitative method could be done, right? So not always, but this is more or less how we could learn. When and how patient preference can be taken into account in the benefit evaluation decision making. <clears throat> now I want to cite PREFER project. Remember in the history, PREFER came after PROTECT. Now, Connie is here mentioned PREFER, Becky, Bennett, many others work in PREFER. Uh, we have done a lot, but one of, one of the product of PREFER is a publication by uh, one of our great students, Eileen van Overbeek. It's, uh, it's really a diagram on when and how patient preference can be used. This is based on an extensive literature review of what have been done. So needless to say, and there was a session before on, on, on development, of course it could be used on the development and along all drug life cycle actually. So, but, but the point today is, this session is about post-marketing, right? So let's focus on the post-marketing and this has been, has been said before as well, actually. Brett mentioned about what can be done in terms of benefit evaluation, and he mentioned about trade-off between benefit and risk, but that's not only that. R risk tolerance, uh, uh, minimum acceptable, and so on and so forth. But, but my point is, we could learn from this. When, along this drug life cycle, how, how this can be used. But there's another type of how question. How could we incorporate patient perspective into benefit evaluation, not know how to use it, right? But how to do it. And I'm citing prefer again, this is, it has not been published. Well, it will be published very soon, it's been accepted. This is based on the abstract. So there is a very finite number of methods that can be used to do patient preference, to take patient preference into account in the benefit evaluation. I'm not going to belabor on everything over here, but this is, qualitative method in patient preference, and this one is quantitative. You could see many methods over here, DCE and so on and so forth, that most of you are very familiar with. So going back to the question from the FDA, how and when, this is one of the considerations that could, uh, we could discuss together. The last question is about the communication. Now communication is maybe, the, the trickiest part of, and we have a session already, and, 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 but, but let me be very, very specific on this. 
how could we use FDA framework as a communication tool? Well, actually, Judy mentioned about labels. That's, that's one of the traditional communication, right? Right now, label is not designed for formal benefits evaluation, but perhaps could be considered. Doesn't mean we need to put the grid of ben benefits framework over there, but maybe the components could be, could be put over there. The second one is uh, uh, safety communications. You know, FDA is doing it all the time. The question is, how could we understand the reasons behind the decisions? And this is where benefits evaluation could come into play as well. Perhaps we could use the same framework and do it and then have a very transparent uh, process on how result from the benefits evaluation leads into the decision. But let me emphasize three things again in terms of benefit risk, not only for post-marketing, but everything. I think we need to work uh, uh, closer, the public-private partnership in this case, to improve our communication. Again, don't be afraid with the quantitative method. I know it's, it's, it should not be used excessively to the point of obscuring clinical judgment, never. Because benefit risk should remain judgment. But the question is how we could maximize quantitative method so people who will make the judgment have everything they, they need to have before making a decision. Needless to say, patient, patient, patient. That's the way I see the future of benefits evaluation. With that, thank you very much. I know I don't go across the timeline, but uh, I look forward to questions. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to say I'm very thankful to be here today uh, participating to a full day session and being fully emerged, uh, immersed into the benefit risk framework conversation, which is uh, certainly uh, an important one. It's part of a journey. Secondly, um, I have to say that I will express my opinion and not the opinion of Takeda Pharmaceutical. So as I was preparing this uh, my, my intervention in this panel, as well as listening to what we said today, I articulated my thoughts in three elements. The first one is to go back to the core of what the benefit risk framework is. So it's, as Dr. Heger said earlier today, it's a vehicle of the benefit risk assessment. And then I was framing specifically what it means in the post-marketing setting. So uh, I will start with the methodology. And here, uh, the guideline for ICH-E2C-R2, so the preparation of periodic report, including benefit risk evaluation, was implemented in 2012 and adopted in 2016 by the FDA. What I would like to uh, provide as a feedback to FDA here is that it's not completely harmonized and working in a global corporation where we have product being marketed worldwide, this also provides us with some hurdle with regard to how we're going to articulate the message about benefit risk assessment across the world because, of course, with healthcare system and patient preferences as well as prescriber preferences around the world, this continues to be, um, uh, I would say, a challenge. So um, it's a feedback. Uh, we are in the journey and definitely that remains uh, something that we think about when we work in the industry. I would like to also um, uh, say that um, what is important, and we, we were talking earlier today about the benefit with frameworks in the early development stage, where it's easier to have go no go decision. Um, here, uh, when we are in the post marketing setting, we were talking about the safety signal, there are methodology, identification, and detection. However, when it comes to decision about uh, benefit risk, we still don't have necessarily the go no go milestone. We have the preparation of periodic report that we're submitting. We have, uh, of course, uh, signal and also uh, sometimes reactive action because we have a, an important risk. But we would like to have more a journey where we will have a milestone and engage into a, a clear path of go, no go decision, which will really in, in, enrich our formal benefit risk assessment with an ad hoc point. So that's the methodology here. 
And then when we come into the post-marketing setting, we come then in the big world of real-world evidence and real-world data. So we're going to add more source of information. And here again, we're going to have another hurdle, which is going to do how we're going to harmonize the definitions, the standards, the validity. We will bring also more experts, um, and they will have different perspectives. So I think we have in this methodology about benefit risk framework to keep enriching the need of definition. I'm very, very impressed by the structure that we have heard today. Um, I am quote again that the benefit risk framework is fundamentally qualitative, but it's also enriched uh, and flexible enough to bring quantitative supportive information. And I will move then to the second element of my uh, feedback, which is we are going, we are now in the post-marketing setting. So what did it mean is that we are in the uh, prescription of a product in the uh, targeted indication. So it's really here in the approved indications ago, the product is going to pres prescribe. So here uh, it's very important also to understand what is a prescriber experience? What is a patient experience? And when we talk about risk, we could be in a situation where we realize that in fact the product is prescribed as a second line and not at the first line. So this also enriches the assessment about benefit risk, which is not necessarily adding a black box or cre creating a REMS, but also thinking about the, the, the indication and the revision from potentially a second line to a first line, which will also uh, target more the, 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 the indication and then prevent uh, some uh, patient to be uh, harmed by a risk which can be mitigated by a prescription. Then we will also have uh, the possibility to gain information about long-term safety. Um, that's something which is also extremely important to uh, remind all of us that we will gain this information for long-term exposure of product. Then we will face some specific public health uh, challenge which are related to medication error, we, we heard about it earlier, but also misuse and abuse. That's where, again, uh, we will have an importance here to get a perspective about the condition of use and also how the product is used. And then we will need to know more about the compliance and adherence to the treatment. And that's why I'm touching here some more public health consideration and, of course, the effectiveness of measure. So that was the second element which I see as being the unique in the post-marketing setting. So I can move to the third, which is a patient perspective. So I have to say that I was extremely impressed this morning by hearing Dr. Um, Dr. Crowley talk about the engagement early of the patient and the creation of patient advisory board. When we are uh, in the late stage, we need to keep engaging the patient. We say the patient comes sometimes late, but it's more than ever important to have also the assessment of the patient in late stage because we will hear from them what is really the, the, the use of the product and what is the adding value for, uh, for him. And going back to the off-label use, to the medication error and to the effectiveness. I am also uh, was very impressed by the conversation around the endpoint and that uh, an endpoint may not be mean meaningful. That's also where in uh, the post uh, marketing setting you can think about your, your endpoint end point in terms of benefit but also around uh, safety. Um, so I think here what I'm, I'm trying to say is that we are in a very structured approach. The methodology keep very in, being in very important. We still need more guidance around the data which is accumulating and the source of information we're putting together so we can apply the methodology around signal detection and taking the right action at the right time. And also the patient engagement is more than ever important. I think we still have to do more uh, and not bringing the patient late, but bringing the continuation of the partnership with the patient along the cycle uh, of the, the, the benefit risk assessment. Thank you very much. At the beginning of the day, the FDA presenters, in particular Drs. Eggers and Lee, every time they said benefit risk, it was followed by uncertainty. And Dr. Smith went to the extent of saying we can't 
be absolutely certain in any of our decision making. Otherwise, no decision would ever get made. And so I want to emphasize the issue of uncertainty. In the last session, one of the questioners said, why aren't we just doing net benefit? And the answer was a very nuanced answer. It's because we can't weigh the pros and the cons appropriately. What's most important to an individual patient? That nuance gets lost when you go to patients, healthcare providers, and in particular, litigators. It's a dichotomous decision. If the drug is approved by the agency, the presumption is that the benefits outweigh the risks. Because if the risks outweighed the benefits, it wouldn't get approved. Unfortunately, once a drug is approved, that's when all of the uncertainties really become apparent. Because lots more subjects are exposed to it. Very small signals get amplified. And more questions get answered. So post-marketing increases uncertainty, but then hopefully resolves the uncertainty because you identify the problems and you do the appropriate testing. But regardless, that level of uncertainty is absolutely critical in shared decision making. You can't simply present, these are the benefits, these are the harms. You got to say what you don't know, and that's a lot. It's gotten to the point where Health Canada has now begun to revise some of their assessments. Rather than talking about benefit risk, they talk about benefit, harms, and uncertainties. So what I'd like to do is just go through a couple of, of examples of post-marketing assessment that deals with some of these uncertainties and feeds into uh, benefit risk analysis. The first two are what I call assessment being done properly. So the first is the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which in the preclinical stage were identified to have a relatively rare occurrence of medullary carcinoma of the thyroid in rodents. But it was enough of a signal that it goes into the label. There is, in fact, a designated registry that was called for to answer the question of whether or not this is pertinent in man and women. Studies, both preclinical at the molecular and cellular level in human thyroids, were done. And medullary carcinoma of the thyroid was a designated second, uh, secondary outcome measure in long-term hard outcome studies so that you could answer that uncertainty. That's proactively doing risk assessment appropriately. A second, a situation where there was no preclinical suggestion of a signal. The SGLT2 inhibitors, also used for the treatment of diabetes, and the occurrence of life-threatening diabetic ketoacidosis. There was no signal in the, the clinical trials. However, once the drug was available, two things occurred. The first was case reports of periodic diabetic ketoacidosis in patients appropriately treated with type 2 diabetes. Diabetic ketoacidosis is unusual in that setting, so it, it raised alarms. More importantly, the drug was being used extensively off-label in patients with type 1 diabetes, and the occurrence of diabetic ketoacidosis was increased 8 to 20-fold. So that became a, a major issue that had not been anticipated before. So now the SGLT2 and combination SGLT1 and 2 inhibitors are being looked at with an indication for type 1 diabetes. But now this information is in hand. And the controlled clinical trials are being expanded. The requirements are going up and mitigation procedures are being implemented before we ever see an approval for type 1 diabetes. But it applies to the post-marketing issue as well because of the, the off-label use and the limited occurrence in type 2. 
Let me give one example of where this process did not go so well. In 2008, after the publication of a very controversial meta-analysis in the New England Journal, the drug rosiglitazone from the, the thiazolidine dione class was given a black box warning. It was a very controversial issue. There were a lot of discussions about the validity of the meta-analysis and the issue of absolute versus relative risk. Nonetheless, the black box warning went into effect, and that had a particularly significant impact on a comparative effectiveness trial called the TIDE trial that was comparing the two existing thiazolidine dions. That study had to be stopped. It would have been the study that defined whether or not there was any increased cardiovascular risk, which was was suggested by the meta-analysis. There was another study that was ongoing at the time called the RECORD study in, in England. And it was very controversial as well. And it took yet a third endocrine metabolic advisory committee meeting to look at the, the uh, record study with an external evaluation for, from the, the Duke Clinical Research Institute. At that point in time, the advisory committee felt that there was resolution to the question of whether or not there was car increased cardiovascular events related to this drug. You're now looking five years after the black box went on. The drug went essentially from millions of, of prescriptions per year down to tens of thousands of prescriptions per year. And ultimately, the entire company stopped doing diabetes research. So one needs to be doing post-marketing surveillance, needs to be doing post-marketing evaluation, looking at the uncertainties, and reevaluating the risks versus the benefits, the harms versus the benefits but we need to be careful that we do it right. Thank you. Okay, um, great. Thanks uh, for a, a great set of um, comments from our panelists. Um, so we have a little bit of time, and I'm going to maybe ask a, a few questions and follow up to the panelists <laughs> to get some further questions going. I heard a lot, I think, in your perspectives around kind of like four major areas um, for the most part. Uh, um, one was on sort of in the post-market setting, um, real-world data sources, including patient experience data. Um, a second big theme was um, best ways and sort of touched on patient perspectives, and, I, and Judy provided, Judith provided a really good example. Um, uh, the third big area, I, I think all of you commented at some point on the communications and leveraging the benefit risk um, assessment tool in communications. And then the fourth big thing was on um, I think, uh, JJ, you presented, like, uh, from one of the publications, um, when to do quantitative versus qualitative versus semi. Um, so I'm going to try to, in, in the amount of time that I have, maybe touch on some of those. Um, and the first one, I think, is um, on the data. So, I, Laura, you, you mentioned that um, things, it seemed like what you were saying, think, things are going pretty well in the post-market, increased availability of uh, real-world data sources, uh, becoming more efficient to generate um, needed information in the mm -hmm. post-market setting, that uh, information that might impact the benefit-risk framework. Is that is that a fair characterization of what you were saying? And maybe I'll hear I, from others, too. Yeah, I think going forward, that's an opportunity, right? Yeah. You know, whereas now, uh, or historically, we've had to make um, particularly signal, signal assessment and benefit-risk decisions in the post-market setting based off of, you know, spontaneous reports or, um, you know, perhaps evidence sources where, you know, we couldn't fully characterize the signal, I think we have an opportunity going forward with the more um, robust evidence data sources and, and the access, the increased access that we have to, um, uh, you know, to claims databases, electronic health records, to, uh, to characterize the safety signals that we see in the post-market setting better and make yeah. more informed benefit-risk decisions. Right, so, and this yeah. is also helping you. There's a question that came up about, like, how do you, 
you know, some, some things that you find out aren't necessarily going to lead to a formal benefit risk assessment, whereas others are. Is this sort of increased availability of data and more efficient way to generate more actionable evidence? Is that helping on that front, too? Yes, I think so. I mean, it'll, it'll help us. You know, right now, I, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, there can oftentimes be quite a, a vigorous debate within the sponsor company about whether we've got enough evidence to, to, take a, to communicate a new risk. And, and I think if we have if we have better evidence available, that that debate will, um, uh, you know, it'll be much more straightforward. You know, we'll know whether it's something we need to take an action on or whether it's something we would just continue to monitor. No. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so I'll just move on to you know within that data piece, the patient experience data is harder to get to and is not potentially as routinely collected. Uh, patient-generated health data or other data coming directly from patients. Where are you all seeing uh, that going in terms of its uh, increasing ability to inform some of these uh, uh, post-market uh, benefit risk assessment uh, uh, engagement opportunities? Can I answer? Sure, please. Yeah. I'm looking at all of you generally, <laughs> okay. so any time you have... Maybe I could okay. start, but uh, I think it's getting better, but I, I'm a little bit apprehensive. I think we need to be more careful. Uh, many more data sources uh, are available right now. The technology is getting better, which means we could do it faster. In other words, there are two aspects over here, Be benefit risk, but the data feeding to benefit risk, that includes real-world evidence, epidemiology, and so on and so forth. But that, that field itself is expanding, improving, but I don't, I don't think we improve too much. Last December, we have a discussion on signal detection using FDS Sentinel. We're not there yet. Right now, the traditional sources for signals is the same. Fairs and uh, uh, ICSR literature, but not so much on sentinel observational studies, which I think should be more valid. So yes, I think it's improving in that aspect, but not as fast as with, uh, I, I think it should be. Yeah. Now, on the benefit risk side, remember with benefit risk itself, you need both data from benefit risk or symptom and harms, we're still growing here as well. So, yes, but I think we could be faster. Yeah. And I think, as maybe just to add on, I know the uh, Reagan Udall Foundation and the IMEDS program is trying to uh, build capabilities so that industry can tap into some of the data resources that the Sentinel uses, and I, maybe sure. that's a growing opportunity. Yeah. So can, can I just add on that? So, so we are starting signal detection in Sentinel. As you know, the pilot will be starting using TreeScan. So you know, I agree it is an evolving space, and the, the methods are being explored, but we'll be starting to do that. So that should really strengthen um, the methodology for signal identification, you know, and there may be untapped areas where we can get patient perspective through sure. yeah. our external databases and figure out the methods for how to, how to get that patient perspective in real life when and how um, from our external databases as well. I just want Running. to add a note on the patient perspective. So I want to acknowledge that we all have uh, an, an agreement that patient has to be engaged. We're all going in the same direction. There is the FDA uh, definite initiative of patient-focused uh, drug development guidance. There is also the work of the CMS 11 working group, and sponsors are and uh, marketing authorization order are using also their own, uh, uh, I would say, network of patient engagement. And we have also the patient by themselves organized so I think here maybe there is a, a necessity to get all together in the same direction because there are different perspectives and uh, um, they're definitely a very important influential role of uh, patient. So we should maybe also think about some structure and harmonization across all this conversation and initiative. Okay. Can, um, can I make a, a comment? Sure, please. Okay. Just a plug for CMS 11. So both Teresa and myself, um, as well as Becky, are members of CMS 11, which is looking at patient input throughout life cycle development, um, pre-market and post-market space. And part of it is to really leverage all the external initiatives that have been done, you know, throughout time. Like I know JJ talked about, you know, we have to learn from the past, you know, to build the future, and that's a big part of what's being done. And then we're going to also look at the post-market space. So hopefully, we'll be able to leverage what's been done as well as look to the future to strengthen the patient perspective. Okay, um, take a question. R and D. Um, typically, when a safety decision starts emerging in post-approval. You have to make an, an initial decision extremely quickly, and then there are different time scales depending on what's happening. Um, 
contract, if you haven't set up with uh, patients, it could take weeks to months to uh, do contracting, get IRB, a number of things that don't fit into the time scale of a rapid safety decision. Um, my question is, do you have any thoughts on how you can deal with the differences in those time scales if you really want to get the patient perspective in the time frame it needs to make a rapid post-approval safety decision? So actually, CIOMS 11 it has a, a whole section that they're dealing with when, when rapid communications are needed for urgent safety issues, and we have patients on the group trying to help us bring in ideas with how that could be done. How can you meet the timelines as well as being in pa patient perspectives? We've heard a little earlier about having standing patient um, advisory boards, um, for example, and, and I think there are other good ideas as well um, how we can meet all of the timelines because patient health is important, the appropriate use of medicine is important, patient perspective is important. Maybe just a comment. I, I do think, though, it would be difficult to get information from patients on the trade-offs, the willingness to accept in the short time frame that at, at least we have at my company to, you know, assess the signal, make the decision, and then communicate. So. I, I agree. If you're dealing with an issue with a radically new adverse event appearing, presumably no formal preference study done to date will have included training off against that property. You might be able to learn something from the literature on related disease areas, but in, in all likelihood, you're going to be working from nothing. Um, and this is where some of the stuff that Brett mentioned earlier. You can do qualitative stuff, gather qualitative information on patients much more quickly. What's important? You might also be able to do some of the qualitative uh, preference techniques that JJ showed, potentially in the short time frame. But I think it's, this is actually something that I think the FDA could actually describe that there are different methods for bringing patient experience data, some of which just won't work in that rapid time scale, and some of which will work. Thank you. That's a good point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elaine? Yeah. Elaine Morado. So I was curious what you all think about the risk management part of the post marketing. I know we talked a lot about, you know, the risk yeah. itself assessment relative to the benefit. How might you apply your methods in assessing risk management if it's going well or not, or informing risk management? Any ideas? I think part of risk management is dealing with those uncertainties. And as you learn more about the, the topic through the, the mitigation process or the, the REMS, then you can, can begin to expand the communication with healthcare providers, expand the communication to patients. That's part of what I was trying to suggest in the, the okay. schema that work, where you collect the information as you're going along. Um, you know, at this point, medullary carcinoma is not a concern among diabetologists using GLP-1 yeah. because of the, the uh, REMS and registries that have been required. Where I was sort of thinking about is extending the preferences. We talk a lot about burden and are we, are risk management effective or not, but also burden preferences. So your thoughts on maybe extending the approach beyond patient to include stakeholders, the larger system partners, if you will. Yeah, I think it's a very important point. It's around the, the quality of the effectiveness of measure, uh, because we're still stumbling on this. It's the engagement of the prescribers, and uh, we send educational materials, there are labor, but how do you make sure that the prescriber understand and also apply, and, um, and also provide the appropriate communication, and they change also they, they use? Uh, still, there's still work to be done. Uh, yeah. on, on, it's not just because you update your labels that you will necessarily have the effectiveness of measure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So just burden is important as far as perception from all stakeholders because, again, in the post-market space, we're concerned about public health considerations, settings, risk minimization strategies. So all of that input is yeah. important from, from all So maybe in the guidance as FDA is writing it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, expand the definition so that that is mm -hmm. clear. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good point. Okay, next question. Yeah, I'm Jeff Roberts from Office of Vaccines in uh, CBER. Um, uh, my experience with this is, is really similar to um, what Ellis laid out before, which is, you know, this is fundamentally what we're doing, obviously. Mm -hmm. So 
All we need to do is, is, is lay it out and be explicit about it. How complicated is that? <laughs> but it turns out that it's, that it's very complex. And I'm glad to see that we're making additional progress, you know, getting into areas like uncertainty and, and, and moving into the, the pre-market space. But when, when you think about uh, post-marketing, you know, I wonder if we shouldn't think about a, a, a potentially a fundamental conceptual problem, uh, w which is that um, you know, we, uh, uh, um, you know, we do this in the pre-market space, and um, it's it's clear how to do this. Um, but when it's post-marketing, these safety signals emerge, and they get compared to a static set of uh, uh, efficacy data. So, you know, we, it's not an ongoing benefit risk assessment. The benefit is static. So, you know, what to do about this? We have the infrastructure to look at safety post marketing, we have the surveillance mechanisms, we have expertise internally to evaluate signals, we have authority to do things about it, but we have none of that. Uh, uh, in the realm of effectiveness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe I'm worried about this more than others because in the Office of Vaccines, we're chasing infectious diseases that can mutate and change. And we've faced these very problems. I don't know if you're familiar with the flu mist issue. <laughs> Some of you are shaking your head. <laughs> um, but, but less so in, in, in the therapeutic context. Um, but we talked about smaller data packages that we're going to get. We're going to license things based on biomarkers and real-world data more in the future. And I think we're going to be faced with this problem of potentially uh, uh, coming to learn that the benefit wasn't what we thought, pre-marketing. And so as we think about writing this, I mean, this may be beyond the scope of what we want to do with this guidance and in this context, but to the extent that we're going to address it, I'd like to hear some discussion about how you all think about that and, uh, and how we might address it at least in this, in this context. So as an outsider, I'm surprised that those of you at the agency have so much extra time that you want to think about taking on the responsibilities that AHCR and PCORI are doing. Um, it's, it's laudable, I'm just not sure it's wow. practical. You know, comparative effectiveness trials are ongoing to try and answer the question, is therapy A better, worse, or the same as therapy B? And that ultimately is, is going to talk about the long-term benefits of drugs. Um, but I'm not sure the agency has the time, personnel, or stomach to take on those tasks. Maybe I, I could add, but, but uh, I think it's a valid concern. Uh, everything should be dynamic. Now, safety now is a, a dynamic approach. We update safety as we have more data from post-marketing. Well, theoretically, you could do the same thing for the benefit side, from efficacy to effectiveness. In fact, the FDA has made a lot of efforts to use Sentinel beyond safety for effectiveness, so, so the effort is ongoing. Now, the que my question to you is how worried you are when uh, safety is updated all the time, but not the benefit side. That is not the uncertainty, right? I, I think ideally, we should also take into account data that come in during post-marketing, both for safety and for effectiveness. But in the absence of the appropriate system at this point, I would prefer to use the, the, the good one from trial, not to use effectiveness before we really, really sure that it's good. And I feel, me personally, I feel okay having a dynamic safety and using benefit from, from trial, but I don't know, others may differ. I, maybe if I could just comment, I, I do think it's also a communication issue, like we talked about earlier today. Um, sometimes you are getting new benefits. Sometimes, you, you, you know, you're, you've got... Um, as JJ mentioned, you've got the ongoing clinical trials collecting long-term benefit information along with long-term safety information. Um, you, you may be getting uh, additional information from, you know, studies that you're doing to look at the usage of the drug in the, in the marketplace. So sometimes you are getting additional benefit information. But, 
but what gets communicated in the label are the updates from a safety perspective, I think. So you know, it, may, it, it ties into the communication panel we had earlier today, I think. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's a great question. I'll put my two cents in too. Um, so the, you know, the, the I don't think the FDA is necessarily. I don't think you're asking to take on new efforts to actually generate this evidence. But presumably, at some point, um, sponsors will be submitting um, evidence that comes from, you know, effectiveness evidence from the from the r real world setting. And um, it's a non-small effort at the agency to try to figure out. Um, some of these issues, JJ, that you brought up, which is like when you're looking at effectiveness, it's uh, you got to be sure about, you know, you do on the safety side, but even increasingly so, um, the quality of the data, the methods that are being used to generate the estimates, and it's a huge effort, obviously, at the agency um, trying to figure out what some of those, um, what some of those best practices might be and how to sort of navigate the question of leveraging that information um, in a regulatory decision and then presumably as the benefit risk framework gets, uh, gets uh, a continued well, assessment on that side. Let me make it clear that we're not asking to yeah. take this <laughs> <on>. <laughs> yeah, okay. because, because I hope you heard that what I said earlier is that we don't have the infrastructure, uh, we don't have the expertise, uh, you know, to, to make the kinds of assessments that we do for the pre-marketing data. Uh, so, so that's why I suggested that this conversation may go beyond what we want to try to do in this space and for this guidance, mm -hmm. but it, it, I, I see it on the horizon as, as potentially a, a really fundamental issue. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks for your comments. Um, so that brings us to the end of, um, of this session. So I'd like to thank, the, uh, thank, thank Judith and, and, our, and our reactors for a really great discussion. <laughs> Okay, um, so now we're going to go right into our penultimate uh, session. Um, uh, thanks to everyone for your for your participation. Um, we'll now move into hear about key takeaways and potential um, next steps from our uh, reactant panel. Um, for this session, I'd like to invite uh, those reactants, and I understand, um, Bray, there's, uh, you have to head out to the airport, so no, no problem. Um, uh, so our reactants for this particular panel will be Scott Evans, Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the, and the Director of the George Washington Biostatistics Center, uh, George Washington University. Um, uh, Bennett uh, Leviton, Senior Director of Benefit Risk Assessment, uh, Department of Epidemiology at Janssen. Pharmaceuticals, um, Rick uh, Herman, safety science physician, AstraZeneca, and um, Peter Stein, deputy director, office of new drugs at the uh, at, at the FDA, um, and I think that'll conclude our panel. So um, this is uh, intended to just hear some of the key takeaways that you all have been uh, been hearing throughout the day. What you is important, what's been interesting for the, um, for the discussion. So I'll go ahead and let, um, I guess, Scott, uh, any initial comments from you? Um, do you want to? Slides. Do you have slides? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to present from the Please. podium? Okay. Uh, sure. Sure. Thank you very much. There you go. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's been an exciting day. Uh, and, um, in, in statistics, uh, we have a saying that there are lies, uh, damn lies, and benefit risk assessment. Um, no, actually, uh, this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I, I sometimes wonder, after studying benefit risk evaluation for so long, why is anybody else interested in anything else? Because it's really the heart of what we do. Um, there was a well-known uh, basketball coach uh, years ago who was having a problem with one of his uh, players, and uh, he uh, he uh, he uh, uh, approached his player and he asked, uh, you know, he brought up this issue that he was having with the player, and he says, "Is it ignorance or is it apathy with you?" And the player said, "I don't know, and I don't care." <laughs> and um, so, I would like to present uh, one issue that, uh, frankly, I think is a sort of a deep void in uh, the discussion today. Much of the discussion has been excellent. I agree with um, almost everything that's been said. I think it's great progress. But I think we're missing one important area. And I would like to point that out. So 
so here's, I'd like to motivate the discussion by a quote from uh, Rob Califf, the former FDA commissioner, and uh, Dave Demetz, a well-known statistician, said most clinical trials uh, fail to provide the evidence needed to inform medical decision making. However, the serious implications of this deficit are, are largely absent from public discourse. And in that spirit, now what, what they were talking about is that the studies we are doing are not pragmatic enough in the sense that we're not really getting to the deep question that we need to answer. We're sort of skimming the surface. And I'd like to show you how we're actually doing that with benefit risk evaluation as well. So uh, I've sat on FDA advisory committees for, I don't know, 15 plus years, probably 20 or 30 of them, um, and seen the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, summary before, our tabular summary, where we have analysis of the condition, we have the benefits, we have uh, uh, risk management strategies, and so forth. Now what happens? Uh, in, in essentially every report is the following. Here's the strategy that is used by sponsors. They say, well, for the analysis of condition, they, they repeat something from the introduction that tells you something about the condition. The current treatment options, they repeat something from the introduction that was in the report from the introduction about how patients are treated. The benefit, they repeat the efficacy results. Uh, for the risk management, they repeat the safety results and theorize how they might manage these AEs. And then, of course, they conclude with the benefits outweigh the harms. This is the formula. Now, we've been talking a lot today about integration of benefits and harms, benefits and risks. But what do we mean by integration? What we meant here is basically they're occurring in the same section of the report. There hasn't really been any integration formally. All right. Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, I think we're not pragmatic enough in looking at our benefit-risk evaluation. It should be somewhat pragmatic, assessing how interventions affect patients. We've been talking about, a lot today about patients' values, their perspectives, what are the effects on patients. And I want you to ask the question, are we really getting at the effects of, on patients? Now, segregation of benefits and harms is not pragmatic. You know, it's, it's, it's the old saying about uh, united we stand, divided we fall. And if we unite the benefit and harm data, we're going we're gonna to underst better understand how, what the effects of interventions are in patients. If they're segregated, you're not going to understand it. And here's what I mean. So here's an example. We measure a duration of hospitalization in many different uh, uh, outcome trials. Shorter duration is better. Or is it? The faster the patient dies, the shorter the duration. Now, because I've separated survival from duration of hospitalization, I can't understand any summary you give about duration of hospitalization. The interpretation of one variable needs the other one. And if I separate it, I can't understand it. So why we understand these things or, or separate analysis of, of different outcomes is was in some ways, we shoot ourselves in the foot, all right? Now, here's a quiz. We're all smart people. Suppose a loved one's diagnosed with a serious disease. You get to select treatment, all right? Let's suppose we have three treatment options, A, B, and C. We have two outcomes. We'll have a benefit, an uh, efficacy outcome, and let's suppose that's binary. You either get it or you don't. We have a safety outcome, a toxicity. You either get it or you don't. Right? Now, luckily enough, we had a nice clinical trial, compared these three treatments. It's going to tell us how to choose, how to, how to save our, life, our loved one, how are we going to assess the benefit risk. So here's the randomized trial comparing these three treatments. There's 100 patients in each of the arms, A, B, and C. The success rate, the efficacy rate, is 50% in all three arms. The safety event rate is 30% in A, 50% in B, and 50% in C. Which treatment do you want? Well, you choose A, right? It's got the low. All three of them have the same efficacy rate. A's got the lowest toxicity rate. No brainer, right? Now, what you've done in this analysis is you've used the patients in the trial to analyze the outcomes. What I would like to do is flip that upside down. 
use the outcomes in the trial to tell you what's happening to the patients. And you're going to see things that you're not able to see now. All right? So we're going to cross-classify the results. So what happened in treatment A is that the treatment, the efficacy, and the safety outcomes were uncorrelated. So of the 100 patients treated, there were 35 patients that experienced efficacy and avoided the toxicity. In treatment B, they were positively correlated. So all the patients who experienced the, the efficacy also experienced the toxicity. None of them had a net benefit, if you consider them similarly important. In treatment C, they were negatively correlated. So there's 50 patients who had efficacy without the safety event. Now, one slide ago, you could not tell the difference between B and C. And the reason is because you used the patients to analyze the outcomes rather than the outcomes to analyze the patients. The reason we're collecting outcomes on patients is to tell you how the patients are doing, particularly in late phase trials. Now, there's, obviously, you want to analyze outcomes. And particularly early phase, we want to understand mechanisms of action and causal pathways and all that stuff. But the idea behind late phase work is to gather outcomes and tell you how the patients are doing. And we've missed the boat. So uh, here's another uh, one last uh, scenario I want you to think about. We uh, define analysis populations in clinical trials. You have an efficacy out. We do an efficacy analysis on intention to treat. We do a safety analysis on the safety population. Now suppose we try to put those two analyses together. Now, those two populations are not the same. So when you do your, F, when you do your benefit risk evaluation, to whom does this benefit risk analysis apply? We don't even have a well-defined population, never mind a parameter estimate. Now, oftentimes they're very similar, and that's fine. But theoretically, what we've had in this particular case then you start thinking about personalized medicine. At this point, I don't even, we're not analyzing patients, so we're not quite getting to personalized medicine in, in the, in the real, realist sense. We wrote a paper uh, trying to explain some of these issues, and you can see the play on words. We use the outcomes to analyze the patients rather than the patients to analyze the outcomes. This is a step towards pragmatism and understanding what's happening to patients. Now, uh, there's a quote from a well-known uh, clinician uh, some may, may know William Osler, a well-known uh, well physician. He founded uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital, or was one of the founders. He said, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient. And maybe we be, should be thinking about how to analyze what's happening to patients. As my math father teacher told me many years ago, the order of operations is important. And what I mean by that is, what we traditionally do in trials is we take the efficacy outcome number one. I aggregate what happens over treatment A, I aggregate what happens over treatment B. I make a comparison. I then repeat that for all the other outcomes I have, and then at the end try to put it together. But that's not the way patients experience these outcomes. We have to start thinking about how patients are, are experience the outcomes within patients, start combining outcomes, then aggregate over A, aggregate over B, and make a comparison. Um, so, uh, we wrote a couple of papers trying to under, uh, uh, um, describe some ideas about how to do this. And we introduced this term of desirability of their outcome, which is composing the information. What is the desi in a global sense, what's the desirability of the outcome for a patient? And, but the thing is, we have to figure out, before you analyze 100 patients, you have to figure out how to analyze one. And in some cases, we're not even there yet. So uh, in summary, I think the framework's extremely helpful, um, but I don't think it goes far enough. I think there are particular voids that we have to pay attention to. Um, benefit risk, in, if you're really after what's happening to the patient, it has to be more pragmatic in nature, summarizing the effects on patients. Um, and segregated evaluation is not pragmatic. You may be missing signals. Um, I encourage a framework to include evaluating those patients, combining benefits and harms with um, and uh, I think if then we, we ask for patient preferences, that those preferences are around states that these patients are in, in combinations of outcomes, not necessarily the value of particular uh, efficacy and safety events. I'll stop there. Thank you.
make sure that I'm actually the next one to speak here. Next no, it's yours. So before I start, I'm going to tell you a little quick example. We often, always use the same population for our clinical trial uh, benefit risk assessments. So we'll use ITT for both efficacy and safety uh, endpoints. Well, it turned out in one case there was a radical difference that occurred at the end of the trial. One arm, they switched to a, a standard treatment. It took a week or so to adjust that standard treatment, and the patients had a lot of adverse events and benefits dropped for that week. The other arm, they stayed on that same comparator, no change. That week or two after top line, the difference between ITT and safety radically changed the endpoints, the results. If we looked at ITT for benefits and safety uh, and the safety end, uh, population for safety endpoints, we would have been really misleading ourselves. So that point that Scott described is real. Um, anyway, let me tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from, and then uh, I'm going to focus on challenges. Um, so we lead a benefit risk team, and we do a lot of multidisciplinary analyses where we get agreement on the decision context, the value tree or the endpoints, and the general approach to benefit risk, as well as documenting the rationale. What takes the most time is that value tree exercise or determining which endpoints are most relevant for a benefit risk assessment. We'll typically do a benefit risk statistical analysis plan, which will result in a technical report. We'll do patient preference studies if appropriate, and sometimes we actually embed them within the clinical trials. No matter what you plan in advance, you can't pre-specify the way benefit risk almost always goes. It's usually post hoc. So we'll do a lot of exploratory analysis and visualizations, finally resulting in the type of analyses that we'll put into clinical overviews and briefing book, books and the like. We'll use a combination of the FDA's benefit risk framework, tabular and graphical summaries, preference studies, occasionally some quantitative benefit risk with a lot of clinically oriented text to interpret it. All right. So let me talk about now challenges. The first one is uh, what we heard a little bit before. When are quantitative benefit risk me methods needed? So I'm in debt to Hans-Jörg Eichler from Europe for the top part of this slide. If you have an easy benefit risk problem, you just look at the data and you're done. As the complexity of the decision gets harder, a framework and clinical judgment become absolutely imperative to make your decision. If the problem gets more and more complicated, it reaches a point where you're going to want to use quantitative benefit risk techniques or preference studies. So that's kind of straightforward. The question is what occurs most of the time? So this is my intuitive feel for this, that when uh, Bob Temple saw this before, he, he thought there should be a, a smaller tail. But basically, this is what happens most of the time. You either have an intuitive benefit risk problem or one where a framework with cl clinical judgment is sufficient. But occasionally, this happens. And the problem is you don't know that in advance. You don't know if you're going to be in that tail where you have a problem that needs hardcore quantitative benefit risk assessment or preference studies before top line, at least most of the time. And after you've got your top line data in development, you really do not have an opportunity to do some of this machinery. So that's one of the complexities that gets involved. By the time you know that you're on the right, it's too late. Okay, so technical challenges. I'm going to start with a couple of the things that I thought wouldn't be discussed earlier, though I, I thought these would be more interesting. So the value tree exercise is the activity you've heard before where we decide which endpoints are most key for benefit risk assessment, which endpoints are most valuable to use. And typically, you'll start with like 20, 30 endpoints in the clinical trial and try to find the two, the six or so that are most important. Um, what I've often discovered that there's multiple perspectives as to what are the key endpoints. We've had many times when there's been more than one value tree. In other words, more than one set of endpoints which you can equally say are appropriate for benefit risk assessment. So if you want to talk about building some machinery in or advancing the machinery in the benefit risk framework from FDA to include quantitative techniques, part of the issue is going to be dealing with multiple perspectives on which are the key endpoints that go into it. Another issue is that if you can take your efficacy endpoints and your safety endpoints from your primary SAP and put them together, they're not always good endpoints for benefit risk. Your typical endpoints may double count, they may be causally dependent, they may occur at uh, radically if, under different time frames, they may be measured in different ways, they may be in totally dis incomparable units. And so we often end up defining a new set of endpoints for benefit risk. 
that puts you on the point where you can't just say, we're going to take this sub set of endpoints and move forward. You have an entirely new set of data. It's not insurmountable, but it's a complexity. Given the time limitations, I'm just going to switch to the third one here. This is actually very similar to the point that Scott just mentioned. If you look at almost all the benefit-risk machinery that's commonly used, you basically assume tacitly that the, your endpoints are independent. And this figure here is very similar to the one Scott just showed, in, in which case, in this case, the people with the benefit don't have harms, and the people without the benefit have all the harms. This is not an easy issue to deal with. Preference studies. So we know there's general consensus on the value for preference studies and benefit risk, but there are open questions for regulatory applications. We don't have good regulatory standards yet. We have the beginning of it with the CDRH preference guidance, but only the beginning of it. Um, the appropriate applications to clinical data. We have some rough sense of how preference studies can be applied to clinical data, but they don't really go far enough. A simple example. Maximum acceptable risk is one of the most common ways a preference study is summarized, which is basically how much risk of a particular side effect would a person accept for a given benefit. Well, not everybody gets the benefit, not everyone gets the same degree of benefit, and people have more than one side effect at the same time. So the simple application of MAR is not going to work. We also mentioned earlier shared decision making and the uh, individual patient level benefit risk impacts on population level benefit risk. So I won't repeat it here other than to say it makes things more complex. Then there are issues with the process. Fitting quanti the, the quantitative approaches can be fit into the benefit risk framework, but right now the FDA framework is much more geared toward quantitative arguments. You can fit it in, but we're really going to need a whole new set of guidances, really, for how to include benefit risk with a quantitative flavor into the FDA's framework. We heard earlier the concept of a toolkit. There are many techniques and tools in the benefit risk toolkit. One of the questions that we often have is, if we use this complex methodology, can we trust that the other stakeholders who are going to share our results or review them have a common understanding of these techniques? And that works both, way, both ways. Uh, is the sponsor wants to make sure the regulators are familiar with the technique, and the regulators want to make sure that the sponsors have the same understanding of a technique they may use. This also impacts on software. Typically, a sponsor will do an analysis, and they'll have some SAS code. If the FDA wants to reproduce the analysis, they get the code, and they move forward. Suppose we do something complicated in benefit risk with quantitative analysis. Well, you really don't have the same analogy. There are all sorts of tools. There are all sorts of ad hoc uh, Excel pieces of code. Um, nothing insurmountable, but again, it's an example of a challenge. The last point I'll describe in challenge is advanced planning of benefit risk. Benefit risk is generally regarded as a post hoc exercise. But the FDA and sponsor analytics, that's usually pre-specified. Benefit risk is sort of in the middle. It has, it's partly pre-specified, and it's partly post hoc. It makes it much more complicated to figure out what to do about it. What can we do about it? Well, my suggestions, my first suggestion is something like uh, similar to what Becky mentioned earlier. The role of a private partner, uh, public-private partnership, much like MDIC, a neutral ground to deal with some of these complicated issues. I was involved in MDIC's first project on the patient-centered benefit risk framework. It worked very well, in fact, probably better than people expected, because there was hand-in-hand -hand work between patients, regulators, industry advocates, and academics. I'd like to see if something similar can happen on the CEDAR side. Becky mentioned a Q&A for the advancement by the uh, International Conscience Organization on the common technical document, um, and augmenting the benefit risk framework with some of the concepts I've meant listed there is something that we've sort of been hinting towards throughout. Guidance. The, the 2020 benefit risk guidance, it's not the place for complex quantitative benefit risk analysis, but it is a place where it can describe some of the roles for quantitative benefit risk. Potentially, the FDA could consider a separate guidance on decision analytic methods and standards. There's also the CDRH preference guidance that initially came out, I think, in 2015 that could potentially be updated because even though it's only been a few years, the work in the preference field has advanced considerably since then. The last point is on capacity building, which has been mentioned earlier. And I want to stress it's not just capacity in the health authority,
but it's also in companies where we, you need people who have the experience to use these techniques to understand the processes for implementing co quantitative benefit risk and know how to communicate it. Thank you. Well, the second time is a charm. Let's hope it. Ah, yes. Very grateful to, for, to be able to speak today. Um, I'm a safety physician, uh, pediatrician, and clinical pathologist by training, and work with AstraZeneca. I've been there for a dozen years or so. And um, I just want to start off by saying please do not make any benefit risk assessment by the fact that I'm the third speaker instead of the second one I thought I was. It could be good, it could be bad. Actually, it's just because I read an old agenda. So um, I'd like to kind of, uh, first off, again, everything you hear is going to be my opinion. Um, touch base on some of the, step, take a step back a little bit and just say, uh, take a few um, moments to think about the culture of, of the reason we're all here around this idea of benefit risk assessment and, and the fact that n neither the benefit nor the risk sits in a, va in a vacuum, right? So the, um, you know, some of the key takeaways, um, I think, <laughs> with that in mind, some of the key takeaways from today um, is that, you know, there's a lot of very intelligent, very inspired, and very motivated people in this room. There's many, many more probably watching uh, through the webcast who are, who were all very enthusiastic about this, I, this whole idea, right, of, of putting these pieces together and coming up with the, with the best solution for the patients. So we've made huge strides, as JJ had, had mentioned historically, um, but you know, we do have we do have work that still is laying ahead of us, but it's beyond the scope of the people in this room and people watching. There's a big, big world out there that we still have to get that message to. I see this um, in multiple consortia that I sit on. I see this within my own company. It, it, it's a message that needs to reverberate throughout the industry, that this is the single most important thing that people do every single day they come into work at a, at a pharma company. Every single thing you do boils down to assessing your benefit risk balance and maximizing that balance, right? And th the truth of the matter is, is that there is no platonic truth. There is no real single benefit risk balance that everyone is striving to, to attain. We all know that if you put three experts give three experts the same, the same exact data, they will come up, come up with three different interpretations. Maybe not greatly different, but different. So this whole topic is inescapably subjective. It is inescapably subjective. But we have as our responsibility to move as close, to an, as, as, close as we can to an objective truth. But not forget that in order to get there, we have to understand and embrace the idea that every person in this room has their own subjectivity, their own experience, their, their own human thoughts and values that they bring into this very real, uh, real world uh, of assessment of drugs. Now, um, I think from my perspective, from a cultural aspect, probably the most significant challenges um, that we have now and looking forward um, that I'd like to present to everyone here in FDA in particular is, is that, you know, this idea has to reverberate amongst, if we pull, if we look inward a little bit now, across all levels of um, and expertise of people within, uh, within our companies and starting from the very beginning of the life cycle through to the end. People can argue from the very first injection into a mouse all the way until the drug is pulled from the market. Certainly, at least, it should be something that's embedded from, from before we go in uh, first time in humans. So that concept, and across the, the whole spectrum of levels of, of, uh, of the hierarchy, from the bench scientist to the CEO, it has to span that whole breadth or it will get 
blocked or it will get stopped or it will get slowed or it will just, you'll end up with something that is less than optimal. So some practical um, uh, ideas uh, organizationally that I think that, that I'd like uh, FDA to consider going forward is to, um, in, in, in your guidance, if you in any way can re-emphasize, restate, re-energize the idea of creating a culture within companies to think from beginning to end about the pros and the cons. If the preclinical and early clinical folks say, you know, benefit risk is a, is a late phase thing, then use the word pros and cons. Use whatever word you want to use. There's good stuff, there's bad stuff. Obviously, the good stuff must have outweighed the bad stuff, otherwise you wouldn't have sent it from preclinical into first time in human. That is a reality. It's just getting it down on paper in some way. Uh, secondly, to, to encourage some sort of, I'll just call it a scaffold um, of, of documentable fit for purpose structure. And we know uh, from um, Becky's earlier presentation that, that we've seen that word before. Um, and I'm not advocating one structure versus another, but being able to have uh, groups, whether it's a company or it's an academic institution looking at a drug or, uh, or assessing a drug, to show, refer to, or otherwise explicitly demonstrate what structure they used. Okay, the fact that, again, we're in a very subjective field with a lot of people with very strong opinions reemphasizes the fact that let's not just pick and choose a structure for Monday or a, a structure for, for February that we're not using in March or, or Monday you know, morning versus Friday evening. Let's just have some consistent structure, whatever that is, that companies show um, as being uh, what they use to, to move forward with a decision. The, oops, the, um, the fourth bullet point here, I mentioned about the accurate record keeping, you know, get it down so we have a history of where we have been, as JJ said, where we have been internally as a company and where we are going. Teams are changing all the time. Medicals, medics switch in and out. Scientists switch in and out. Epidemiologists switch in and out. CEOs switch in and out. What is the history? Where was the thinking before? So we're not starting from scratch each time. This is critically important, and I think is, is probably one of the most under, it's sort of the redheaded stepchild of the benefit risk thinking. This somehow fear that if we write it down, it's chiseled in stone, it can never change. Nothing's further from the truth. You want to show, document, somewhere internally what the thinking was so you can defend and a more appropriately and robustly present your story at the end of the day. Here's how things have evolved with this adverse event. Here's how things have evolved with this efficacy endpoint. Uh, the fourth bullet is, is there because it's probably the most important. And I think that in order for us to get at patient perspective, as an industry, we have to probably get as close as we can to say, look, the patient perspective is as important as the efficacy data and as important as the safety data when we as a company, as companies, come forward and say, here's our benefit risk profile, profile for this drug. It needs to be at that level. It shouldn't be. I think that my thoughts on that, but I think, with, but my, again, the bottom line is if we strive toward that as a, as a community, uh, it's going to be much easier to, to get there. And the final uh, point uh, here is uh, for advisory committee meetings, um, I know there's, it's, it's always ending up, the, the final decision is, is always based on a vote. So, uh, and, I, and I know that over the years, uh, having sat through many of these, that there are more and more questions are coming up about the benefit risk balance here and there. And um, one, just wondering if, and this may already be happening, but just wondering if some uh, additional formal training for advisory committee meetings uh, on benefit risk methodologies specifically uh, might sort of challenge companies to be more prepared for any sort of question that might come up in that sphere. And uh, so it, it would be, a, for, to me, I think a mutual uh, reciprocal win-win. Uh, everyone's learning, everyone's being challenged mutually to be prepared to answer questions from different perspectives, whether it's a quantitative 
semi-quantitative, purely qualitative approach. And thank you very much. So I have the, <clears throat> I think the unfair role of being the last speaker of the last panel after a exciting but, but long day. Uh, and if there's anything more soporific than a talk after lunch, it's to be the last speaker of the last panel. So I will follow what I'm sure would have been Sir William Osler's aphorism, be brief. I'm not sure he said that, but he probably was wise enough to say that. So I'll make just a few comments to try to summarize some of the things that I heard today and some of the areas I think are directions I think we continue need to work on. I think just one general comment is, is uh, the diversity of presentations I think just tells you how active and exciting this whole space is and also how important it is. It's obvious that essentially every regulatory decision we make is informed by consideration of benefit and risk and to make a decision in one direction or another is to make a decision that benefit exceeds risk or risk exceeds benefit depending on the determination. So this is really an incredibly important area. Now, as we think about the determination of benefit exceeding risk, when we look at, for example, the decision around the uh, approval or, or non-approval of a, of, a, of a new drug, we have to take the data we have in a, in a clinical, from the clinical trials and attempt to translate that to benefit. What is the, the efficacy we see? How will, that, how will that translate to benefit? And that is, that translation is a complex task. What were the patients in the trial? How were they managed? How realistic will that management be in, in a clinical setting post-approval? Will they see the same benefit? Will they see greater benefit? Will they see a lesser benefit? What, are the patients that were in the trial similar to patients who will ultimately be treated? Often they're not quite the same sets of patients. Well, what does that mean with regard to the translation to benefit? And the same considerations around harm. We take the safety information from the trial. How will that translate to the risk of harms when patients are treated after the drug is approved? Is the monitoring going to be similar? Will they be on similar background therapies? Will they have similar susceptibility factors? And so how does safety from the clinical trial translate to harm? I think we've sp spent some time talking about that today, but this concept of translating from the data we have in the clinical trial of efficacy and safety to the understanding of post-approval benefit and harms is a complicated task. And I think we see at the advisory committees a lot of struggle with understanding what those translations will look like. I think the good news, and I'll pick up on a theme that I, I heard several times today, is that I think in, in a high majority of, of instances when we make a benefit-risk decision, it's not that complicated. Benefit often very clearly exceeds risk. The drug has been in development for a long time. If risk exceeded benefit, one would hope the drug wouldn't have gotten to phase three or through phase three. And so by the time we see the drug, very often the decision is pretty clear. The benefit, the efficacy was well established. We can translate that to meaningful benefit to the patient. We see safety that is well defined and clearly is not nearly, uh, not nearly to the range of benefit so that we can conclude that benefit exceeds risk and the drug is approvable. And I don't think necessarily that we need quantitative methods to do that. It's often the quantitative method of it hits you between the eyes and it's obvious that, that it works and, and it has the appropriate benefit risk. But there clearly are situations where it is a very challenging benefit risk calculation. Now, I do think that, and I'll disagree a little bit with Bennett on this, I think that these situations often are predictable. We can, e even from before the molecule goes into the first patient, we can understand what potential risks might occur from the pharmacology or from what we know from preclinical, non-clinical non -clinical toxicology, we may have some ideas about what the risk profile might be and that there will be issues that will have to be managed. Certainly when the drug goes through phase one or phase two testing, those, that profile becomes clearer and the idea that 
there will be clear benefit, but there will, will be meaningful harms that we have to weigh is pretty evident. I think one opportunity that we need to spend time thinking about is making sure that there's a discussion about that even before we get into phase three. How do we design programs around benefit risk in a more effective way? Clearly, a, a drug which has significant harms that we're going to be concerned about, we need to assure that the phase three program is geared towards the proper benefit risk balance. So can we assure that in a situation like that, we're going into, for example, rather than broadly trying to apply the drug, can we say, let's look at patients who are resistant to other therapies or have specific unmet needs? Or to pick up on something that Jim Smith mentioned earlier, can we assure that the endpoints might be more directly relevant, may more directly impactful to patients? Maybe that's not an optimal circumstance for a surrogate endpoint, but where we want to collect a meaningful and impactful clinical ben benefit uh, endpoint. The trials might have to be longer. The trials might have to be directed in a particular way. They might be more resource intensive. But at the end of the day, does it then deal with the expected benefit risk? And I think these discussions need to occur earlier to assure that the program provides the information that we need to make the appropriate benefit risk determination, and we're not left with a lot of uncertainty around how the efficacy in the clinical trial will translate to benefit, or whether the efficacy is, su is sufficiently impactful to patients to outweigh the evident harm. But there are clearly circumstances where we can't predict that there was a meaningful safety issue Perhaps the drug looked pretty clean up to that point, and then as the phase three studies are unblinded, we begin to see that there really are meaningful and impactful harms that we perhaps didn't fully appreciate, either in the frequency or the intensity of the harm. I think one thing that we need to do in those circumstances is to step back and begin to think about what tools we can bring to that question. We heard, I think, from a number of speakers about those tools. Bennett, you spoke about that, and I think these, there are a whole, as, as Sarah mentioned, suite of tools that can be applied. But I do think that what these tools often allow us to do is to sit together and to, to provide for each other some assumptions and some understanding of how we're understanding the benefits and how we're understanding the risk. I find sometimes the output of these isn't that helpful but the process of getting there is exceedingly helpful because you have to say, okay, here's how, much, here's how much I weigh this benefit. Here's how much I weigh that benefit. Here's how much I consider this risk to be important. And you hear other people's views of that. And that's a great time where patient input can be so impactful to those discussions because they can help us understand, well, we don't think this benefit is all that important. But as you hear patient stories, you realize that is really an important benefit to them. Or we think this harm is something patients won't tolerate, and we hear, no, wait, they are willing to accept that harm. So I think it's those discussions which are so critical, although I don't want to downplay the benefit of quantitative benefit risk either. That can be very important in supporting, not making decisions. But one point I would make is that I find that often we might do those kinds of analysis, the sponsor may do those kinds of analysis, but there isn't a huge amount of collaboration. And I think collaboration early when we know there will be a challenging benefit risk issue is really critical. And I hope we can talk about opportunities for better alignment and perhaps even sharing of the effort. What type of analysis will the sponsor do? What type of analysis will we do? How might they be complementary? Do we accept the sponsor's a particular assumptions, will they want to challenge the assumptions we would make so that it's a collaborative process rather than we both go off in different directions and then present somewhat competing and perhaps even incongruous uh, benefit risk assessments. I think another area that we heard a lot about today and I'll just pick up on briefly is the critical role of the patient perspective in being filtered into the benefit risk assessments. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done. The, the patient-focused drug development guidances that are, being, uh, that are being worked on, I think, are going to provide a lot of insight into that. But figuring out where and when to put patient perspective into the decision-making and where and when the, the patient perspective is perhaps not as critical, I think, is something quite important. 
we heard earlier about sort of the population perspective in a benefit risk assessment and the patient perspective. Certainly, when we know what, what harms a patient might, uh, might obtain or might be uh, susceptible to, and we know that that same patient may be susceptible to the benefits, it may be very important to understand the patient's perspective on that benefit risk calculation. When we don't know which patients will benefit or which patients will have harm, we may need to do a more population-based approach. Now, finally, I'll just end by saying I thought the panel discussion around the post-market setting it was a really rich and important discussion. This is an area, I think, that will become increasingly important as we think about the growing information we have with real-world evidence coming online, which will really be more in the post-market than, of course, in the pre-market space. Um, and as that big data and, and uh, tools to assess that become more and more rich and applied, we will have a wealth of information that I think will weigh both on what benefits are actually being seen and what the harms are in post-approval use. We also have additional trial data. We've seen drugs, I'm a diabetologist, we've seen drugs where the, the, the initial data might have looked at A1C lowering and now we're seeing post-approval studies that are showing cardiovascular benefit. Well, that changes very much how we might think of any attendant harm that was observed post-marketing. So the framework has to, uh, has to be able to apply this new benefit risk information to make appropriate determinations. We might see harms that, based upon the efficacy post at the time of approval, might lead us to conclude the drug should not be on the market. But as we understand its outcome benefits, we may have a very different calculation in terms of whether that drug still has a positive benefit risk ratio. Well, I'll stop there and we can perhaps have a few minutes for for questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, great. Thanks, um, uh, Peter, and to all of our reactants for, for uh, really good comments. Um, we are out of time on this session, but maybe I'll ask any, any additional uh, reaction to what your fellow panelists said or others through the lens of immediate next steps to improve the sort of benefit risk assessment uh, uh, methodology. Well, a quick thing. Uh, I really agree with you about the value of sponsor regulatory discussions on planning for benefit risk. A great time would be when you're putting your phase three protocol together when you still have a chance to decide which events or uh, endpoints you want to measure. And it gives you plenty of time if you've got to do something more quantitative or a preference study during the course of phase three to prepare. Um, yeah, um, maybe just one or t uh, two or three quick comments. One, I thought the, I think the point about the absolute versus relative risk is a particularly important one in the benefit risk arena. You know, you can increase my risk of 1 in 10 to 2 in 10 for death, and that's pretty important, or 1 in a million to 2 in a million for death. Both are relative risks of two, the first being really much, much more important than the other. Um, but if you look at an absolute risk, then you can understand this. And this becomes into, into play when you calculate a relative risk for one endpoint, which is very common, and another endpoint, which is very uncommon, and there's no way to understand how to put them together on a relative risk scale. But on an absolute risk scale, you can, you can make some sense of that. Um, the point about patient preferences, I think, I think it's very valuable to get them. And I wouldn't get hung up in the fact that there's great variation of patient preferences. That's fine. That's com and, and it's valuable to know that. Um, I think in terms of studies and uh, you know, we, in, in the government-funded world, which I'm in, um, you know, benefit risk evaluation is actually our end game. And we're even designing and our, our, our primary analysis and primary design around benefit risk evaluation. And uh, the point about that is, is that um, we can pre-specify for, for pre-specification purposes and for transparency purposes uh, a value system or a, a, a patient preference system based on what you might think of as a measure of central tendency. If we do a survey and get patient preferences for various things, we can get information and, and you could pre-specify you know, some mean or median that, that the population has in general. However, during analysis, I can do an analysis that compares two treatments and says, well, as, as your patient preference varies, the treatment contrast is going to vary. And so if your patients have a particular preference set here, 
then one, one treatment may be better. But if they have a different perspective, then another treatment may be better, or, the, or, or maybe that your drug is not going to work in that setting. And certainly you see this in cancer or whatever. If you have a patient who says, well, listen, uh, duration of life is most important to me. Everything else is, you know, I'll, I'm willing to take the, the toxicity of chemotherapy. But another patient says, well, listen, you know, quality of life is most important to me. I don't want to suffer. And they may opt to avoid chemotherapy. But my analysis can actually decipher which, which, how treatments contrast under, under those sort of scenarios. Um, the last thing, I, I, there was a point in the, last, uh, in the last session about the dynamic nature of benefit risk evaluation. And this is really an important issue because uh, um, particularly in infectious disease because there's development of resistance and so forth. But, um, but this happens in all disease areas because drugs are going to come in and out of, of, uh, of use. And as they come in and out, what's, what's going to be viewed as, as acceptable is going to change. And so uh, I think the dynamic nature is an important thing. Yes. Yeah. Great, uh, great comment. So thanks, uh, thanks to our panelists. Did you have a... You're looking, oh. I don't know if you had something really quick. Very quick. I just wanted to, um, one last piece about the patient preference is that I think most of us are probably thinking during these day, this, this, uh, the, these sessions that, that the majority of our conversations have been around adults. I think we should not forget the fact that a significant part of our population are pediatrics and they often rely on a surrogate to give their preference. So this, I think, reemphasizes the point of getting um, patient preferences. Um, information and science down. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all of the reactants. It's a w wonderful discussion, and, and I appreciate the comments on immediate next steps and, and where this is all going. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we'll move um, right now toward, uh, you, you can go ahead and leave. We've got one more <laughs> session. Um, we're really close to the Beltway, and 5 o'clock is rapidly approaching. Um, so uh, our next session is uh, moving more toward the uh, open public comment section. During, the, during this session, a couple of audience members have already signed up to provide comments, uh, and we, so we're going to invite those, uh, those uh, two individuals up to the microphone, two people signed up. Um, but if there are other people in the room that uh, want to make any comments to what you've heard uh, during this session, please, uh, please also line up at the... Uh, at the microphone. Um, we, I won't be addressing any of the comments. I mean, I'm, I'm the only one up here. Um, so this is mainly just to get all of your comments on record. We are recording. This will be your chance to get comments on record. Um, but we ask you to be brief, uh, brief comments that you have. Um, uh, we'd also ask you, to, uh, because it's a transparent process, we encourage you to note any financial interests that may be relevant to your comment. If you have any of those uh, and wish to state that for the record, please go ahead. Um, uh, but this is not you know, required. If you don't feel comfortable, that, that's okay, too. Um, we've collected sign-ups for the, for the meeting and during the break, so I think those two individuals, um, if you're here, please, please come forward to the microphone, uh, Stephen Sun, Cindy Lancaster. Um, this is also just to remind you all um, that uh, uh, we'll use this time to, uh, again, that you'll be able to provide the written comments um, on this meeting, too, before June, uh, June 17th. So there's a public document or public docket open. You can provide written comments to this meeting before June 17th. That's your other opportunity beyond today uh, to provide comments. So with that, I'll turn to our first speaker. And, and nobody has come up to the microphone yet. So uh, uh, Stephen and, and Cindy, if you're no longer here. OK, there you go, please. <laughs> yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Stephen Sun. I'm from Sinius Health. Um, that is my disclaimer. Um, I love, I just wanted to share with everyone, I just love these uh, hand gestures of um, benefits outweigh the risks only uh, simply because um, just from a very simplistic way of thinking, um, I outweigh my wife by about um, 50 pounds. And uh, there is a quantitative assessment uh, there. Uh, earlier I had mentioned uh, net benefit, and uh, if I would ask uh, for you to think about a future state, because um, when you do things like benefits outweighing the risks, there is probably some delta uh, to consider, some quantitative delta that someone 
is making that calculation, either it's a medical reviewer, it's division lead, even a healthcare professional, when they're making a recommendation to a patient, they're thinking benefits outweigh the risks. The question could be how much. Okay, so um, the reason and the rationale for this push for uh, a net benefit score, I mean, imagine if you could have a score for a product for net benefit, um, you can compare uh, products within a class, you can compare um, uh, established thresholds as to what is considered appropriate for that particular indication. Uh, you can even have uh, an ability for net benefit score um, to be uh, discussed and, um, and uh, explained uh, by a prescriber or a physician for, to a patient, whether it's a very high net benefit or a low net benefit. Um, and so um, that would be the consideration uh, about net benefit um, in this uh, discussion about medic product life cycle. Uh, and one other comment um, about the dynamic nature of net benefit, that's gonna change, right? Because everybody keeps going like this. Um, benefits may be established very high at the beginning, risks are going to continue. Um, and so you're going to see that net benefit uh, change over um, you know, from phase one, of course, out to post-marketing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your comments. Hi, I'm Cindy Lancaster, and of course, this is my personal opinion, not AstraZeneca, but um, I did want to take the opportunity to thank everyone who talked about the transparency and posting of results. Uh, FDA has made a new change to their website, and um, I think it was raise that uh, a lot of times we get efficacy supplements in. I know um, other members of the panel talked about the documents that we all look at. I'm in regulatory and policy um, at uh, AstraZeneca, and we also have a regulatory intelligence group that spends a lot of time answering um, development, history, and looking at safety, and it, it is um, quite a task sometimes to pull this information out. So when you're looking at standards and the way that you present this information, it is useful. So thank you for doing that. Great, thank you. Hong Yang from CBO FDA. Um, so uh, first, thank you for organizing the uh, speaker panel. Uh, I think this is a very informative uh, session. Um, so I have uh, several uh, comments. One is uh, I really like to echo the point uh, made by uh, Elena uh, early about uh, incorporating more of the analysis of a real world situation into the benefit risk assessment. Um, so um, in some situation like um, in, in, in CIBA, we have some cases. Some benefit risk really heavily depend on uh, the real world situation, like the example which uh, 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 present early for the home you, uh, use uh, HIV kit. So the benefit risk is not just depend on the performance of the assay. It's heavily depend on uh, if the testing kit uh, is approved, um, how many people is going to use that, especially those high-risk population. They usually, they, they go, don't go to uh, uh, professional testing. Are they going to go to uh, use uh, this home-use uh, kit to test HIV? So more cases can be picked up early to pre prevent more uh, transmission. So, uh, so for this kind of cases, uh, the analysis of the real world situation is really important. So this leads to uh, another second point I want to make is about where the quantitative uh, uh, analysis can be applied. So here, uh, I think this is the, uh, in CIBO, we use qu apply quantitative approach in this kind of the situation because in real world situation, there's more uncertainty. Uh, also, some a lot of time even are not uh, you are not able to predict what will happen. Mm -hmm. So a lot of technique for quantitative like sensitivity analysis, uh, Monte Carlo simulation that can be applied in that kind of a situation. And then the final point I want to say is. Um, 
the early communication uh, between uh, FDA and the sponsor about the benefit risk assessment is very important. Like this situation, when we look at a submission, usually the data from clinical trial will be submitted. But the real world situation information is not there. So when you need to uh, conduct this risk benefit risk assessment, there's no data uh, collected submitted. So I think if you have early communication between sponsor uh, FDA, and then you ha will have a good plan yeah. on this. Yeah. Thank Great. you. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Any other comments uh, before we close the meeting for today? Okay, um, so I'd like to I mean, think back over the, the course of the day. We covered a ton of ground on this topic. Uh, benefit risk assessment is, a, uh, as we know and heard hi highlighted today, a c uh, critical component of the FDA's regulatory decision making. And this meeting and your comments will provide FDA needed and helpful input as the agency works to um, further clarify FDA's considerations about uh, marketing authorization and the evidence that's generated across the life cycle of the drug within this benefit risk assessment. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, there are a few people I'd like to thank for making this event possible. First and foremost, all of you in this room and those watching the webcast and especially our speakers for spending the day with us um, and providing your, uh, your uh, distinguished uh, ec expertise uh, on, the, on these issues. Uh, this will certainly help make this process move forward. Um, I'd also like to thank, uh, uh, secondly, the, the FDA staff uh, particularly played a, a critical role in helping us to plan this, uh, this particular event. Many sp thanks specifically to Sarah Eggers, um, Graham Thompson, and Blake uh, Bannister for, the, um, for all of your help and in, in, in your team's help in, in making this day possible. Lastly, I'd like to thank our team at the Duke Margolis Center, Sarah Sheehan, Morgan Romine, Nicholas Harrison, Sarah Saprisi, and Elizabeth Mur Murphy for all of uh, their help in, in today as well. Uh, the print materials that uh, you received here will be archived on the Duke Margolis Center website, um, as well as the uh, webcast uh, that we, that we uh, recorded throughout the day. Um, you can stay connected to our work through, uh, through the website and through our uh, social media accounts. Thank you again. Safe travels and enjoy the rest of your day.